And again. And again. Come on, put your backs into it. 24601. Where's Chris 24601? 24601. Did you hear the officer? Yes, sir. Report to Inspector Javert's office. Inspector Javert's officer. Now. Let us contemplate the inexplicable wonder that is the human soul. Let me see. <clears throat> ah, yes. Valjean. Jean. Age 46. Imprisoned for theft, 1798. Prison number 24601. A marvel as unconscious of its majesty as the ocean is of its depths. Two attempts at escape, 1803 and 1809. Original sentence extended to 19 years. Correct? Correct, sir. For just as the ocean swirls and storms against the shore, so too does a man's soul constantly swirl and storm within him. Well, 24601, it is my duty on behalf of the governor of this prison, Henri Lebec, to inform you of your conditions of parole. Parole, sir. Thank you, sir. Conditions of parole as laid down in the statutes of France. A storm which even the most cruel or callous can neither contain or ignore. The issuing of this yellow parole card requires you to report at the shoe factory at Pontalier in 21 days. At each town hall on your way, the card must be stamped by a designated official. Sign your name or make your mark here. Yes, sir. Any infringement of your parole conditions renders this release null and void. If you are ever convicted of a new offence and returned to prison, rest assured there will be no possibility whatsoever of parole. Dismissed. Is there something else? Well, sir, there is the allowance for hard labour. Of course, the state owes you 156 francs. Signed here, collected from the registrar. 156 francs. Your correct payment, as set down in law... For 19 years' hard labour. Are you questioning the equity of the law, 24601? What about all the work? You are a troublemaker and a thief. A man in your position receives with gratitude everything the state provides, but then again one would expect little more of a person such as yourself. Dismissed, 24601. The name's Valjean. It isn't till I see you again. Isn't going to happen, sir. No more prison. Not ever. I wish I shared your optimism, Valjean. But a felon like you, not a hope. I've changed. Dismissed. On the 29th of September, 1817, prisoner 24601, otherwise known as Jean Valjean, is released from prison in Toulon. Uh, were I a gambling man, I'd give you a month. At most. Now get out of my sight. Observe him now, as he makes his weary way along the harsh rough road. A felon like you. Not a hope. His clothes are hardly more than rags, and all his possessions, such as they are, are stuffed into a tattered rucksack slung about his shoulders. Yellow card? Yes, sir. If Jean Valjean had had the mark of Cain branded into his forehead, he could not have been more of a pariah to society. Yellow card? Yes, sir. Out of town by sunset, understood? Yes, sir. Until eventually... Exhausted and desperately hungry after four days' walking, he arrives in the town of Dean, where he has his card stamped by another official, who tells the gendarmerie, who tells the shopkeepers and taverners, who tell their customers, who bolt their doors and windows against the demon now stalking their sleepy streets. By evening, an insidious fear has snuck its way in through every door and keyhole. What are you doing, Madame Magloire? Haven't you heard, Monseigneur? There's a convict on the loose. This same fear even found its way into the house of Bishop Miriel, whose many acts of kindness have caused some disquiet in the town. A disquiet born not so much out of the bishop's goodness, but out of the indiscrimination of these acts. Bishop Miriel would speak as easily to a thief as to the pontiff himself. Almost uniquely, his actions were as true as his words. A convict? 
He was seen leaving the mayor's office. And what concern is that to us? Well, it isn't right they let such people free to wander the streets. We may be murdered in our beds. If it is God's will. And the way they described him, Monseigneur. Fierce. An animal. <laughs> and you saw this beast yourself? No, but Then I... we must trust that he is a man, and therefore blessed with an immortal soul. <laughs> Now then, what can I get you? Hunger knifes its way to the pit of Valjean's stomach. A meal. Oh, and I'm somewhere to sleep tonight. Certainly. You've yeah, been in town long. Use your way, Pascal. You'll have him running the country. Obviously, if the man commits a crime, he has to be arrested. There's no but... if about it. Criminals are criminals. Made that Oi, way. oi, keep it down over there. I'm sorry about that. Feelings are running high, you see. Oh, yes. There's a criminal in town. Maybe you've seen him. No. Decent town, is this? Doesn't like trouble. But where does, eh? Over there, uh, I'd recommend the beef. Good. Uh, uh, right, take a seat. Your supper will be ready in a few minutes. I didn't realise you were serving criminals these days, Francois. Uh, what criminal? This criminal. That's right, isn't it? I don't know what you're talking about. You're saying it wasn't you had your parole card stamped at town hall this afternoon? Well? Uh, uh, what's going on? Just uh, a little food and then I'm out of here. Uh, right, I'll handle this, Pierre. You go back to where you were. Please, monsieur, a little, little bread and meat, there's not too much to ask, uh, is it? Out. I don't want any trouble here. Just uh, uh, You'll a You'll get no food and lodging here now, out. You heard the man. Don't touch me! Oh, you see that? He threatened me. Now, someone, someone, get the police. No, 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 please. I, I only wanted a little meat. No, police, please, monsieur, no police. Then get out! And I don't want to see your face again. Leave us alone. I've never done nothing to you. Shut up and listen. Just want a little bread and meat, that's all. Ty the bishop lives over beside church. What will he do to us? His door's never closed. Good night, monsieur. Good luck. Oh, oh saints preserve us. It's all right, Madame Magloire. It could be anybody, Monseigneur. Then it will surely be somebody. Yes, monsieur? The name's Jean Valjean. A man just now said you could help. I haven't eaten in three days. Oh, this must be the man, Monseigneur. The man they were talking about in town. Are you by any chance referring to the beast? I'll leave. You're just in time, Monsieur. Do come in. Uh, Madame Magloire, kindly set another place at table. Uh, there will be three to supper tonight. Allow me to introduce myself, monsieur. My name is Muriel, and I'm the bishop of this district. Monsieur, this bishop called him. Jean Valjean. Monsieur. Not dog or cur or villain. Monsieur. And as the bishop sits him down before his fire, something like lightning strikes his soul an illumination which giddies sudden tears to his eyes, eyes quickly averted from the bishop's steady gaze. How is the meal, my son? Never tasted better. And Madame Magloire is an excellent cook. You don't live like a bishop. <laughs> and how should a bishop live? With riches, like them pictures of the Pope and all his... Palaces. Our life is simpler without riches. Well, now, uh, here we are eating with silver cutlery. <laughs> this is silver, isn't it? Sadly, yes. What's that about it? Very nice, I'm sure. What about them candlesticks? Mm, silver, too. They have sentimental value only. Um, tell me more about yourself, my son. What do you want to know? Only that which you want to tell. I banged us away for stealing. A loaf of bread because my sister's family didn't have enough to eat. Nineteen years they had me serving on the galleys. Nothing more to them than a number. 24601. Oh, Nineteen years for stealing a loaf of bread? I tried to escape. They increased the sentence. Nineteen years on the galleys. When they finally let me out, they cheated me out of the little money I earned. Didn't grind the spirit out there. 
not Jean Valjean. I never ground the spirit out of me. I am glad to hear it. And your sister's family, what became of them? Dead. Only thing I have is this yellow card. I see. Have you anywhere to stay tonight, my son? Should I be leaving? There's a bed made up on the other side of the alcove. I wouldn't want me staying in my house. All are welcome in Christ's house. I travel to Pontalier tomorrow. I start early. Then you'll be wanting your bed. How do you know I won't murder you in your sleep? Oh, that is God's business, not mine. No matter that the bed is soft and comfortable or the far warm in the grate, sleep does not come peacefully to Jean Valjean. A felon like you, not a hope. Was Jean Valjean a bad man? A wicked man? Society would judge him thus. Criminals are criminals. Made that way. Society was to Jean Valjean an ocean of despair, which with every tumultuous wave fed a little more of its vile water down the drowning Valjean's throat. Jean Valjean's fault in stealing that loaf of bread was his own. No food and lodging here. Out. But the length and cruelty of his punishment must be ours. For who can defend a penal system which seeks to crush the spirit and dignity out of a man and leave him open to every degradation and vice? Put your backs into it! A young man sentenced to hard labor for stealing a loaf of bread has now, 19 years later, reappeared in the world, not calmed and cowed, but wild and vengeful. In the great still of the night, Jean Valjean wakes with but one thought on his mind. Silver cutlery. Silver cutlery! The silver cutlery! Bishop Muriel, that convict stolen the silver cutlery. I knew he was no good. There is no question that it has been stolen. Oh, see for yourself, Monseigneur. We had the cutlery out last night and now it's gone. Stolen. All the silver we had, everything. We could hardly claim them as ours. You have been robbed, Monseigneur. By a poor man. God has acted justly. Praise be to God. I... And perhaps you would prepare some coffee, madame. <gasps> it's him. Come to finish the job he started. Some coffee, madame Magloire. Good morning, officers. Begging your pardon, Monseigneur. But do you recognize this man? Raise your head! <laughs> Caught him sneaking out of town this morning. There's been complaints about him all over. Started a fight at the tavern last night. That's a lie. Shut your mouth. <laughs> and when we opened his bag, we found it packed with silver. Was he here last night? He was. You wouldn't be missing any silver by any chance, Monseigneur? Lift your head up so that the bishop can get a good look at you. But that's enough, officer. This man did stay here last night as my guest. But he forgot to take the silver candlesticks. Madame Magloire, would you come to the door, please? Yes, Monsignor. Oh, that is... Yes, thank you, Madame Magloire. Uh, would you please bring the silver candlesticks? Our guest appears to have forgotten them. Our guest? Straight away, if you'd be so kind. But you... Was there something else? No, Monseigneur. Good. You should have waited until I awoke, my son. We could have settled everything then. A bishop speaking to you. Yes, bishop. The silver candlesticks, Monseigneur. Thank you. Now, here you are, my son. Don't you want them? <laughs> You're giving this man these as well, Monseigneur. Along with the silver cutlery. But he's... But what, officer? This is a known felon, Monseigneur. He served 19 years on the galleys. And last night he dined with me and I gave him this silver as a gift. And why would you do that? Because he obviously needed it. Will there be anything else, officer? 
Untie him. We only just cross him. Untie him. And give him his sack. I don't know what's happened here today, but I'm going to get to the bottom of it. Good day to you, Monsignor. And a very good day to you, officer. Come inside the house, my son. I'll return it all to you, all the cutlery, the candlesticks, everything. Here. I gave them to you, my son. They're yours. Mine? I don't understand, Monsignor. Monsieur Valjean, it is not my habit to lie. You don't know what would have happened to me if they'd sent me back to the galleys. They'd never let us out, never. I, I don't know how to thank you, Bishop. Never forget, never ever forget what you've promised me here today. Promised you, Bishop? Are you listening, Monsieur Valjean? Use this money to become an honest man. What are you talking about? Step back from me. I'm warning Jean you. Jean Valjean, I claim your soul from that which wills eternal evil to that which wills eternal good. I purchase your soul from perdition and return it now to God. Now, go in peace, my son. And do not sin again. As Jean Valjean strides with his head down out of Dean, he struggles to keep the turmoil the bishop's words have provoked in him at bay by walking. The silver, more silver than he has ever seen, now only serves to weigh upon his heart. And he thinks perversely that he would sooner be back in prison than confused and alone in this world. Even the sight of a solitary wildflower growing awkwardly at the side of the path only plunges him into deeper despair. And Jean Valjean, so long starved of any tenderness or affection, knows only one way to deal with the turmoil within, with clenched fists and viciousness. Can you have me coin back, sir? What coin? The coin under your boot. Don't see any coin. What's your name? Petit Gervais. Where'd you live? Don't live anywhere. You destitute boy. Don't be hard-hearted, monsieur. Give us our coin back, please. Clear off. But... You deaf. I told you to clear off. Please, move your foot, mister. Monsieur, please. Oh, don't sit down, sir. Give us our money. It's all I have. Who's that? Who's that speaking? Take pity, monsieur. What did Petit Gervais ever do to you? Just move your foot. I beg you. I beg you, monsieur. Didn't I tell you to clear off? But, monsieur... Go! How long Jean Valjean sits in that spot after Petit Gervais has fled is impossible to tell. His vicious action of a few hours before is now a wasp come to sting his body into a terrible insensibility. He is to all the world a man of stone, fixed eternally. But when he finally lifts his boot, he sees... What's this? A 40 sou piece. Barely enough to buy a loaf of bread. Long shadows creep across the valley. Night descends. But now a wind blows up whipping up a tiny sandstorm of dust and twigs along the path, but provoking within Jean Valjean a tempest of an entirely different order. Petit Gervais! Come back, Petit Gervais, come back! Come back! Petit Gervais! Stop! Stop! Oh! Oh! Monsieur le Curé! I could have killed you! What do you want from me? Take this money for your poor. Excuse me? A boy, Petit Gervais. Did you see him? I don't know what you're talking about. On the road away yonder, a, a little boy about ten years old, carried a hurdy-gurdy on his back. Petit Gervais, his name was. Maybe he was a chimney sweep. Who? Someone must know him. Petit Gervais. He sounds like a vagrant to me. They turn up here from time to time looking for arms. Then they move on. I have his 40 sous piece. You must have me arrested, Monsieur le Curé, arrested. Let me pass. I'm a thief. A thief. I stole the boy's money. Please, Monsieur le Curé. I said, let me pass. Please, take this. Take more money for your poor. Monsieur. Monsieur. Go on there. Go on. Yeah. Don't be hard-hearted, Monsieur. Give us our coin back. Please. Wait. Wait. Monsieur le Curé. 
What did Petitio Vez ever do to you? Just move your foot. I beg you. I beg you. Petitio Vez! Petitio Vez! Petitio Vez! Jean Valjean weeps. Jean Valjean imprisoned for stealing a loaf of bread. Jean Valjean, who has known nothing but cruelty and wretchedness, whose companions in the galleys had been thieves and murderers, whose jailers had persecuted him night and day for the best part of twenty years, jailers who knew him as nothing but a number, convict 24601. This Valjean weeps, weeps until he fears his tears might drown him. Jean Valjean, I claim your soul from that which wills eternal evil to that which wills eternal good. I purchase your soul from perdition and return it now to God. He has robbed a child, an innocent child out of malice and spite. He has committed an act he is no longer capable of living with. God forgive me. God forgive me. God forgive me. It is later reported that a man was seen in the shadows of the church that night. A man kneeling with arms outstretched in the attitude of prayer. But where that man is now, and in what direction he is going, no one knows, nor cares. Mother. But now we must shift our gaze. What is it, Cosette? Opening gave me a strawberry. To another child on the edge of destitution. Be sure to go back and thank Eponine, won't you? All right, Eponine, Eponine. We must ascend, ascend with the birds. We must transcend all barriers of time and space and travel north to a grim red tavern on the outskirts of Paris, some three years later. What's your girl's name again? Cosette. How old is she? Almost three. Hmm. Might have taken quite a shine to her. How's the water? Sweet. Best well in the area, they say. I've not seen you round here before. Uh... Fontaine. I'm travelling north to Montreux. Pleased to meet you, Fontaine. Likewise. You visiting family? Looking for work. Are you from here? Tenardier, my husband, he owns this tavern. Eponine! Be sure and pull your skirts up when you run! All right, Mama, I don't want the M's getting muddy. They're beautiful children. Yeah, so's your cousette. She's a lovely little girl. You and your husband must be very proud of her. I'm on my own, Madame Tenardier. I see. It's not easy for a woman on her own these days. No, no. Fontaine. Beautiful, impoverished Fontaine. There are some hearts too sensitive to the vicissitudes of daily life. Such a heart was Fontaine's. Abandoned by a skittish lover who left her with child. Leaving Paris, bringing up a child, looking for work, that's quite a lot for anyone. Never mind a young woman without a husband. I wouldn't want to do it. We'll manage. Of course you will. She's young, because that will soon adjust to all the upheaval. Still, it might be tricky finding a job to fit in round your daughter. I don't understand. Well, not all employers are sensitive to the needs of young children, I can tell you. Me, I just thank our Lord in heaven I have such a good husband to look after us. Surely an employer would understand. Yeah, you would have thought so, wouldn't you? But just in case. Yes, Madame Tenardier. That is nothing. A foolish idea. Please, I'd appreciate any advice. Well, it's more of a suggestion, really. What if Cosette were to stay with us here in Montfermeil until you got fixed up? Stay with you? Yeah, just until you got settled. I'm sure my husband and I could come to some arrangement and, and the girls adore each other, don't they? I couldn't. Surely it's better because it has a roof over her head and food in her belly rather than trailing the open road. You don't know how long it's going to take you to find a suitable position, do you? Oh, no. You have a little think about it. Eponine, put Cosette down. She's not a doll. <laughs> they do the funniest things, don't they? Well, sure, it wouldn't take me long to find a position in Montreux, Sumer. Of course it wouldn't. Listen, why don't you come and have a word with my husband? 
I'm sure we can sort something out. Six francs a month for board and lodging. Agreed? Not ten minutes later, in the dingy back room of a grim red tavern, the fate of a child is decided. Agreed. And uh, seven months in advance, up front, etc., etc. Monsieur Thenardier, this duplicitous ferret who passes for a human being, wringing his wriggling fingers as he affects sympathy for the desperate girl before him, believes himself a man of letters, in spite of the little learning he has. Believe me, my dear, we know how difficult this must be for you. Don't we, my dove? We do, my dear, we do. Seven months brings us up to 42 francs. Yeah, yeah, plus extras. Uh, say, uh, 15 francs, which brings the total up to... Uh, 57 francs. Agreed, 14? Oh. You will look after her, won't you? As if she were our own. She's all I have. I know she is, Fontaine. I know she is. But please don't worry. Here, look at the time. You better get a move on if you're going to reach Chanty by nightfall. But not ten minutes after Fontaine's departure, the Denadiers congratulate themselves on a good day's work. Ah, uh, this money will save us from that summons. <laughs> it's your own fault, Denadier. Trying to cheat a judge. Hey, let's not recriminate, my love. <laughs> eh? <laughs> Let bygones be bygones, etc., etc. And you've had enough to drink. And with a great swipe of her hand, she empties the 57 francs into her apron and marches out into the yard where Cosette still plays with her girls, unaware that a mile along the road, her mother Fontaine weeps hopelessly for her. Cosette! My Cosette, what have I done? Cosette, Cosette. Good morning. Good morning. Monsieur le Maire, thank you for taking my horses to your factory. Oh, I'm so glad he could come and work for me. Now, you might be forgiven for thinking that the impact of a single uneducated man upon a town, upon a community, must be, by its very nature, inconsequential. But you would be wrong. Mr. Mudley, my wife is getting better in the new hospital. She opened her eyes yesterday and asked for me. Good, good. What could such a man possibly have to teach the intellectual classes with his untrained mind and his vulgar ways? Sister Sam, please, how are the patients this morning? Ah, bleeding away at me night and day. Let me show you montreuil sur mer a town which used to be poor, a town where despair and poverty walked triumphant in the streets, a town which had been in the grip of self-interest and corruption until the arrival of the man now known as Monsieur Madeleine. They're a terrible pushy lot, if you ask me. Oh, and you're the best nurse in the country to look after them. Ah, bottom me up if you like. It'll get you nowhere at all. <laughs> the man we know, a Jean Valjean. Martine, what come with me tonight? I can't today, Elisa. Things I need to do. I'll see you later, I promise. It is in this good man's factory that Fontaine has found work. Madame Victorine, the cartman Fauchelevent's here for the samples. Marguerite! Tell me what you know about that girl, Fontaine. Where does she send all her money? I don't know, madam. But she gets letters written in town every single week. Come in. Another letter, please, Monsieur Blanard, to my little girl. The money? My darling, Mummy is working very hard. But she never stops thinking about her beautiful little girl. You speak too fast, Fontaine. I'm sorry I miss her, my child. What else? I think of you every day, and when I come to get you, we will never be parted again. Well, you'll have to pay extra if you want to say more. I have to save money. I'm saving up to bring my little girl home, you see. How will you finish? Your loving mama. 
This is lovely wine, madam. Never mind the wine, Marguerite. Where's the letter writer? My lord, a glass of water. I see that Inspector Javert's snooping around again. Inspector Javert is a dedicated public servant. Yes, madam, Victorine. There he is. Monsieur Blanard, come and join us. Oh, well, ladies, I don't mind if I do. A glass of wine, perhaps? Oh, oh, if you insist. See the good work they do, the moralising vipers of this town. See how they close around the letter writer, as two lionesses might encircle a hyena. So your work thrives, Monsieur Blanard? Mm. As long as there is ignorance and poverty, I'll always have a job. <laughs> <laughs> quite right, quite right. I've heard that our Fontaine is a regular customer of yours. Regular as clockwork, every week, writing to her darling girl. <gasps> a child. Uh, have some more wine, please. Uh, I always felt that girl thought she was a cut above the rest of us with all that blonde hair and the way men looked at her. There's no father in the picture, Madame Victorine. She's gone and left the sprog with some landlord in a pub. Is that so? Huh. Here, let me top you up. Okay. Inspector Javert! Inspector Javert! It's been a terrible accident outside the factory. All Fauchelevon's been crushed under his cart. Let's come 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 We're just coming down the hill when the brakes fail, like. My poor man. Can no one help you? We cannot raise the cart, Monsieur Le Maire, and I fear the burden will crush the old gentleman. Will any man try to lift the cart up on his back and save this unfortunate soul? <laughs> Here's 50 francs for the brave man who will give it his best. It's madness. Anyone getting underneath that cart is risking being killed themselves. Let me through! Let me through! Inspector Javert, a man is dying here. The fire truck has been summoned, Monsieur Le Maire. The man is pale and cold. If we don't act now, it will be too late. In a situation such as this, the regulation is to wait upon the fire tender. I'll lift it up myself. Now, Monsieur Le Maire, I really cannot allow you to take such a risk with your own life. Stand back, Javert. I'll lift it on my back, and you must pull him free. Depend on us, sir. Oh. <laughs> Nearly! God protect him! He's doing it! He, he, he's done it! He's got it on his back! Now, pull him free! God bless you, Monsieur Madeleine. I had no idea you had such physical strength, Monsieur Le Maire. I've only ever seen such an impressive display once before in my life when I was guarding convicts in the galley. Make sure that Fauchelevent is taken to the hospital and given all the care he needs. Yes, it is certainly true that a man may reinvent himself. But there is always the possibility that some old acquaintance will spot the ghost of his previous life in the new. Inspector Javert studies Monsieur Madeleine as he walks away. And the more he looks, the more familiar the mayor seems to him. If it's about my being late yesterday, madam, I stayed an extra half hour at the end of the day. Your lateness was noted, Fontaine, but that's not why I've asked to see you. You may sit down. I've not done anything to displease you, have I? I would never want to displease you. This job means everything to me. I'm afraid we're going to have to let you go. I don't understand. There's a little money which Monsieur Madeleine insists upon giving to all those who are dismissed in destitute circumstances, although, in this case, I feel you are undeserving of such a gesture. Still, there you have it. It's the regulations, and they must be obeyed. But, madam, please don't dismiss me. Where else is there for me to go? My job here, Fontaine, is to protect the women in this factory. Protect them? From what? From me? You have an illegitimate child living in a public house in Montfermeil, I believe. I cannot have you giving the other girls ideas. Now, make your way out without saying goodbye. If you want Monsieur Madeleine's money, I suggest that you leave now. Damn Monsieur Madeleine! Damn him if this is how he treats poor girls like me! You must come to terms with what you are, Fontaine. <sighs> what child could benefit from a mother such as you? Listen. It is winter. In the houses of the rich, 
Families are gathered around their fires. But in the bitter cold, Fontaine has not a penny to her name. Please. Oh, what will I do? What is it, Fontaine? What's happened? My child is sick. I must send money now for medicine. The poor Tenardiers are almost ruined with the expense of nursing. Well, how much do they want? Forty francs. Forty francs? Oh, God in heaven, I don't have forty sous. Oh, my poor child, I can't just let her die. No. I'm her mother. It's my job to make her well. God is watching in the darkness of our deeds. The innocent abused, the wealthy smug, the greedy dining out on others' flesh. Don't be shy. Ladies and gentlemen, where would we be without our tea? Ha! Lost, I tell you. No chewing, no smiling, and romance? Ha! Finished! But there's no need to let nature get the upper hand. Watch now, as poor Fontaine, worn out with cold and hunger and made wretched by the separation from her child, hesitates outside the tooth puller's grimy caravan. I pay 20 francs for every decent front incisor. Now that's a front tooth to you lot. 20 francs! Did he say 20 francs? Oh, Fontaine, no. So step right up. It's 20 shiny francs for every healthy tooth. How much for two? Uh, no, uh, you're a two front teeth. Uh, well, let's see now. No, Fontaine. Oh, they're a pretty pair. Uh, I'll give you 40 francs if I can take them here and now. Come away, Fontaine. Don't do this. I give my life for my child. My teeth are nothing. Fontaine, please, please. Now come through, my pretty. Sit yourself down. Now, you man, take her arms. Right, hold still now. It's all right, really. I don't mind a bit. Oh, poor Fontaine. And who might be to blame? Whose fault is it that fate has brought her here to wait in line amongst the patient poor? to have her teeth rinsed out for 40 francs. Surely not you or I. Now hold her tight. Oh, oh, open up your mouth for pity's sake. Team! It's done. Now she has money she can send her child. She walks home through the frozen streets, her mouth filled up with blood. All is soon gone. Her looks, her work, her friends, everything lost except her desperation to see her child again. She sleeps lightly and coughs blood. <coughs> and so she does what she must do to live. She sells herself to rich men in the town. Oh, I see the ladies around again in spite of the girl. Right? You girl. Yes, you, the toothless one. <laughs> you can't be serious. Leave me alone teach her to turn her back. Come on, man, you're drunk. You! Show a little respect when you're spoken to. Leave it, Pierre. Come over here and beg my pardon, you little whore. I'd rather stick my head in a muck heap. Huh? <coughs> Come away, she's ill. You think you can talk to me like that? I'll beat some respect into you. So you think you can beat me because I don't talk to you? I don't have to talk to you! Enough! <laughs> no. Watch now, as Inspector Javert arrives upon the scene, uphold her of all that is just and right under God's gaze. He comes, some might think, to the aid of this innocent girl who is being brutally accosted in the street. You! You're under arrest for attacking this good man. Bring her! No! No! You attacked a respected citizen, and I will be recommending a sentence of six months. Oh, God, no, sir. I'm begging you. I cannot be sent away for six months. What will happen to my child? The gentleman attacked me. He shouted things at me and hit me on the face. I'll do whatever you ask. I know you are a merciful man. Please, in God's name, I don't ask for myself, but for my child. All factors which you should have taken into consideration before, I'm afraid. I can do nothing now. Inspector Javert, release this woman. M Monsieur Le Maire, that is not possible. I have spoken to the witnesses. She is telling the truth, and she will not go to jail. Monsieur Le Maire, I appreciate your concern, but 
The citizen she attacked is well respected in the town. He is the one at fault. Under regulations, Monsieur Le Maire, I must insist that I make this decision. Enough, Chabert. I will have this poor woman taken to the hospital where her consumption will receive care, and I intend to have her debts settled. Dear God. I promise you, I knew nothing of your dismissal from my factory. But if you will allow me, I will put everything right, and you will be reunited with your child. To see my child again? It's not possible. Now, Javert, you may leave us. Yes, Monsieur Le Maire. Fontaine, do not be afraid. God has never stopped loving you of this, I'm sure. He always knows a good heart when he sees one. We must make you well and take care of you. The nuns will nurse you at the hospital. Then when you are better, we will send for your child. Life will be good again, I promise you with all my heart. Sister Sam, please. How is the patient today? She is very unwell, Monsieur Le Maire, which should be no surprise to anyone what with the life she's been leading. What are you saying, sister? Do you disapprove of us showing mercy and care for one of God's poor suffering children? She has the vocabulary of one of God's poor suffering sailors, if you ask me. Jean Valjean remembers only too well what it is to be poor, and how such poverty makes us strangers to our own souls. He approaches Fontaine, as she lies feverish in her hospital bed, and he feels a sensation which is entirely unfamiliar to him. The awakening of his loving heart. Monsieur Madeleine. Go back to sleep, Fontaine. You have to get well. I'm sorry for what I said about you before. So very sorry. You helped me when I had nowhere else to turn. You have suffered much, but you're lucky, you know that? It's well known that after so much pain comes God's love. My little girl, Cosette. We'll find your girl. We'll send for her. You'll get better once you're both together again. I'm the doctor now, and you must do everything I say. I prescribe a reunion as the best possible medicine for the patient. Make a note of that, Sister Sam, please. Oh, he thinks he's a doctor now. I thought there were no good men left in the world. But listen now. As a terrier-like man makes his way through the busy streets of the town towards the offices of the good mayor of Montreuil, sur Mer. Monsieur le maire. It is a man who has mistaken rightness for goodness. Good afternoon, Inspector Javert. I have come to humbly ask you to accept my resignation. Your resignation? Sir, I have, in the pursuance of my duty, made an unforgivable mistake. Indeed. I had become more and more convinced, sir, of late, that you were in fact a dangerous criminal, one Jean Valjean, that I once guarded in the galleys. A criminal, you say? The mayor never even looks up to meet Javert's eye. His outward appearance is barely affected. Yet within, his soul is in turmoil. I know, sir. It's insane. But nonetheless, I was convinced... I spoke to my colleagues about it. I assassinated your character. I see, Javert. But something has changed your mind. The real Jean Valjean has been arrested, sir, in Arras. Arrested? I've seen him myself, and there's no doubt. Of course, he denies it, but I'm not the only one to identify him. He was stealing apples. He's to go to trial tomorrow, and then he'll be returned to the galleys. Are you... Sure, this is the man. Without doubt, Monsieur Le Maire. So you must accept my resignation forthwith. I refuse it. You are an efficient inspector of police, Javert. Let's put this matter behind us. Monsieur Le Maire, I cannot accept your kindness. I am not kind myself. I hold to the letter of the law. That is how I have lived. I cannot profit personally by a sentimental attitude which I wholeheartedly deplore. Enough, Javert. Continue with your duties. Until you find a replacement, sir. Why is it 
that the world should offer up to us all that is beloved and brilliant and true, only to snatch it back in the same moment. Why should we be forced into battle with the opposing forces of our hearts and souls, if not for a purpose? Monsieur Scauclair! Monsieur le maire, what a fine day it is. And indeed, I trust I can be a service. I need a horse and a carriage fast enough to take me to Arras in one day. In one day, sir? Impossible. You'd need to be a bird or a cannonball to manage such a journey. No, I'd recommend a little rest, an overnight stay. There's a very nice little tavern just You have a little white horse, I hear. Oh, yes, he goes like the wind. Bit strong-willed. He once got into a mood and ate one of my best hats, which I've never had the like of again for keeping out the weather on a wintry How much? night. Name your price. For the hat? For your horse. 30 francs a day. And you need to treat him well, because, as I was saying, there's no bending him to your will. If he doesn't get a bit of sugar every so often, it's like trying to drive a bag of cats instead of an horse, which I'm very sorry for. Have him waiting with the carriage outside my house at three o'clock tomorrow morning. Of course, monsieur. I thought gardening was meant to be a calming activity, sister. Gardening is enough to make any sane woman entirely demented. Sister, you know how much I rely upon you. Indeed I do know. I'm at either backbone of this place. I want you to look after Fontaine. I know you have misgivings about such women. It's not for me to say. But I need your word that should anything happen to me, you'll care for her, protect her. Will something happen to Monsieur? Of course not. Your word, sister. You have my promise. The woman might live to regret having me looking out for her. But there you have it. Indeed I do. That night, Jean Valjean falls into a troubled, restless sleep. Can I have my coin back, mister? Remember a boy robbed by a bad man lately released from the galleys? What coin? The coin under your beat. My name is Jean Valjean, convict number 24601. And there, he finds himself confronted with all the splintered voices of his soul. Madame Magloire, kindly set another place at the table. You're wrong, Javert. I'm here. I am Jean Valjean. I've served my time. I've tried to change my life. Jean Valjean, I claim your soul. From that which wills eternal evil to that which wills eternal good. If I leave this town now, what will become of my people? I thought there were no good men left. Use this money to become an honest man. Pretty Gervais. Pretty Gervais, forgive me. In God's name, I meant you no harm. I suggest you do nothing, sir. Nothing? Don't go to Aris. Why should you care? You stay in your nice warm bed. Go back to sleep. You're right, of course. One miserable robber against the future of a poor woman, an innocent child, the welfare of a town. Jesus died between two robbers on the cross. Monsieur le maire! Monsieur le maire, it's three o'clock. Your carriage is here. Could it be true that the most profound decisions which we are asked to make in the evolution of our souls may be no more than the difference between letting things be and taking action. My good friend, we will make this journey together, you and I. Who knows where it will lead us? We will surrender ourselves to our loving God and see what he chooses to do with us. Get up! Hi! Cosette. 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 Oh, child, you wake the whole town. Oh, what was it that woke you? Was it a bad dream? I see my child only in my dreams. Lie back and I'll sit with you. Do you think I'll see my little girl again before I die? I'll have no talk of dying in my hospital. You should know that by now. Come here to me and I'll hold you. Oh. There. Oh, that's better. 
My <coughs> mother had two arms like the legs of an ox, but when she'd hold you when you'd be sick with a fever or some childhood trouble, you'd feel as safe as a house. I've never felt safe in all my life. Close your eyes and rest. Monsieur Madeleine will soon be home and all will be well. Isn't that right? Listen. Does it not taste, sound, smell like any ordinary day? People go about their work while old men die and babies blink their newly opened eyes into the light. Perhaps we walk the world a cruel joke, blown through our lives by stark, uncaring charts. You there, over here! Or maybe we are guided by a higher force and walk a path constructed just for us. That wheel's in a right state! What have you been doing, eh? Trying to win some race? I left Montreux before dawn. I have to be an Arras by tonight. Ooh, you won't be getting there with this, and no mistake. Can't it be fixed? I haven't the bits and pieces. Tomorrow, maybe. I'll buy a new wheel, then. And I would sell you one if I had one to fit. But I don't. It'll take mending, and mending takes time. I'll hire a carriage, then. I don't have any carriages, neither. Perhaps fate is telling Jean Valjean that he should simply turn his back, give up, and take the easier way. Go home to rest and comfort. And Fontaine. I'll take a post horse. I'd rather you than me. You end up in a ditch somewhere. Anyhow, you'll find no post horse here. Why not, for pity's sake? All in the fields just now. I'll buy a horse. You seen what them horses look like, friend? Great bony things that don't rush up no hills. They like to stop and have a chat at every crossroads. No, forget it. Stay the night. I'll fix you up. There's no way I can get to Arras tonight. You're sure? That's settled, then. Uh, come on, lass. So God is telling Jean Valjean he's tried his best. And obviously, he is meant to let fate take its course. I could get you a right nice carriage, sir. A boy appears in the street, as conscience might materialize. Quietly, unannounced, yet undeniable. Do you have a carriage? Uh, my mother does. It's old, but serviceable. Bit of a creaky thing, but it's never let us down just yet. My God, it's a museum piece. Good enough for Napoleon himself, my father said. And I suspect you also have a horse. <laughs> Only the finest beast in the whole town. He's not young, I'll grant you, but what he lacks in youth, you'll find him more than makes up for in his understanding of the local highways. How much? Oh, say, 20 francs. Plus feed and cart and harness rental. Blanket, uh, and uh, oh, a little bit of bread and cheese. Just 50 francs, that should see us right. <coughs> Doctor, she's been feverish all day. She's weak and losing heart. She must keep up hope, sister. We might still save her yet if only we can stave off despair. There now, Fontaine. The doctor says you're doing well. Do you know, Fontaine, I was younger than you are now when I first became a nun. You have your whole life in front of you, waiting to be lived. What a wonderful thing the world is, and how happy you will be when you're finally reunited with your child. Do you think Monsieur Madeleine has deserted me? Oh, certainly not. Monsieur Madeleine is the best man in the world. But you must never let him know that I said any such thing. I have never known the mayor to break a promise in his life. Perhaps he's gone to fetch my child. I hope he has. Let's pray he has. So, Jean Valjean arrives at Arras <laughs> as the night draws in. You there! Monsieur Madeleine! Our court's still in session. All the cases have been dealt with, sir, except one. Which one? Well, some convict been on the run these five years past. Shouldn't take long from what I hear. Uh, Monsieur Madeleine, wait! Monsieur Le Maire, wait, please! Gentlemen of the jury. You have before you. Monsieur Le Maire, Monsieur Your Honor. Madeleine, stop! Order in court! I must speak! Uh, Monsieur Madeleine. Your Honor, you must release the prisoner. Monsieur Madeleine, have you lost your mind? Your Honor, I have never been so sane. Gentlemen of the jury, I am Jean Valjean.
Is uh, Monsieur Madeleine feeling quite all right? He is, Your Honour. I am the man that you seek. I admit it again to this court that I am Jean Valjean. This extraordinary declaration of the Jean Mathia trial could not have caused more consternation than a bolt of lightning suddenly striking the presiding judge. The mayor of Montreuil, Sieur Maire, is known to us all here as one of the most prominent figures in the area. There must surely be some mistake. Alas, there is no mistake, Your Honour. I am Jean Valjean. Oh, is there some rules on the part of the defence to make a mockery of these proceedings? Of course not. I smell foul play. What's going on? What's going on? Order! Order! Order in court! And as the accusations fly back and forth, the jury is as much bemused as confused. But all this is as nothing to the bewilderment of the accused and the three criminals who so recently identified him as the fugitive Jean Valjean. Order! Order! As for Jean Valjean, he keeps his eyes fixed on the melancholy face of the Saviour as it gazes down from the crucifix suspended above the bench. What is the meaning of this, Monsieur Madeleine? Have you taken leave of your senses? If the court will permit, I shall explain. Proceed. It is before you, Your Honour, and before God that I declare myself. As I have already said, my name is Jean Valjean. Until seven years ago, as these three witnesses have already testified, I was a prisoner on the galleys. These three men have all correctly identified Jean Valjean in every particular save one. The accused in the dark is not him. I am. Upon my release from prison, I arrived in the town of Dean, where I did indeed rob silver from the Bishop of Dean and from the boy, Petit Gervais. It is with inexpressible regret and shame that I declare myself guilty of these crimes. Monsieur Madeleine, this cannot be true. I only wish Inspector Javert were present to corroborate all I have said. It is on Inspector Javert's testimony that we have identified this man as Jean Valjean. Then, with Your Honour's permission, I shall prove him wrong. May I address the witness known as Plantanier? This is most irregular, Monsieur Madeleine, but in the interests of justice I shall permit it. Oh, does the prosecution object? The prosecution will reluctantly comply with Your Honour's wishes. Stand up, Plantanier. You are the witness known as Prantenier, and not half an hour ago you identified under oath the accused as the fugitive Jean Valjean. Is that correct? It is, Your Honour. Do you know me? No, sir. I do not. Have you ever seen me before? I don't think so, sir. I see. Do you not have a scar on your right shoulder, which was caused by Koshpai, the gentleman on your left, attempting to burn away the initials TFP? Oh, yes, sir. I do, sir. Yes, sir. You also referred to yourself in prison as Godless, did you not? And is it not by this name that you are known to your fellow convicts? Well, Monsieur Prantanier, the court is waiting. This man is correct in every particular, Your Honour. You may sit down. May I now question the witness, Koshpai? Proceed. The witness will stand up. Your name is Koshpai, is it not? It is, sir. And do you have a daughter? Objection. Whether or not the witness has a daughter is entirely irrelevant to this trial. I beg the court's indulgence. Overruled. You may continue, Monsieur Madeleine. I am indebted to you, Your Honour. I ask you again. Do you have a daughter? What's this all about? Am I on trial here? Please answer the question. Well? Once. I had a daughter, yes. And is her name Beatrice? It is, sir. And did this Beatrice pay you money to deny any familial connection to you when she became betrothed to a member of the Italian aristocracy? You swore that you would never tell, Valjean. I apologise, Koshpai, but it is a matter of life and death. I will ask you again. Did your daughter pay you to deny all familial connection to you when she became engaged? The witness will answer. She did, sir. Thank you, Koshpai. Are we to understand that this secret was only known to you, Monsieur Madeleine? You are, sir. For justice's sake, I beg you, Koshpai, 
Do you or do you not identify me as Jean Valjean? Well, speak up, man. Well, don't, don't ask me how. It's changed so much since I last saw him. But I only told the secret of my daughter's marriage to one man on earth. I was ashamed, you see. And who was that man? Jean Valjean. Or prisoner 24601, as he was known then. You are absolutely sure of this. I am, sir. Does the court still doubt that I am indeed Jean Valjean? and that the accused is wholly innocent of any crime he is alleged to have committed in that felon's name. In all my 30 years at the bench, I have never witnessed anything quite like this. You uh, you have us at a loss, Monsieur Madeleine. If I am not to be arrested immediately, I will now quit this court. You know my address and whereabouts, and I may be discovered there at any time. I am at the court's disposal. God bless you, monsieur, whoever you are, for taking pity on a poor man. If you knew how close I was to doing nothing, I do not think you would thank me, my friend. Goodbye. And with that, Jean Valjean turns on his heel and leaves as suddenly as he arrived. Order! Order! If there is not silence, I shall hold you all in contempt. Not half an hour later, the accused man, Jean Mathieu, is acquitted and the case dismissed. I will not have a mockery made of my courtroom. No, Your Honour, no. Who does this Madeleine think he is? Well, I don't know, I'm sure, sir. Uh, Saint Javier, explain everything that's transpired today and issue a warrant for Monsieur Madeleine's immediate arrest. Yes, Your Honour. Then why are you still standing there, man? Find Javier! Oh. Monsieur Madeleine, at last. How is Fontaine? Oh, she's sleeping at the moment. I've been worried sick. And her condition? Worsening by the hour. You may be just in time. I'll go in and see her now. But you're exhausted yourself. Won't you take a moment to rest? Sister Sam, please. There are certain matters I must explain to you urgently. Uh, matters? What, what matters? What's wrong, Monsieur Madeleine? And now he tells her everything. You think they'll arrest you? You may depend upon it. Inspector Javert is probably on his way here now. Do you have the warrant, Inspector Javert? I do. The felon Valjean was seen arriving at his home not one hour ago. I understand you had your suspicions from the very first, Inspector. I believe I recognized him as a wanted man some time ago, Your Honor. But without proof, the law is impotent. Uh, indeed. My only worry is that he will receive parole again. You may rest assured, Inspector Javert, that the issue of parole will never arise in Jean Valjean's case again. I will see to it personally that he is put away for life. What are we doing if not protecting the virtue of the law, Inspector Javert? The law is the law. It must never be sullied. Monsieur Madeleine. Here, Fontaine. Is she here? Is Cosette here? All in good time, Fontaine. All in good time. <coughs> I must see her. I must see my little girl. Try and be patient, my dear. But you went to find her. Didn't you go to find her, Monsieur Madeleine? I did, Fontaine. Then where is she? Fontaine, you must try. Where? Is she? Cosette is outside, Fontaine. Monsieur Madeleine. Then why don't you bring her in? I fear that you are not strong enough to see her just at the moment. Please, Monsieur Madeleine, bring me my Cosette. Cosette? Still consulting with your whore, 24601? What's he talking about? Oh, didn't our worthy mayor divulge his prison number to your sister? Can't you see this poor woman's dying? For shame. I'll take care of this, Sister Sam, please. That's not Cosette. Where's Cosette? It's over, Valjean. Come quiet. This is the mayor's house. She's not the mayor anymore. The law must take its course. Jean Valjean, I have a warrant for your arrest. A word with you, Inspector. What? Fontaine is dying. Speak up. 
All I ask is a little compassion. The death of a prostitute is no concern of mine. Just give me three days to find her child, then I will hand myself over to you. Three days? Do you take me for a fool? It's a fine state of affairs when a criminal begs a favour for his slut from an officer of the law. Cosette. Oh, Monsieur Madeleine. Fontaine. She's gone. Her death is on your hands, Javert. Years later, Sister Simplice would tell of how Monsieur Madeleine leaned over and whispered to Fontaine, On my life, Fontaine, I will find your Cosette. And how she was sure, in that extraordinary moment, a distant smile crossed Fontaine's lips, as some profound, intangible peace pervaded the terrible abyss of death in her wide, lifeless eyes. A job well done, Inspector Javier. <laughs> this one won't be disrupting any more trials. The law has been upheld. Why doesn't he speak? Don't you know me? Jean turns his eyes to face the judge now staring at him through the jail bars. I know you very well, Your Honour. Oh, Monsieur le Maire, I thought that they'd arrested you. Did those so-called police officers finally come to their senses and set you free? I must get some things from my room, and then I must leave forever. Forever? I've made provision for Fontaine's funeral. See that my instructions are carried out, I beg of you. Oh! <gasps> They're here. Where will you go? I am in your hands, Sister Samplice. God bless you, Monsieur Madeleine. But you're in God's hands, not mine. I'll never forget you. I'm coming, I'm coming. Where is he, Sister? If you mean Monsieur Le Maire, I thought he was with you, Inspector. You know very well he's escaped. I have men here who pull this house apart brick by brick if need be. And Sister Samplice, who has never told a lie, who has lived her life in strict adherence to her holy vows, looks straight back at the inspector and says, Monsieur Le Maire is not here. Search all you want. Very well. The fugitive's not here. Search the factories. Sister Samplice did not, not for one moment, regret the lie she told for the finest man she ever knew. The mayor of montreuil sur mer Monsieur Madeleine, Jean Valjean, who even now is walking away from the community he as good as built. He does not look back, only forwards, and he has but one thought on his mind. Fantine, I swear to you, by all the saints in heaven, that I will never, never rest until I find your daughter. Until I find Cosette. <laughs> and that was when Napoleon sends for me. The might of Wellington's army gathered on the fields all about us. Tenardier, he says. Tenardier? France salutes you. Etc. Etc. The Emperor Bonaparte. Yeah, and the next day, the Battle of Waterloo began, and I don't mind telling you. Oh, oh, oh. By the end of that day, those fields were with the multitudinous blood incarnadine, as the English poet Spokesbeard wrote. <sighs> Very short, you know. The Emperor. Three hours' walk from Paris. There is a tavern in the town of Montfermeil. Yeah, have another drink. Oh, what is it, my dove? We need some water from the spring. A grim red tavern, smoky and dark, with a faded sign hanging from a rusty hinge, squeaking in the chill night air. Oh, send Cassette. That's what she's there for. Can't you shut that baby up? He's putting off the customers. You shut the dirty little brat up. He's your son, too. I've got work to do. Cosette! Christmas Eve in Montfermeil. All week, 
The two Tenardier girls, Eponine and Azelma, have pressed their excited noses against the toy shop window, marveling at the exquisite doll within. But these are not the only children in the inn. In the tiny room above the cellar, an eight-month-old baby cries. No mother attends to him. No father rushes to his aid. For it must be stated here that while both Tenadiers heaped affection upon their daughters, neither had a moment's concern for their baby son, Gavroche. He was their bankrupt, and they thought as little as they could about him. And I don't want you dallying, is that clear, Cosette? Yes, madame. And I don't want you spilling it all on the way back, do you understand me? Yes, madame. We have already met Monsieur and Madame Tenadier, for these are the people Fontaine entrusted her daughter Cosette to. In the months since Fontaine's death, they've heard no word nor received any payment for Cosette's upkeep. If they treated her like a servant before, now she is no better than their slave. Oh, and here's 15 sous. You can bring us back a loaf of bread and all. Well, don't just stand there. Lark indeed. A chill wind whistles through the leafless trees, and as the rough path narrows into a track, Cosette marches bravely into the deep, dark heart of the wood, and it seems of the night itself. The buckets bang at her side. Suddenly... Who's that? Just follow the path, Cosette. Just follow the path. And at the well... She thinks she sees a man's shadow in the woods. Please, God, protect me. Just follow the path. Just follow the path. And now the cold of that December night gnaws into her bones. The water in the buckets weighs her down until she can bear it no more. Oh, God, help me. Help me, God. When, as if in answer to her prayer, one bucket is lifted from her hand and then the other. Who are you, monsieur? Don't be afraid, little one. What have you asked for, for Christmas? I'm not allowed to ask for anything, monsieur. But if you could ask... There is a doll. This is foolish, monsieur. Well? There is a doll. And all the little girls are in love with it, but I'll be happy with whatever I'm given, Monsieur. Monsieur and Madame Thénardier are very kind to me. Where is this famous doll? In the toy shop window, over there. There you are! Um, but the buckets were so heavy. So I met this gentleman, and he wants to have some lodging for the night. Does he now? You can put me where you like, even the stable. What's your price? Ten francs. Very well. But isn't the price five, madame? Oh, yeah, very good. Very good, child. <laughs> yeah, very good, are you? Yes, monsieur, as you can see, it is Christmas. Our rooms are very much in demand, etc., etc. Increase in prices, match season. <laughs> in short, it is, uh, it is ten francs. <laughs> The child made an honest mistake. For which I trust she will not be punished. Punished? My wife and I love cassettes as if she was our own. Don't we, my dove? Oh, yes, monsieur. Run along now, cassette. The lark, they call her. She's not your daughter, then. Oh, <laughs> heavens no, monsieur. A young woman left her with us. <laughs> Said she'd pay for the child's board and lodging, and now she's gone and disappeared on us. Well, I'm sure monsieur doesn't want to hear about our worries, my dear. Oh, perhaps monsieur would care for a glass of wine... We keep only the very best vintages. Uh, then your name would uh, be... Tenardier, monsieur. <coughs> At your most uh, humble service. And this uh, is my lovely wife. <laughs> Valjean's eyes fix on the couple before him. There is no question now. This is indeed Fontaine's child. This poor, scrawny creature, barely covered by her rags, is Cosette. Well, where is it? I don't know, madame. I must have dropped it. Oh, that's 15 sous. Do you think I'm made of money? I'll go back and look for it. Excuse me, madame. What do you want, monsieur? I believe this is what you're looking for. And with that, 
Jean drops a 15 sou coin into Madame Thenardier's mighty palm. Oh, and by the way, I wonder if you might let me buy the child's time for the rest of the evening. Buy the child's time? Would five francs be sufficient? Five francs? Yes, certainly. Now, go and play, Cosette. The time is yours. Play? Play? I believe I've purchased the child's time. Play, madame. May I go and play? You heard the gentleman. <coughs> I don't understand it. He's not to be trusted, and that's for sure. And the way he treats Cosette, as if he knows her. There's something wrong, my dove. And no mistake. Have you worked out the bill for his room? <laughs> I've charged him four times over the odds. <laughs> So we'll see what he does when he gets the bill in the morning. We'll see him then for who he is. No mistake. Tenardier. Yeah, my dove. You should have made it five times over. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> yeah, we made a fortune tonight, my dove, eh? Naughty, <laughs> naughty <laughs> man. Maintenance and upkeep of the fire, uh, 10 francs, uh, etc., etc. Provision of and cleaning of linen, uh, 20 francs. Um, oh, flowers in the room. Mother! Oh, what God, kids. What? Uh, what and so, oh, uh, with the addition of wood for the fire, the total comes to uh, 40 francs. But last night it was only 10. Oh, Monsieur is, of course, right, but it's the extras, isn't it? Those, those little extras. <laughs> what would it cost to live in these days, etc., etc.? How should a honest man live? <laughs> Tenardier! In the kitchen! Oh, now! Excuse me, sir. Cassette's got the doll. The doll that everyone's been talking about. I want that doll. You promised me, Father. Where did you get that dolly cassette? I don't know. I found her here next to my clocks this morning. And that's not all. Someone's left a gold coin in her clock for Christmas, when all I've got in mind is an orange, an horrible orange. What is the meaning of this, Cosette? Come on, tell me, or I'll have the belt here. The doll is a gift from me. You will not harm a child. From you, monsieur? Why, she got the lovely oh, dolly. Sh it's not fair. I hate it. I oh, no. It's all right. Perhaps I could have a word with you, monsieur oh, Tenardier. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> I want it. I want it. I know you do, darling. And mummy get you one. Under no circumstances, monsieur. C Cassette? It's like a daughter. More than a daughter to me. So I see. I don't even know your name, monsieur. At least show me some identity or... Give me an address in Paris where you both might be reached. When you agree to my offer, it is my intention that Cosette will never see you, your wife or your children ever again, and you will make no attempt to locate us. But, monsieur, what about her poor, poor mother? What if she was to return? How much? Oh, what better foster parents could she have, monsieur? I was a war hero. I served at Waterloo under the command of Colonel Pontmerie. How much? Fifteen hundred francs. And you agree to all my conditions? Fifteen hundred and the girl is yours. Agreed. Done. Oh, excuse me. Eponine, will you please shut up? Am I ever going to come back here, monsieur? Never, Cosette. You have my word. As God is my witness. Don't you want to say goodbye to your little sisters, Cosette? I know you're going to miss them. Must I remind you of our agreement? Goodbye. Are you taking me to my mother? Your mother, Cosette? Your mother is in heaven now. In heaven? Like an angel? Just like an angel. She loved you very much. Did she send you? Yes, Cosette. Are you my father then? No. But I shall be like a father to you. Always. Ooh. When we get to Paris, 
The first thing I'm going to buy you is a good warm coat. And now they set off for Paris, Jean and Cosette. His great arm around her tiny shoulders, his heart in the tiny palm of her hand. But hardly have they cleared the wood when. Stand behind me, Cosette. Who's there? Show yourself. Thenardier. Is that you? Yes, monsieur. What's your business with us? Speak up. I'm returning your money. And Cassette, I'm afraid to say, is coming back with me. I'm a man of honor, monsieur. I can't be bribed. Oh, no. Good day, sir. Uh, I couldn't possibly part with my beloved Cassette unless there was some letter, some proof authorizing the said bearer was indeed instructed to be the girl's legal guardian. It's a wily fox indeed that outwits Tenardier. Perhaps you would read this. Huh? Monsieur Tenardier, you will give Cassette into the care of the bearer of this note. All debts will be settled. Fontaine. You recognize the signature, I trust? All debts settled. That's a lot of debts. Today I paid you 1,500 francs. <laughs> I don't know who you think you're dealing with, mister. What's your name? But either you pay me another 1,000 crowns, or I'm taking Cassette back, get me? Oh, Leave me no choice. Hey! Ow! Stand back, Cassette. Frets, is it? It's very nice. No. Ow! You, you're the very devil himself. Oh! Look out for those nettles. Oh, Jesus! Oh. I'll kill you for this. You mark my words. I will not let this lie. Go! Oh! It's all right, Cosette. Has, has he gone? I swear, Cosette that you will never be threatened by that man again. Not while I have a breath in my body. What are we going to do in Paris? We're going to live, Cosette. Live. I think you'll find the rooms to your liking, sir, given that you say you're after somewhere quiet. I'm tired, father. The little girl's had a long journey, has she? We'll take it. Will you be wanting me to send for your luggage, sir? That won't be necessary, thank you. Travel light, do you? We'll call down if we need anything. I'm always there to be of service, sir. Good day. Let's open a window and let in some air. Where are we? This is Paris, Cosette. What do you think of it? I like it, I think. Good. And so do I. <laughs> <laughs> Come, let us watch as Jean Valjean approaches yet another episode in the development of his soul. He is learning how to give again. He is teaching Cosette to read. The forest was full of the tallest... Trees. Trees. And up the branches were... Houses. Very good. You read so well, my darling. And inside the houses lived... Birds. That's right. And happy were the birds who lived safe in their homes, away from the dangers of the world of men. And there they would... Sing. Sing out their hearts and sleep very peacefully under the... Stars. Good. They know each other's needs. They are joined by their wounded souls and battered hearts. And silently, they agree to come together and be healed. Oh, well. Are you going Father, to... Father, you're playing with my doll. Not playing, Cosette. Having a conversation. <laughs> but she doesn't talk to you. Of course she does, don't you, my dear? Yes, Monsieur Jean. Why, only yesterday she was complaining, weren't you? Yes. That she had terrible indigestion from that bread you gave her for lunch. She did She did. She also quite distinctly told me that you put a piece of cheese inside her ear and that she couldn't possibly take the air and meet her friends with a piece of cheese in her ear. Now, uh, listen to them play. They love each other. 
and the feeling is as new as we might feel if we could but remember the first time we saw the moon, or smelt the sea, or watched a falling star. Oh, your father not in, my dear. He's gone to buy some bread. Oh, that's nice. We can have a little chat then, can't we? Oh, I see he's taking that yellow coat of his. He always wears his coat. They say he keeps his money in his coat. Don't all men keep their money in their coats, madame? Can I help you with something? Oh, just, uh, just saying to the girl that that beggar on the street's a right nuisance, sir. Keep telling him to shift himself, but he don't take no heed of me. Jean Valjean makes his way to the narrow window, where below in the street a beggar with an unmistakable resemblance to Inspector Javert, catches his eye for just an instant. No, it can't be. Inspector Javert, who remembers Jean Valjean from the galleys, who is determined to see justice run its undeniable course. What is it, Father? Nothing. It's nothing, child. My imagination... And later that same night, as Jean Valjean approaches his home... Madame, madame, Monsieur. a moment if you please. That fellow I saw you with just now... Who would that be, sir? The man who left you here. Oh, just someone looking for a room. He's moving in tonight. Cosette. What? Now they must run if they are to survive. Cosette, take my hand. We're in danger. It is nearly midnight. And Paris lies sleeping, but moving beside the gutters, close to the walls of buildings, keeping out of the light of the street lamps, two shadowy forms. Where are we going, father? Be quiet now, Cosette. Here's a panther, huge, but moving silently on velvet paws. She is his young, held firmly by the hand, as a mother cat might carry its own child, ever so gently in its dangerous mouth. We must find a place to hide. But why? What's happened? The Tenardiers are after us. They've come to take you back. He might as well have said the world is about to end. The child, white as a sheet, grips his big hand tighter, and he leads her on. He knows not where. Your attention, if you please. We know our suspect is in the area and that he's traveling with a child, so he won't be moving quickly. You will split up in twos, casting a wide net around the quarter, and slowly cut him off. I'm tired, Father. Quiet, Cosette. There's a policeman on the corner. Do you want him to tell Madame Thenardier that he saw us? I'm frightened. Let me carry you. He's being spotted, sir. I will not give you up. Not now. Make sure the streets guarded at this end. It's a cul-de-sac. There's no way out. Damn you, Shavir. I want every inch of this street search. Do you understand? I want Valjean arrested tonight. Jean Valjean's heart is pounding in his chest. The police are closing in, and it's fair to say that he truly has his back against the wall. When suddenly, he feels the brickwork underneath his hands, and with no way forward and no way back, he turns his face up to the stars and starts to climb, his child upon his back, his superhuman strength his only hope. Inch by inch, with the will of a man whose life truly does depend upon him. Valjean's fingers grasp the stone, and painfully, he pulls himself skywards, Cosette clinging to him, her arms around his neck. Now from the stars they fall. Into what? It seems to be a garden full of scented evening flowers. Where are we, Father? Shh! Someone's coming. Hide behind me. Now, my little vegetables, everyone needs to be tucked up for the night in his nice warm glosses. <laughs> Why? What's happened here? 
There's an elephant made an all in the flower bed. <laughs> Don't make a sound. I'll make it worth your while. What do you want? A hundred francs to buy your silence and give me shelter for the night. <laughs> Why? Monsieur Madeleine. You know my name? My benefactor. Don't you know who I am? I'm Fauchelevent. You rescued me when I was nearly crushed under that cart. How could I ever forget you? You'll help me then. I cannot tell you why. Help you? Of course I'll help. Of course, of course. Huh? There's something else. I have a child with me. Come out, Cosette. A child? Well, I saw you have a, a child. Uh, how nice. Well, you must come back with me to my cottage and get warm. We'll have milk and sit in front of the fire. Would you like that? <laughs> of course, we must have warm milk with sugar, definitely. I'm, I'm sure I have some sugar. Fauchelevent, I cannot tell you anything. If you feel that's a problem... Oh, nothing is a problem for you, Monsieur Madeleine. It is an honour to repair your trust. Now, come, we must get ourselves inside. I want every house on this street searched. I want him found. Do whatever you need to do. Sir! She's sleeping. Good. That's very good. Now, come and warm yourself, sir, and tell me how I can help you. I need to stay. Stay? Wait. You stay here? A week or two, perhaps a month. A week? A month? I impossible. My dearest friend, you are a man, and no man is permitted to the convent apart from himself. And even I have to wear a bell like some old cow to warn the nuns I'm coming. Oh, dear God, ask anything else from me but stay. Oh, it's impossible. Fauchelevent, I need to stay with the child. I promise you, if we go outside these walls, we're doomed. Our fate is in your hands. In my hands? That's the Reverend Mother calling me. You'll protect us? With my life. Depend upon it. At this hour and at the same hour every day, blessed be the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely. As if we don't have enough to trouble us. I've just had policemen at the front door looking for some man. A man? Police? How rude. Monsieur Fauchelevent. I have very sad news to impart to you. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I hate sad news. Yes, I'm afraid it is poor Sister Crucifixion. Oh, dear. She has gone forth from this life to be with our Saviour this very evening. A beautiful death. And you'll be expecting the coffin, Reverend Muller. Indeed, the coffin is expected tomorrow morning. For the burial in the city cemetery, no doubt. For a traditional burial in the convent vault. Well, Reverend Mother, that is against the law. What law is this? Man's law. What is man's law beside God's law? Still in all, there are regulations and checks, so to speak. Well, naturally, we will need to be discreet. Discreet? I will lend you Sister Ascension to help you. Help me do what? Tomorrow, a coffin will arrive at the convent to collect the body of our dear departed sister. You will put something in it. Put something in it? I'm sure you'll think of something. Are you sure we shouldn't put the body of Sister Crucifixion in it? Monsieur Fauchelevent, oh. was it not one of the seven German kings who specifically stated that members of religious orders have a right to be buried under the altar of their place of worship? Oh, yes, but that was before the regulation. You will need a crowbar, and as I said, you will have Sister Ascension to help you lift the stone. So, Monsieur Fauchelevent... I can depend on you absolutely in this matter? Of course, Reverend Mother. Poor Sister Crucifixion must be properly laid to rest. Quite so. Just one thing more, Reverend Mother. I wonder if I might speak to you of my brother, who's recently arrived in Paris with his little child. We've searched the city, sir. He's gone. No sign of him anywhere. It's like he's vanished into thin air. She's not vanished. I know that man from long ago. He's gone to ground somewhere. I want extra patrols in the area. I will find him. Monsieur Madeleine, I have a plan for your rescue. And it's quite a clever plan, if I say so myself. I'm grateful for help of any kind. 
Tomorrow, I am to bury a nun secretly in the church. But this is against the law. Try telling that to the Reverend Muller. A coffin will be delivered to the convent and he must go out again with a body in it. That body will be yours. There's no need to be afraid. I handle all the burials at the convent and I know the grave digger well. He's a drunk. <laughs> Offer him a glass of wine and he'll down tools there and then. We'll smuggle you out in the coffin. I'll take the grave digger off, get him drunk before we bury you, sneak back and lay you out. Once you're outside the convent, you can officially arrive and be admitted as my brother to live here with me and help me with the garden. And what of Cosette? I'll take her out my gardening barrow. It's not hard to smuggle out a little girl, but a grown man's another matter. I'll do it. What am I saying? I must be mad. Nail you into a coffin? Take you away to bury you? What if it goes wrong? Oh, Monsieur Madeleine, I must be insane. A little death is not such a price to pay to win another life. Come, Fauchelevent, take heart. It's a wonderful idea. Let's drink to the coming day and a new life. A new to life. a new life. Monsieur Madeleine, everything is ready. We must make haste if we're not to be discovered. Cosette, come here, my child. We have a big adventure ahead of us. Now you must listen very carefully. All right. We must leave the convent in secret because, well... It's most unusual to arrive anywhere by climbing over a wall. The Reverend Mother might think that we were very strange people indeed if she discovered us here without having properly knocked on her front door. Could we tell her that Madame Thenardier was chasing us? I'm not sure she'd understand. But once we're safely outside, we'll come back, I promise you, and we'll introduce ourselves and see if she'll let us stay. Would you like that? Yes. So now... Climb into this sack, and Monsieur Fauchelevent will take you outside, hidden in his wheelbarrow. You'll spend the day with one of his friends. Are you coming too? Soon. Now in you get, Cosette. Then you must be as quiet as a mouse. I love you, my little girl. I can't talk to you. I'm a mouse. Very good. All right, Fauchelevent. Don't worry, Monsieur Madeleine. She'll be safe with me. God bless you both. Let me show you the mortuary chamber of the convent of Petit Picpus, that last outpost before the final journey to the afterlife. Few of the living linger here for long, but Jean Valjean is trying out his coffin like a brand new suit of clothes. Do you know, first of all, this coffin. It isn't too bad. A bit tight around the shoulders. I may suffer a bit from pins and needles. Are you sure we're not mad, sir? What if something goes wrong and... Oh, God in heaven, this is all my fault. I should never have suggested it. To put you in a coffin and nail you in it. What if you suffocate? Fauchelevent, my friend, I trust you. Do you, sir? Oh, I hope I deserve that trust. Oh, dear God, I hope I deserve it because... You see, sir, in the past I have on occasion been a bit of a fool. Well, perhaps not a complete fool, but I cannot pretend that my judgment has always been 100%, so to speak. First of all, calm yourself. Nail the lid on this coffin, and when I next see you, we'll laugh about all this. Laugh? <laughs> oh, I hope so. Oh, I do hope so. <laughs> Poor Jean Valjean lies in his coffin. The only sound is breathing. The only sight, darkness. We spend our lives in haste, waste up our precious hours in hurrying to and fro. For what? If we could but lie as Jean Valjean lies, suspended between life and death, with no distraction save the beating of his own poor heart, then we might hear that which we long and long to hear, the simple voice of the soul. Dear God, let me survive this night and live to fulfill my promise to Fontaine. In return for this,
this, I will be a father to Cosette, and guard her with my life until the day I die. Morning has come, and God is good. Jean Valjean is still alive when he is lifted onto the hearse. Jean Valjean, the stealer of bread, the despised convict, the generous mayor, the rescuer of Fontaine and Cosette, is born alive in a coffin along the back streets and the boulevards of Paris. Good morning, friend. Good day. Good day. And uh, who are you? The grave digger. The grave digger. The grave digger? Well, where's Père Mestienne? Père Mestienne dropped dead last night. He's dead? He's dead? Well, how can he be dead? After life comes death. We don't get no say. <laughs> In the convent of Petit Picpus, Sister Crucifixion awaits her illegal burial under the chapel altar. While in her coffin, Jean Valjean travels upon the hearse to the Pont Austerlitz, past women walking in the early morning sunshine of the parks, and his ears strain for the animated conversations of young men wrapped in passionate debate down by the river. He has never so deeply longed for life as I could do with a drink. Perhaps we could just go and have a little glass of wine. I'm in a state of shock, you see. Sister Crucifixion was such a lovely woman, so kind, so pure, so dedicated to a church. I'll never drink. I've got a wife and kids at home. I'll tell you what, we'll put this customer to bed and then we'll both be off. It won't take long to lay this soul to rest. Through the yawning gates of the cemetery, the little procession makes its way. The land of the living with its cafes and laughing children is left behind for the silent world of the dead. Careful, careful for pity's sake! There's a precious body in that casket. She don't feel nothing now, do she? You don't like we're dropping some friend into that hole. <laughs> no, no, you're right, that's true, that's true, but... Don't you think we should always respect the dead? Well, you've gone as white as a sheet, if you don't mind me saying. <laughs> don't worry about it. I always look like this. I've got stomach trouble and heart trouble. Altogether, I'm a very troubled man. As the priest starts to offer up the prayers for the dead, Fauchelevent catches sight of the gravedigger's pass as it falls from his trouser pocket into the muddy earth. And with the speed of a professional pickpocket, he reaches down and slips the card in his own jacket. Come on, come on. Some of us have to go to. A gravedigger's pass is a very special document in this city. And without it, a man might lose the right to work and earn his bread. Don't you feel we rush through life really far too quickly? Don't suppose I've had time to think about it. That's what to me. Oh, we should pause now and then enjoy the view. A glass of wine. You got a drink problem or something? It's just a tradition. Oh, Mestian and I, we always used to have a little drink. I will drink with you then if we must. Oh, good. I'm very glad. But after the box is buried. Come on, my friend. It's not like it's going to take us long. Requiescat in pace. Amen. Inside the coffin, Jean Valjean is waiting for release. He waits and waits. Let's get stuck in there. Here's your shovel, friend. Now must the man hear what the dead have heard for many an age. The last sounds of the world obliterated with layers of falling earth. Dear God. Dear God. Obviously. Good father. What with always wanting to rush home to all those children of yours. I'll try my best. Being a father ain't easy. It must be a terrible strain. Nearly sundown. Gates will be closing soon. All the more reason to finish the job in hand and get ourselves back home. I trust you've got your pass for the guard so you can get out without a fine. <laughs> I never put it down. Those bosses charging us 15 francs if we lose our pass. It's a rip-off if you ask me. Oh, I know. I've complained, you know. But, friend, it isn't here. What isn't it? 
my pass, my, my security pass. I always have it here in my pocket and... It's gone. Gone? It can't be gone. It is. I don't find me now, for sure. That's a week's wages down the drain. That's no food on the table. That's... That's hungry kids. Go home and search for it. They still haven't locked the gates. You go back and find it. I'll finish up our business here. Oh, friend. I owe you one. I've got to find that car. Well, off you go now. Run. And make sure you get out before they lock the gates. I will. I will. Oh, oh Monsieur Bradley. We've buried you alive. There's three feet of earth on your head. How could I have done this? God in heaven, I should be put in a lunatic asylum. You'll be dead and it's all the fault of stupid, idiotic, brainless force. Where's my crowbar? Shut up, you stupid owl. There's a man in this coffin. The best, most generous man that ever wore this earth. And I've killed him. I all the saints in heaven. Let him be alive. If you let him be alive, I'll never drink again. I was in cold water. I'll beat myself with sticks for the rest of my days, but let him be alive. Dead. Dead. He's dead. I've killed him, oh my God. White as a sheet and cold, cold, cold as ice. I've made an orphan of his little girl. There's no choice left. I'll, I'll have to kill myself. I cannot live with this. Oh, Monsieur Madeleine, forgive me, my old, old friend. Fauchelevent. Ah! <laughs> You're kneeling on my chest. Oh, is it a ghost? Oh, dear God, I'm pursued by devils. You are. You're being pursued by a devil with the worst case of pins and needles in Paris. Alive? Oh, thank God. God, oh, Monsieur Madeleine, I thought I'd murdered you. Give me your hand. Be quiet, oh. sir, or else the guards will hear you. You're talking to a man who's just been buried alive. If you could just be resurrected a bit more quietly. Oh. Blood's rushing back into my legs. Shh. Oh, no one ever told me resurrection was going to be so painful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, first of all. I owe you everything. You owe me nothing, sir. Now come, let's find your girl. So, after a breakfast of milk and hope, Jean Valjean walks with Cosette and Fauchelevent to the convent of Petit Picpus. The sunshine on his face and the sweet morning air in his lungs. Jean Valjean is indeed reborn this day. He has risen from his coffin and walked into the light, his beloved child at his side and all the possibilities of a new life before him. He is renewed, as we all may be renewed, when we choose for love to be the victor over fear. Ah, Monsieur Fauchelevent, I trust all went well with the burial of poor Sister Crucifixion in the public cemetery. I think I can say, Reverend Mother, that the sister has been laid to rest in exactly the manner she would have wanted. Excellent. And who have we here? As I explain, Reverend Mother, this is my brother and his daughter, Cassette. You are a gardener also, monsieur? There is no place where it is possible to be closer to God. Quite so. Quite so. And as I explain, Reverend Mother, what with my bad back and my bad leg, and those fainting fits I occasionally have, it would be very useful to have another pair of hands in the garden. You have been a loyal servant, Fauchelevent. <laughs> I think you must have your assistant, if that is what you want. <laughs> your brother can live with you in your cottage, and your niece will be educated in the convent, with time every day to visit her father and play. How would you like that, my child? I'd like to have friends, madame. I've never had friends before. We shall be happy, then, for here at the convent we are great believers in friendship. So that's settled. And all that remains for me is to say, welcome to your new home. Basque. Bah, 
Yes, Captain. Where is the fool? You wanted to see me, Grandfather. <laughs> Marius, did Basque deliver my message? What message? The message that I wanted to see you. No? He didn't? Not that I'm aware I'll of, I'll have sir. to dismiss him. The fellow's useless, quite useless. It is time to introduce important new faces to our story. What did you want to see me about, Grandfather? Uh, to see you about? The message you sent Basque with. Oh, that. Uh, how, how are your legal studies progressing, Marius? Adequately, sir? Only adequately. I hear great things. I have some sombre news to impart. Is my ribbon straight? Basque is completely useless with this sort of thing. Your ribbon is quite straight, sir. Sombre news. You're absolutely certain about the ribbon? I am, sir. Mm -mm. Monsieur Luc Esprit Gillenormand is an old man for whom the appetites of youth are scarcely diminished. A man whose legendary aptitude for love was gossiped upon in all the salons of Paris, and who now, as he fast approaches his 90th year, bewails the passing of the beheaded monarchy of France, and resides in a Baroque world he wishes he could preserve in aspic. With his spinster daughter, Mademoiselle Gillenormand, who keeps his house, and his grandson Marius, who keeps his heart. You said you had some somber news. A somber news? Uh, ah, yes. You may recall that wayward adventurer and shameless swashbuckler, one Monsieur Pontmercy. My father, yes. The impudent scoundrel. Not only does he seduce my late beloved daughter, but also he has the infamy to adopt the title of baron. The effrontery. And he never showed the slightest interest in you, my boy. Never. Not once. What about him? Well, well, the old Bonapartiste has had the decency to die at last. He's dead. I'm sorry, Marius, yes. And he has, as a dying wish, arrogantly requested your presence at the funeral. Shall I send word that you will not go? Well, if it was my father's dying wish, I suppose I must. When is the funeral? First thing tomorrow. Perhaps it's not convenient. I'll instruct Basque to prepare the carriage. D re remember, Marius, the man had no love for you. He was a cowardly follower of that uppity little corporal and a traitor to France. I know that, sir. Now, the ribbon. You're sure? You're absolutely sure it doesn't sway to the left? It is time to meet this legendary swashbuckler. Colonel Pontmercy! What did the Emperor command? The Emperor instructs the cavalry to attack Mont Saint-Jean. And to do this, we must travel back ten years and journey to the battlefield of Waterloo on that fateful morning of June the 18th, 1816. For there we will find Colonel Pontmercy, splendid and fearless upon his steed, commander of the Imperial Cavalry, eager to do his duty. Send word to the Emperor that his cavalry is at its disposal. At once, sir! Take up your sword, gentlemen! Our hour of glory is at hand! Yeah! Mr. Marius? Can it really be you? My name is Marius, yes. I don't believe Oh, I... forgive me. My name is Mabeuf. I have the honor of being the warden of this beautiful church. A pleasure to make your acquaintance, sir. I knew your father, the late Baron Pontmercy, very well. An incalculable loss, I'm sure. Good day. Your father spoke about you every time we met. A privilege he never afforded me, sir. You were always so serious, even as a child. I do not recall ever having had the honor of making your acquaintance before, Monsieur Mabeuf. Or my father's. It was there, just behind the statue of Saint Joseph, that he would watch you making your prayers every Sunday. It broke the poor man's heart never to be able to approach or even speak with you. My late father, sir, was a traitor both to his family and to France. Now wait, wait. Gentlemen, our objective is to cut through the enemy's infantry and take Mont Saint Jean. If all goes to plan, we should enjoy a little sport with our friends, the English. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are you with me, gentlemen? To the death! death! Remember, we fight today in the name of the Emperor and for the glory and honor of France. For France! For France! Long live the Emperor! Long live the Emperor! We are
have nothing more to say to one another. I promised the Baron I would try and speak with you. <laughs> if the late Monsieur Pontmercy wished to speak to me, why didn't he do so himself? Because he was forbidden to do so under the terms of his agreement. What agreement? Uh, the one your father made with your grandfather, Monsieur Gilles Normand, after your mother's death. I'm not aware of any agreement. Huh. Monsieur Gilles Normand threatened to disinherit you if he was not allowed to bring you up as his own. What? You see, your father would never renounce his loyalty to Napoleon. To him, this was a sacred bond. It is no secret that my grandfather regards Napoleon and the Republic before with the contempt they deserve. But he would never deny a father access to his son. I trust that you can prove these outlandish accusations, sir. It is all in your father's correspondence. <sighs> Well, what's keeping him? I should never have told him about the funeral. Perhaps he has an assignation. An assignation? You think so? Young Marius? He is nearly 19. He is at that. Why, the rogue, the cunning rogue. <laughs> And remember, my beloved son, you were never out of my thoughts. Your loving father, Baron Pomercy. This is unbelievable. It must all be very distressing for you, Monsieur Marius. My father wrote letters to me throughout my life. Oh, yes. I'd received nothing. I only learned of his death yesterday. Oh, God. What's the matter, Monsieur Mabeuf? I fear I have done a terrible thing. Better the truth than falsehood. Better that. Well, if you're sure. Tell me more about his title, Baron Pomercy. It passes to you as his heir. Yes, but how did he come by it? For valour on the battlefield of Waterloo. If the local guide who advised Napoleon that morning had not been in the pay of the English, Colonel Pontmercy would have been warned that a few meters into the plateau before the hill of Mont Saint-Jean, there was a sunken lane. Halt! Come back! Come back! History is designed by the pride of men and realized on the accidents of fate. Sweet Jesus! No! And the tally of the French dead in that sunken land. No accurate count survives. Estimates vary. Some report a thousand men and horses, others three thousand. I cannot believe what you are telling me. Sadly, it is all true. My entire life is built on falsehood. And now Marius wakes, as though from a terrible slumber. This letter here requests that I find a man named Ternardier, believed now to be an innkeeper in Montfermeil. Every war produces its all-too-human ravens, feasting on the carrion of fallen heroes. Such a man is this Ternardier. My father asks that I thank him for saving his life. Uh, just one more... Much want to give me that, did you, soldier? <laughs> but after all, what good is gold to you now? For hours, Tanadi has passed amongst the dead, robbing what possessions he can find, until eventually he comes across the carnage in the sunken lane, and like a wasp above spilt syrup, he goes to work. Who's <laughs> there? Oh, God, I can uh, In my pocket, there's a watch. You know what? Take them. Too late. Donati has already filled them. Help me, please. Help me. Donati heaves at Pontmercy's arm and pulls him free of that dreadful mound of corpses. And like a bloody calf delivered from its mother's womb, the Baron is safe. Thank you. Thank you. What's your name? The name's Donati, sir. At his service. I solemnly swear, if it takes until the end of my days, I will find and reward this Tenardier. 
Would you like some wine, Monsieur Marius? <laughs> You're very pale. Thank you. No, I am in your debt, sir. I shall visit again. Day after day, Marius visits old Monsieur Mabeuf and the tomb of his father. Oh, father, father, please forgive me. And day after day, he learns a little more of his father's character. Underneath the bravery, Paul Mercy was a deep and tender-hearted man, without malice or spite, no matter the cruel vicissitudes of his life. He hardly eats or sleeps, and life with his grandfather is now unendurable. It's a wench. And no mistake, daughter, you mark my words. Not for nothing does the Gilles Normand blood run through his veins. <laughs> I remember my first kiss. Papa, please. Amongst the Gilles Normand's elderly society of friends, Mademoiselle Gilles Normand's patience with her father is legendary. Oh, the boldness of her bosom, even after 70 years. Getting back to Marius, Papa. In those days, an assignation really was an assignation. Marius. My stars, boy. You look terrible. I must speak urgently with you, sir. Of course. In private. Uh, off you go, daughter. Can't you see the boy wants my advice? I'll be just outside. Well, don't just stand there. <laughs> Who is she? Two weeks ago, I attended my late father's funeral. The swashbuckler, yes. What about him? I would prefer it if you refrained from describing him as such. Oh, would you? May an old man inquire as to why? At that funeral, I learned the truth about my father. The truth? I learned of the letters he sent and I never received. Of the cruel imposition you placed upon him regarding his access to me. Who has been filling your head with lies, Marius? The only lie that I am aware of is the lie you fed me day after day. The lie that up until two weeks ago I understood to be my life. Ah, your father was a brigand, Marius. A traitor. My father had the title of Baron bestowed upon him. By an uppity little Corsican corporal who should have been throttled at birth. The Emperor Napoleon was the greatest leader France has ever known. He was one of the rabble that betrayed their king. They massacred him and all his gentle kin. The king's was an age of decadence and it injustice. It was an age of gold. For the few. Well, look at how your heroes behaved at Waterloo. Fleeing like rats from the Prussians and the English. My father fled from no one. I never knew that. Traitor, I couldn't say. My father was a baron. A title I proudly adopt as my own. You will renounce that abominable title, or I will disinherit you. Is this how you spoke to my father, sir? Is this how you threatened him? Your father was a blackguard. Then I am a blackguard too. Come back here, sir! God. Whatever has happened, Father? Where's Marius going? You will be careful never to mention that name in my presence ever again. The boy's dead to me. Do you understand? Dead to me. Your lessons, Cosette. I wanted to see how Monsieur Fauchelevent is. He's resting. The sister sent me over with some broth. Well, that's very kind of them. Please thank them for us. Now, off you go. I'll see you at lunchtime. Ah, summer. Sweet summer. The convent garden shimmers in the morning light. May I see him, Father? He's sleeping. At least let me look into the hut. Please, Cosette. I don't want him disturbed. But in the heart of every flower... In the drone of every bee lies the steady beat of death, constant as the dazzling summer sunshine. Monsieur Fauchelevent's very sick, isn't he? Yes, he is. I overheard the sisters say he was dying. Is he dying, Father? I need to know. It is seven years since the gardener Fauchelevent gave refuge to Jean Valjean and his adopted daughter Cosette. Seven happy years since they dropped from the heavens into the garden of the Petit Picpus. Yes. Yes, he is. Will it be today? Look at me, Cosette. It may be. He needs to be very peaceful now. Do you understand? 
Yes, father. I think so. Come back at lunchtime. Very well, father. Seven years of tranquility, the like of which Jean Valjean has never known. <coughs> Was that Cosette I heard just now? She brought some broth. Oh, that's kind, that's kind. How are you feeling? Better, much better. That I would come to have a friend like you, Monsieur Madeleine, who'd have thought... Try and rest. You shouldn't call me that. I know, I know. But there's no one to hear us in my shed, is it? I like to call you by your proper name. <laughs> I don't think the Reverend Mother ever suspected that you weren't my brother. Did we sin in deceiving her? No, Brother Fauchelevent, no. <coughs> Everyone's been so kind. If you're up to it, Cosette will come in to see you at lunchtime. I remember Cosette the first day she came here. Skinny little thing she was, and now nearly sixteen. Fifteen. Fifteen, all grown up. Not quite. But what will become of you when I'm gone? Will you stay here? It will be all right, old friend. You'll see. Quite all right. You don't sound very sure. Eat. And over at the University of Paris, a gaunt young man stumbles in late for his first lecture of the day. We shall now resume our examination of the Halpin trials. Please open your books. I missed the register confirm. You have, Marius, eight. and our fanatical professor commented on the fact. For well over a year now, Marius has strenuously avoided all contact with his grandfather. By the way, you look terrible. When did you last eat? Ah, Monsieur Gilles Normand. Or is it, let me see, Baron Pontmercy. Good of you to join us. I apologize to you and the class for my lateness, sir. May one ask why? I had business to attend to. Business which clearly demands more of your time than your studies. Have you completed your assignment from last week? Oh, no, sir. Speak up. No, sir. Well... That is simply not good enough. You will report to me in my study at the end of this lecture. Yes, sir. And if there is not some very good reason for this wayward and uncharacteristic behaviour, we shall have to consider your future here at the Sorbonne very closely. Oh, Marius! What's the matter with him? He's passed out, sir. Stand back. Don't crowd him. <coughs> you should be resting. Look at the garden we made. Please, brother. Ah, that I might have been your brother in real life. You will always be my brother. Always. Now, tell me, Baron, when did you last eat? Tell me truly. I'm all right, confer. Come on. Well, well, where are we going? The Corinth. The what? It's a cafe off the Rue de la Chanvery. Oh, unfortunately, my current circumstances do not permit me to frequent such establishments. Oh, don't they? On your feet! Oh, oh merci! What? what are you doing? Come on. Are you cold? <laughs> to die in summer <laughs> in his beautiful garden. It was all I wish for. Just look at the peaches on that tree. Wonderful peaches. Wonderful. God bless you, old friend. And that dour-faced person sitting there is Enjolras. <laughs> You'll like him, Marius. He's almost as serious as you. Pay no attention to our class clown, Baron Pontmercy. Bricasset, a plate of your very best stew and a bottle of your finest wine with... Where's Grantaire? Coming. With four glasses. Where are you going, Baron? I apologise, Comfer. I shouldn't have come. I haven't the money for a meal. But I'm buying, Marius. Oh, out of the question. Think of it oh. as a loan, then. You can pay me back whenever. Let me give you an IOU. Oh, for God's sake, you haven't eaten in a week. Do you really want to pass out in front of the fanatic again? It isn't honourable to be in debt. Well, it isn't very honourable to die of starvation either. 
The offer stands. It's entirely up to you, Marius. On the understanding that it is a loan. Understood. Now, let's have some wine, for pity's sake. Are you all right, Cosette? I think so. How are you, father? He was the best friend I ever had. I shall miss him. So will I. Mercifully, it was very peaceful. Are you going to take Uncle Fauchelevent's place, Father? I haven't been asked. Would you like me to? You're happy here, aren't you? I'm safe here. Isn't that the same thing? I don't think so. Is something wrong, Cosette? I know I shouldn't think about it. Particularly at a time like this. Look at me, Cosette. Tell me. It's just... Well, on the weekends... And the holidays, the other girls go home to their parents. And the stories they come back with. What kind of stories? Stories about Paris. The shops, the palaces. These stories bother you? They don't bother me at all. But... But what? Monsieur Fauchelevent. Reverend Mother. Uh, would you excuse us, please, Cosette? Of course. I'll see you this evening. I'll see you after supper, Cosette. We'll speak then. What can I do for you, Reverend Mother? I wondered if we might have a little talk. Revolution and lasting economic change is the only way to ensure an equal place at the table for the common man. <laughs> My grandfather would have you horsewhipped if he heard you saying such a thing. For who knows how many hours now, Marius has been listening to the students' arguments and banter, Dazzled by their ability to be simultaneously witty, bawdy, and profound, he is also conscious of something new. What are you lot banging on about now? Grantaire, where have you been? <laughs> Getting drunk. <laughs> Who's this? The Baron Marius Pomercy, at your service. A feeling that only now, in this instant, surrounded by his fellow students, does he realise how keenly he has missed... I hope you haven't been offended listening to these half-baked revolutionaries, Baron. A feeling of kinship, of friendship. Well, I, I can only pity you. Politics is all hot air. One man's hot air battling with another man's hot air. And what is the outcome of this battle? More hot air. Bravo, Grantaire. More stupendous rubbish. You will notice, Marius, the size of Monsieur Enjolras behind. Well, I... Uh... This is as a direct consequence of the many hours he spends sitting on it. <laughs> oh, that the revolution could be realised on wine and conversation. Or that lasting happiness be discovered in apathy. But that is exactly where it is found. Easy arguments, Grantaire, all too easy. Let me tell you the story of poor old Baron Marius. His father was made a baron by Napoleon himself. Oh, well, poor old Marius has been chucked out on his ear without a penny by his grandfather, a roué of the old school. Very old. How old is he? Uh, he's 89. Uh, I wasn't thrown out. 89 in a roué. The dirty old man. Whatever you were, it doesn't matter. What matters is that not only has the baron not had any supper, he hasn't had any wine. Ah, no wine. Well, now, that really would be a tragedy for the underdog. Uh, I will not have you turn my theories into travesties, Grantaire. Are you sure you don't mean that the other way round? Let me at it. Oh, no! <laughs> when did you come to us, Monsieur Fauchelevent? Seven years ago, Reverend Mother. Cosette was how old? Eight. As you know, the sisters are all terribly pleased with her. And if God wills it, in time she may choose to join in our sisterhood. Cosette has said nothing to me. Are you not happy here? Very happy. And Cosette? You would have to ask her. Indeed. Would you consider accepting the post of head gardener? Of course. But I will have to speak to Cosette. What about? There is her future to consider, Reverend Mother. Ah, yes, her future. Of course. May I expect your answer by tomorrow morning? Marius? Oh, yes, confère. Oh, don't worry about my debt. I shall repay you directly. Oh, what are we to do with you, Baron? How's your English? Non-existent. German? Same. It's just that the bookseller I sometimes work for is looking for someone to translate articles from German and English into French. Now, the money's terrible, but it's something to live on, at least. 
Then I shall learn English and German. Ah! <laughs> Oi, keep your voices down. I'll speak to him tomorrow. Come on, Baron. Paris is ours. I don't understand what you're saying, Father. I'm saying that if you had a chance to see the grand shops and palaces of Paris, would you take it? I suppose so. Yes. And if you saw those things, would you be happy to return then to the Petit Picpus? The convents where we live, Father. I know that, Cosette, but I need to know if you if if you have ever considered joining the sisters here. Perhaps when I was a little girl. And now. Please answer me, Cosette. No, not at all. I have no calling. You're certain. Yes. Then that's that. Father. You should be back in your dormitory. It's late. We'll speak more tomorrow. What are you going to do? Tomorrow, Cosette. Good night, Father. Good night, Cosette. Come, Monsieur Fauchelevent. I have my answer, Reverend Mother. I don't believe it, Father. Paris. Seven years away makes no difference to the overpowering bustle of the metropolis. You don't regret us leaving, do you, Cosette? I don't think so, Father. But where are we going to go? Where indeed? All of Paris is ours, Cosette. All of Paris. Du sir, du sir, I can't find my uniform. What is it, sir? No longer protected by the safety of the convent walls. My National Guard uniform, it's missing. I don't think it went for a walk, sir. As far as I recall, it's airing in the garden. Jean Valjean has rented not one, but three houses in Paris, so that he may always be prepared for a hasty escape, should danger come prowling at his door. Cosette was helping me with the laundry. We've taken all the blankets out for an airing. Listen to them. <laughs> Such a Our little day. family and newly house. arrived here in the Rue Plumet. Had an idea to plant here, fate like will take a hand in all their lives. Here, love will come calling and will not be denied. Father, look! We have lots of space to plant flowers of our own. She's happy. She's changed. Changed? No, Cosette will never change. Perhaps not inside. But look, she's a woman now. And a beauty. Those who have ever loved will know that distance is as nothing to the yearning heart. If we could but fly out of Cosette's garden, above the busy marketplace, between the church steeples calling us to prayer, soon we will see below us a boy, an ordinary youth, made uncommon only by the love of a girl. Have you noticed that it is summer, Marius? For love can transform us, whether we believe in it or not. The sap has risen. All of Paris is in a state of excitement. The fields outside the city are full of the various offspring of obscure animals, bouncing around with the sheer joy of existence. Men lie awake at night thinking of women. Women sleep soundly in their beds, satisfied at having driven men mad with desire all day. And you... Walk around the town with your head down, looking at your feet like a bilious donkey. I'm surprised you know so much about bilious donkeys. I read. I'm informed. Look, I must leave you here. Leave me? But I was counting on your support for a trip to the theatre tonight. Enjolras told me that some beautiful women will be there, and I'm afraid. <laughs> I can't afford it. I'm going for a walk, and then I really must do some work. Well, whatever happens to me, then, is entirely your fault. Enjoy your play. Enjoy your walk in your boring old park. Every day, young Marius walks in the Luxembourg Gardens. The sun is out, and all the world is saying yes to life, from the tiniest insect 
to the most distant star, we are joined by an irresistible instinct to thrive. What do you think birds do at night, Father? They sleep, I expect, having finished reading the newspapers. <laughs> Look up. Each flying creature carries a fragment of the infinite in his claws. Look. Look, don't you see? And we are at once both incredibly small and universally great. We sense, for but a moment, that we are borne by the mysterious flow of invisible tides. It's strange how we never actually see the birds reading the newspaper. <laughs> the young man, Marius, catches sight of Cosette out of the corner of his eye. I would like to be a bird and sleep under the stars. Well, of course, there are disadvantages. All those worms to eat for your dinner. <laughs> and as Marius's eyes find Cosette's face, her profile, the sheen of her hair, her slender fingers resting on her father's arm, something happens. It is a small thing, and yet so much of what is profound in our lives unfolds in unmarked moments. He is as affected by her as if by a sudden storm, and she hasn't even given him a glance. Come, it's getting late. Let's go home. You're the best father in the world. Do you know that? And how many fathers have you compared me to in this universal survey? Comparisons are unnecessary. Not a very scientific approach. Women know things. We have our own science. Of that I have no doubt. Ah, oh, come fair. Ah, Father Marius. Thought you said you'd be at home tonight saying your prayers. I couldn't sleep. You? Missing your sleep. Uh, this must be serious. What do you know about women, Confer? Oh, Marius, my friend. Surely you haven't succumbed to an affair. No, of course not. Oh, well, I'm very sorry, I'm sure. I thought you might have taken a fancy to a human being. But, of course, in your case, it would have to be a saint. <laughs> How do you make women notice you? <laughs> or walk down the street with a banana in your ear. I'm serious, Confer. You can certainly work towards her falling passionately in love with your intellect, but I'd advise you to make a start with your coat. My coat? What's the matter with my coat? Nothing. If you want her to think that you work part-time in a knacker's yard. So love begins with a look, a sleepless night, and a coat. To sir? To sir? Coming, sir. Where's Cosette? It's time for our walk. In the garden, sir. Talking to the plants. <laughs> She gives them advice. I worry about that girl sometimes. I didn't know where she was. Where else would she be if not at home? Poor girl's always at home. I take her out, don't I? You are an elderly gentleman, sir. I don't understand you. A girl of that age is... curious. <laughs> I have a mind to put a stop to our walks in the Luxembourg Gardens. Why ever would you do that, sir? There's some imbecile boy who keeps following us around. The boy with the coat? She's mentioned him. I don't like it. Why should he take an interest in us? Any young man might take a fancy to Cosette. I won't have strangers bothering us. Our privacy is sacred. Our lives are not the business of anyone except ourselves. Yes, sir. Of course. But Marius cannot shake the image of the young girl from his thoughts. Days go by, and he crosses Paris as if in a stupor. Stomach empty, mind distracted... His body weakened to a feverish state by glorious, sleepless nights. Ah, oh, Marius, my friend! I can't stop, Confer. In a state of high excitement, he makes his way through the sweltering streets of Paris, checking his watch, hoping that she'll be there, his heart pounding in his chest. But she must be quite something, this girl! He arrives early, in spite of himself, and searches every seat, every face, every arrival for her. For her. What a lovely day. Cosette, too, is looking behind this seemingly calm exterior. Mm, what lovely flowers. Her eyes scan the gardens to the young man in the coat. His eyes search the gate, the bench, the water fountain, the rose garden. Shall we sit here for a change? Under this tree? Jean Valjean is a cat. <laughs> laying a trap for a young and inexperienced mouse. Marius sees them, and he follows them, 
slipping innocently into the snare, changing his usual place. Aren't we lucky to live near the gardens? She knows she is being watched, admired, yearned for. One garden seems pretty much like the rest to me. Poor Marius sits in his uncomfortable coat, trying to look out of the corner of his eye at the object of his desire, without being seen to be looking. It's too hot here. Let's sit in the shade. And off they go, a strange procession. Jean Valjean leading his daughter Cosette, and followed as night follows day by a young man in a new coat. And down they sit, a little further along the promenade, like three participants in some extraordinary dance. What's the matter, Father? I don't know. Perhaps I have indigestion. I feel out of sorts. Come here. Let me take your arm. Tonight I'll make you something lovely to eat, a special soup to make you well again. And from a distance, the young man watches. The book in his lap may lie open, but it goes unread. His head is full of Cosette. Tu sir, sais, what do I look like? <clears throat> I'm not sure. A kind of squirrel? Mm. No, that's not right. A rabbit, perhaps. Don't tease me, Tu sir. Sais. I'm being serious. You look very well, given that you can't keep your mind on anything for two minutes. Do you think anyone will ever love me? Your father loves you. I love you. But do you think a stranger could ever love me? I think there's no chance. No chance at all? No chance, because it's a certainty. <laughs> <laughs> I feel quite sure you'll be loved. Some things are written in the stars. Oh, what stars there are in the sky tonight, Confer. Stars? Are you sure? Oh, I don't like to look up. It gives me dizzy spells. Am I a very boring fellow, Confer? Would you like an honest answer? Of course. Then yes. I'm afraid you are crushingly, brain-numbingly boring. Quite frankly, I worry about you. You may be the first man in France to bore himself to death. Oh, love has made me a fool. Never, never say that. Love has made you a man. Just a man. Now, when some fellow tells you he can't eat his breakfast because he is heartbroken, will you laugh? No. You see, now you understand the secret that makes life worth living. Paris is sleeping. Mothers are lulling their babies with nighttime songs. Boats are slipping noiselessly down the gently lapping Seine. Policeman pours on street corners in the warm night to smell honeysuckle. And Marius is walking home under the selfsame stars that hang over Cosette's wild garden in the Rue Plumet. Cosette! Cosette, come in! It's late! Look at the moon. All the people it can see. All the people of Paris, of the world, going to bed and dreaming. The old people and the young, the babies. It shines on all of us, even the cattle in the fields. When the moon is out, a girl of your age should be in bed. Isn't life good, Toussaint? Don't you think we're so lucky to live in a world that has stars and galaxies and deep seas full of creatures that talk in secret languages? <laughs> Sometimes I think you talk in a secret language. God must be good to have made all this. But Jean Valjean is restless. He is haunted by the image of Inspector Javert and the threat of discovery. Every stranger who takes an interest in his family, even lovesick young men, only serve to make him start like a hunted animal, nervous, ready for flight. Stop looking at me like that, too, sir. I'm sure I don't know what you mean, sir. Cosette is no more than a girl. Not my place to question my master, I'm sure. God in heaven. If you're such a good servant, why do you make me so uncomfortable? Can't keep the girl wrapped in cotton wool all her life. That's all I mean to say. How dare you talk to me in that way about Cosette? I am her father, and I alone will decide what is best for her. Is that perfectly clear, Toussaint? Perfectly. 
There will be no more ridiculous lovesick wanderings in the park. Let that be an end to it. The very next day, Marius arrives at the Luxembourg Gardens to commence his ritual of waiting for Cosette. But she is nowhere to be found. Marius, my friend, you're crazy. Leave me alone, confess. Leave you? To go around the place like some demented dog and starve yourself to death? It's none of your business. <sighs> Marius, she's gone. The world is full of women. No, it isn't. It isn't. You do not understand. I cannot live without her. I cannot. Summer has turned to autumn, and now winter has come. A coldness has fallen upon Paris, and as surely into poor Marius's heart. <coughs> I'm not going away until you open this door. I may freeze to death, and it'll be all your fault. Your old friend found frozen solid on your doorstep, but don't worry about me. Oh. Look, Comfer, I'm really not in the mood. Exactly, neither am I. That's why I've come over to see you. I thought we could both be hopelessly depressed together. It's so much more fun. Now, have you got any wine? Let's see. Well, on the other side of the city, Cosette's sadness, although unspoken, is as a cloud engulfing the home of Jean Valjean. Do you say? You, sir? Yes, sir, I can hear you. There's no need to shout for me all the way to Bordeaux. What's the matter with Cosette? Is she ill? She isn't ill, sir. Then why does she no longer seem to enjoy herself? Oh. Perhaps it's a matter of the heart, sir. She's only a girl, Toussaint. I'll tell you what. I'll take her with me to church today. She's bound to enjoy that, sir. Exactly. A little air talking with the poor of the parish. The poor have always loved Cosette. Everyone loves Cosette, sir. Cosette! Cosette! Oh. You have to forget her, Marius. <coughs> You'll get boils. You'll suffer from insomnia. I already suffer from insomnia. Look, they tell me there are many very nice women in Paris. Perhaps a little investigation would be the purely scientific approach to merely ascertaining the availability of... A replacement! No, not exactly a replacement. I love her, Comfer. No one else will do. Mr. Marius? Mr. Marius? Uh, what is it? Come. Look down on Paris. What do we see? A sumptuous cake, my friends. On top... The creamy upper classes, decadent, sheltered. For them, life is fragrant, sweet. We live next door. Don't suppose you've ever noticed us, but I've noticed you. Then, down we go. Through those that work, but who can still live. They have their joys, their children safe, their plates full. My father sent me to talk to you, sir. I'll be in dead trouble if you don't let me. Please, it won't take long. And at the last tier... Hidden from the view of the delicate elite, the poorest of the poor, souls parched by a life of relentless struggle. And the most wounded of these are the children. And what do those children become? A young woman such as this. Hello? Oh, look, look, sir, you have lovely things. You have books. I can read. It wasn't always like this. She turns to face the good-looking young man, then quickly turns away. You've got nice soap, too. I love nice soap. Oh, it smells like a forest. And you've got a pen. Will I write my name? Oh. There. Done it. Wrote my name for you. Eponine, that's me. No, what do you want of me? Like I said, we've seen you often, we have, coming in from your studies. I live next door to you, sir. Mm. Me and my sister and my mum and dad. No, it's just straight off. She's not yet a woman, and yet more than a hag. Poverty has made of her a ghost. She has never known girlhood. Innocence was wrenched from her almost as soon as she could speak. But her poor heart is hungry, for it knows not what. Look, I have work to do. I don't I... like to ask you, sir. She can't look at him. But all she wants to do 
is to look and look and look at him. My dad says how I've got to ask. See, we ain't got no money for food. I only have a five franc piece. We can eat for three days with a five franc piece. Take it. Buy some food. Wish I could give you something back. If I can give you any comfort, well, I don't expect I can. Mm. But I'd give of myself for you, Mr. Marius. You're a kind man, ain't you? Nadine, get yourself in here, girl. That's my dad. Thanks for the cash. Um, don't forget me. What? Paris is a rabbit warren full of dark holes. A thin wall divides Marius's apartment from his neighbours, the Chandrettes, and about six feet up that thin wall is a hole in the plasterwork. Intrigued by the young girl from next door, Marius, slightly ashamed, climbs up onto a chair. Now let's see you in your nest, Monsieur Jondrette. And unobserved, he peers into the Jondrette's sorry room. Just as Eponine comes through the door, a five-franc piece in her hand. I've got five francs. Ah, good girl. Hey, I'll have that. And something a bit better and all. Better than five francs? Well, spit it out, girl. I got the rich bloke from the church to come and pay us a visit. What, the gent who gives alms? I'll give him your letter and he says he'll come over. Be here any minute. You have a me on, girl, because if you are... You best get ready. He's taking the carriage. Listen. Listen with Marius. Press your ear to the wall of these debased souls. Peep through the spy hole as they prepare to spring their trap. Mother, now break the chair. Break our chair, Father, our only chair? Break it and make no bones about it. Oh. Go and get in that bed. Uh, right, if we's going to be poor, let's really go for it. And you, rat, rat, get up on that bed and you smash that window. I'll smash the window, it's snowing outside. Good, we want you to see us perishing, don't we? Go on, Selma. break the window. He'll, what if he don't cough up? He'll cough up. We're going to be the poorest, most destitute blighters in the whole of Paris. Oh, now look what you've done. The child's only going to cut herself. And all the better. Bit of blood never did a sob story, no harm. Oh, right. Right. Help me then. Marius stands on his chair, peeping through his neighbour's wall as the drama unfolds. Right, you brat. Start crying now. I want to know why not if you... Happily. Huddle in that corner where the snow's coming in. <laughs> I'm just coming. Just coming. Now you remember, you lot. You leave the talking to me. Monsieur Jondrette, the father of the house, makes his way through the dank room to open the door. Monsieur Jondrette? Oh. oh, so you're too kind to stay in a... And the poor soul, like me, the title of monsieur. And this must be your wife. Oh, well, she'd rise from her bed, so oh. she's, uh, she's struck down with a terrible fever. Oh, bless you, sir. And your lovely girl. Close the door, my dear. You mustn't allow the winter any further into this poor man's room. Oh, dear God. Oh, dear God, it's her. She who once walked beneath the bright summer sun of the Luxembourg Gardens. She who had made a boy buy a new coat. She who had disappeared six months before into the Paris air. Oh, so the shame that you should find us in these reduced circumstances. My poor wife laid upon what we fear might be her deathbed, sir. And my younger daughter's injured. And... Oh, you poor thing. Here, look what we've brought you. Some nice warm blankets. Blankets, you say? Oh, it's very, very kind. Oh, how very kind. And some warm clothes to keep out the cold. Oh, how can we ever thank you, sir? Your children, children, come here. How can we thank our benefactor? Shh, there, 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 there. If only it wasn't too late. Too late? Well, there, there. Tonight, sir, we're to be put out on the street. But it's snowing hard. Surely they can't do that. Oh, they can do what they like. How much do you owe? Sixty francs. Fortune. Oh, God help me. My children are going to die in a gutter tonight. Oh. Their life's frozen out of their pitiful lungs. You'll have your sixty francs. I'll return with it at five o'clock. Oh, thank God. Oh, thank oh, God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Marius watches as the pitiful family fall to their knees before Jean Valjean and his daughter Cosette. Please. 
<laughs> till five o'clock. Oh, thank you. Thank you, my saviour. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Fate is our friend and no mistake, Monsieur Jondrette. Yeah. Ah. That face of his. I can't help but feel as I've seen it someplace before. <laughs> Marius arrives outside in the street just in time to see the coach carry his beloved cassette away. You! Cab! Follow that carriage, will you? You got your money, son. Oh, um, I I'll pay you after. I'll learn me lesson with students. After can mean next week. They're getting away, damn you! No need to use language. Get up, Eugene! It's home time! No, listen to me! No, no wait! That's a long face, if ever I saw one. Don't be sad, Mr Marius. I don't like to see you sad. You can do nothing to help me. You sure about that? Maybe I can do the most important thing in the world. What might that be? Get the address of that young lady you just went chasing after like a dog after a rabbit. C can you really get it for me? What will you give me if I do? Oh, whatever you want. Well, in that case, consider it got. Benine! Get in here, girl! I better go. Uh, Benine... Let this be our secret, all right? If you like. I love secrets. Hope, however fragile, is life itself to the ailing heart. Marius hovers at the top of the stairs like a startled fawn, ears pricked, listening. We've got him now. <laughs> this bloke is our meal ticket out of here, I tell you. Sixty francs is a lot of money. Sixty, sixty francs? This is just the start. He's loaded. We've landed on our feet, girl, eh? No mistake. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, there's not much time. He'll be back at six. I need to get word to the boys, right? When my charitable friend comes back, we've got to be ready for him, eh? Our future depends on it. <laughs> <laughs> The inspector of police, is he here? I am standing in for the inspector of police. I must speak with you, it's urgent. The world turns its face from the darkness of night to the new day, and once more into darkness. And so it is with our souls. At each moment we are given a sacred privilege of choice. Will we act or do nothing? How many men are planning this ambush? Only one. His name's Jondrette. But he's gone to get help, and he's going to rob the old gentleman and his daughter when they come back at six o'clock. We cannot act too soon. We need evidence. I tell you, these two innocent, good, kind-hearted people are in danger. I am aware of that, young man. Are you afraid? I will offer my services to you in any way I can. Good. Return to your peephole in the wall. Go quietly into the house. They must not suspect that you're there. Take this pistol. Oh, I've never used a gun. Take it. I'm not expecting you to shoot anyone with it. You must watch them at their work until you can act as a witness to their intention to do the gentleman harm. You must not act too soon. When the situation is dangerous, fire the gun into the ceiling. That will pull them up short and bring me and my men running. We'll be right outside the building... Do you think you can manage that? I'll do my best. Six o'clock, then. Six o'clock. Remember a guard in the galleys, a policeman in the little town of Montreux-sur-Mer. Remember a small-time official humiliated when one Monsieur Madeleine rescued a poor woman called Fontaine. Uh, Inspector, I don't know your name. My name is Inspector Javert. Where to, mister? The Gorbeau Tournament. On a filthy night like this? You must be joking. Place in the safe. I'll pay double. Come on, then. Tonight, Paris is fogbound, wrapped in a freezing half-light which transforms the otherwise majestic city into a dismal netherworld populated by a thousand skulking phantoms scurrying out of the light. I don't see what you want to go to the Gorbeau for. You won't find nothing there but iniquity, mate. Filth and iniquity. Where are the girls? 
as Zelma's watching at the corner and Eponine's round the side. After tonight, my dove, we'll be living better than princes. Oi, eventually. Is that you, Papa? Who else would it bloody be? Well, stand in that corner and stay out of sight. You bring the irons. Here, right here. You said he'd be here at six. Well, it's not six yet, is it? Let's have a look at what you've got here. This goes wrong, man. Ah, look. As long as you let me do the talking, Babe, and act only on my signal, we'll be laughing it up by nine. Only I don't want no improvisation. Know what I mean? Yeah, Babe, no improvisation. Hello, somebody... And from the hole in the wall next door, a horrified Marius peers into the squalid darkness of the Gorbo tenement. A darkness challenged only by the ominous glow of a burning brazier. You sure this place is secure? Are oh, you stupid? This is the gold boat. Squeal on us here. Poor, uncertain Marius, convinced that he will be discovered at any second, grips the pistol given to him by Inspector Javert as a baby would hang upon its mother's finger. What about that poncy looking bloke next door? He's out for the night. Eponine saw him leaving. Where did you get these tools? I, I nicked them from a blacksmith this afternoon. Make yourself useful, Bubba. Hey? Fix up that rope ladder from the window. All right, all right. As if in trance, Do it quietly as well. he watches Shh. and prepare what he can only there. guess to be an earthly premonition there. of damnation. When the time comes, I must fire the pistol. The pistol shot is Javert's signal. The pistol shot is the signal. What's that? Huh? Oh, six o'clock. No, I thought I heard something. Whispering. He's coming. All right, okay, remember you meetings. Leave the talking to me. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Who is it? Are there men in place? They are Inspector Javert. It's hard to keep an eye on them in the fog. Remember, we do nothing until we hear the signal. Are you sure this young man is up to the job, sir? It doesn't matter if he isn't. We have them surrounded. Can I first say, sir, <coughs> on behalf of all my family, that we're all of us, all of us, we're completely and utterly overwhelmed yeah. by the generosity and the kindness that you are showing us, monsieur. Yeah. I have the 60 francs here. Oh. Oh. There's not enough angels in heaven to honour your <laughs> deeds, so you, every breath you take is a testament to your sanctity, etc., etc. There's really no need. Uh, is monsieur perhaps uh, interested in Art? Art. Monsieur jean uh, Art, sir. Art. Ah, <laughs> oh, Raphael, Michelangelo, the great da Vinci. Oh. <laughs> what becomes of their work which lasts forever, etc., etc. I don't understand. Why, even here, monsieur, under this humble sack in... Behold! <laughs> <laughs> ah, a picture worthy of the great da Vinci himself. It looks like an old inn sign to me, worth about three francs. An old inn sign. <laughs> <laughs> An inside, yeah, as indeed it is. <laughs> Shall we say a thousand crowns? And now Valjean notices three figures slip into the room and take their places in the shadows. Who are those men? What men? Three men just came in. I pay no attention to them, monsieur. They're just, uh, neighbours. I see. Well, Jondrette, if there's nothing else, I have uh, the uh, 60 francs you asked for. A moment more of your time, monsieur. <laughs> Why don't you warm yourself at our uh, brazier? Get on with it, Fabantou. Fabantou? <laughs> I trust you will forgive my ill-educated friend. He doesn't know when to speak and when to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> I thought you said your name was Jondrette. Oh, what's in a name, as my dear old mother used to say. Which is it, Jondrette or Fabantou? It's both and neither. <laughs> Stage names, if you like, etc., etc. <laughs> Don't you recognize me? We two have met before. I don't think so. Come closer. It's hard to see in this poor light. Do you not, my friend? Do you not? Of course, it uh, was in much happier circumstances. You see, you paid a visit to my inn once, in Montfermeil. The very inn which that sign once adorned. I've visited many inns. <laughs> it was one Christmas. It must be, what, eight year ago now? You took away a little lark I had singing there. You have confused me with someone else. Oh, no, Mr. Whatever your name is. I am not mistaken. When you came here today all full of yourself and your money, I thought I recognised you then, and all afternoon I have pondered and pondered upon it until by Jupiter! Ha, 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 ha! 
I finally realised. You are the very man who claimed to be Cassette's father. It was you that robbed me of that slut Fontaine's child, the little girl known as the Lark. She, who wished to have kept us, as once we kept her, eh? Yeah. And who was, if I'm not mistaken, the same young lady who accompanied you here this morning. I think it's time I left. Get him! In a second, the shadows spring to life. And now, fire faced black and ruffians surround Valjean. Tie his arms and legs to the bed! Go. Come on! Now, bring that candle! Now, yeah, let's take a look and see who this is. Huh? Huh? Who are you? Don't make it harder on yourself. My name is Urban Fabre. Who can truly keep their heads in time of panic? Work! Why won't you work? Desperately now, Marius struggles to release the pistol safety catch. But terror has turned his fingers to butter. God, God, why won't you work? And your address? Now, come on, Monsieur Fabre. It'll be better for you if you tell us. You tell us. I'll rip your heart out and feed it to the pigeons. <laughs> no, 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 gentlemen, gentlemen. Please. <laughs> Please excuse these ruffians, Monsieur Fabre. They've got no breeding. Now, uh, <laughs> if you will permit, my good lady wife has a cab waiting outside, don't you, my dear? I do, husband. And the reason she has a cab is that she's going to fetch back the lark from her nest in exchange for... Uh, <laughs> well, let's not be greedy. Let's just have enough to wet my beak. Uh, 200,000 francs from you. That should be suitable compensation. Now, Monsieur Fabre, if you don't want yourself or indeed the young lady to suffer any uh, ill treatment at the hands of these gentlemen, <laughs> the address, if you please. 17 Rue Saint-Dominique. Oh. <laughs> a most wise decision, if I may say so. <laughs> Urban, <laughs> a most wise decision. May I be permitted to know your real name? Don't tell him. Oh, I don't see why the worthy gentleman shouldn't know my name. After all, we're all friends here, aren't we? <laughs> the name is Tenardier. Tenardier? Oh, God. Oh, what's that? Must have been a rat. All right, you best get going, my turtle dove. All right. Madame Thénardier scuttles onto the fog-bound street and whistles. And a rickety cab emerges out of the shadows. Rue Saint-Dominique! Behind the trees, Javert considers the situation. What should we do, sir? Two trail the cab, two arrest those girls that are loitering near the house. The rest of you wait with me. As soon as she's back, we go in. There's only one girl there now, Zelma. Eponine's gone. Then arrest us, Elma. But what causes Marius to fall from his chair? Simple. It is the name... Thenardier. How, he wonders, can this sneering, murderous monster be the same noble Thenardier who saved his father's life? The thought is all but impossible to bear. A single shot. All it takes is a single shot, and Inspector Javert will come running. But how can I betray the man who saved my father's life? After a crime like this, he'd surely hang. And then, and then I would have Thenardier's blood on my hands. Oh, what am I to do? Oh, father, father, what am I to do? Betray you or risk the life of the one I love? Oh, father, father. Thenardier! My dove? There is no Mamselle Farber at 17 Rue Saint-Dominique. Uh, Nobody's ever heard of her. That is bad news for you, monsieur. <sighs> I can't imagine what you thought you were going to achieve by that. Time. <laughs> and now the villains pull back in shock as Valjean, his hands free, reaches down and pulls the red-hot branding iron from the brazier. What are you planning to do with that, monsieur? You're a sorry bunch, aren't you? Did you really think that you could make me say or do anything against my will? Did you really think that? And now to the consternation of all present, Jean Valjean thrusts the iron into his own left arm. With all his heart, Marius wishes that he could force himself to look away from the vicious scene before him. But alas, as you can see, I no more fear you than you do me, Thenardier. And with that, Valjean flings the iron out into the night. Grab him! I tie his legs myself. He won't be getting out of them in a hurry. What are we to do with him? Slit his throat and then dump his body in the Seine. Come on! And now Marius must act. But what to do? What to 
do. But this one sharpened the day. Let's get on with it, Bobby. <laughs> Maria spies the paper in which Eponine had written her name when she had visited his room the day before. Now, I don't want too much mess, neither, Bobby. Yeah. A nice clean cut. Oh, hey. Quickly, he wraps it round some plaster. You are a very stupid man, Monsieur Fibro, wherever you are. And he hurls it into the room. Ow! What, what was that? Came out the window, I think. Where's it? There it is. Wait. It's got writing. It says Eponine. <gasps> Bloody hell, this is a warning. Oh. The cops are here. What? Everybody out! Oh. 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 Come on, use the oh. road, ladder, for God's sake! Yeah. One at a time! One at a time! Oh, yes. So far, so oh. friend. Oh. It's always a pleasure to see you in your natural habitat. Marius all but faints in relief at the grey, unforgiving features of... Inspector Javert! Well, who do we have here? Good to see you again, Babé. And thank you for delivering some of your friends to me. I am indebted to you. Officers! Round these villains' eyes! Just get Who's your... tied to this bed here? <laughs> tied to the bed, Inspector? Oh, looks as if he got out of this window here! Where's Toussaint? You're hurt. What's the matter with your arm? In the investigation that followed Javert's raid on the Gobo, a small coin is discovered. What have they done to you? A small coin, which on closer examination flips open to reveal a tiny mechanism which conceals a blade. Roll up your shirt sleeve. Please, Cassette. I'm all right. A blade sharp enough to slice straight through the strongest rope. Roll it up. This delicate mechanism baffles all but one of the policemen on the case. Did John Drake do this to you? How did this happen? For Inspector Javert recognizes the curious mechanism as one fashioned by only a handful of prisoners in the galleys. One such is Jean Valjean, prisoner 24601. By all that's merciful, what have those animals done to you, Father? Lock the doors, Cosette. Tell Toussaint, don't open the doors to anybody. Sell one some tea. What do you want to go giving your money to a villain like him for? Just be sure that he gets it. I'll get it. I can't honestly see what an upright gentleman such as yourself wants with a license. Naturally, the jailer is curious. Each week for the past two months, this mysterious young man turns up at the gates delivering money for prisoner 45368. But why? Could he be in the pay of Tenardier? But this young man could not look less like a criminal. Witness his handsome, honest face, his soft-skinned hands. Who shall I say delivered it? Say the money is from an anonymous donor. As Monsieur wants. And as the jailer takes his leave of Marius and re-enters the prison's ghastly portals, he reasons that some men are born beneath a lucky star and that the villain Thénardier definitely ranks among their number. Well, let me sit down a moment, Cosette. We really ought to be getting home. You're still not completely better, Father. No, don't worry so. Well, just for a moment. <sighs> Luxembourg Gardens are beautiful, aren't they? I didn't think you liked it here. Why do you say that? Because we used to come here every afternoon, and then... And then one day we stopped. A long time ago. Not so long. Ah, beautiful spring. The doors of the house of the world are flung open once more. The carpets are beaten, the shutters fixed back, and air and light illuminate the long darkened rooms. May I say, and I'd like to say how very grateful I am to you, Cosette. For what, Father? for taking such good care of me these last months. When I think of what that 
terrible man might have done to you. All the same, I'm worried it may have been too much for you, the burden of it. Taking care of you is not a burden, Father. If I had only listened to you that night, I might have spared you this. You're alive and well, Father. Nothing else matters. <laughs> Look at the children playing. Seems like only yesterday that you were their age. The only thing I worry about is that you might put yourself in danger again. Please promise me that was the last time. Are you listening to me, Father? The children are so very happy, aren't they? I need you to promise me that you won't put yourself in danger again. I'm sorry, but I can't make that promise. Why not? Because I have a solemn duty, and I cannot. I don't understand, Father. A solemn duty to who, Father? To God, Cosette. It's hard to believe I was ever that age. Not for me. You used to pretend to be a mouse. Remember? A mouse? I miss those days when we lived with old Fauchelevoy in the convent. We were safe there, Cosette, happy. Aren't we happy now? What was my mother like, father? If your mother could see you now, she would be so very proud of you, Cosette. I think of her often. Try to imagine what she was like. Your mother loved you very much, Cosette. Always remember that. Then why did she abandon me? Cosette, she never meant to. If there was anything she could have done to save you from the Tenardiers, then she would have done it. You must believe me. I do believe you, Father. And sometimes it's very difficult. I know. I know. Look, Father, where are they taking those convicts? To the Madelinette. And then, the galleys. And as the convicts' wretched faces stare through the jagged slats of the cart, their hopelessness, compounded by the brilliance of the sun, their misery, mocked by the children's innocent laughter, and their desperate fate sealed with every crack of the cartman's whip. Jean Valjean remembers his terrible years on the galleys. The inhuman misery and cruelty. What are you looking at you for, 601? Men reduced to nothing but a number. Are you all right, Father? Are you all right, Father? You look faint. Uh, it's nothing, Cosette. Well, all I can say is I hope that evil gang who hurt you are among them. No, Cosette, never wish that. Believe me, never wish the anguish of the galleys on anyone. Who are you looking at? That young man over there. Where? Jean Valjean does not wish to remember the gaunt young man who used to sit each day on the bench opposite theirs. What about him? I thought you looked familiar. From when? It doesn't matter. Let's get you home. Do some will worry if we stay out too late. Letting you out today, are they, Babe? You said you had some information for me, Jada. For a price, Babe. For a price. And I know for sure you've got plenty of money stashed away. Tell us the information and we'll see. Twenty francs or nothing. Yeah. Hmm, very nice. There are two women living on the Rue Plume. Ivy wall, set back from the road. You could pass it and you'd never know. Well, these two women live there alone, don't they? Seen this old geezer come and go, but most of the time it's just the women. You sure about this? Only last time I got a tip-off, I was this close to ending up in solitary like that goon Tenardier. I'm telling you, it's safe. Sweet as a nut. You seen, uh... You seen that Benin lately? Comes by to see your old man nearly every day. Well, when you see her, you send it to me, right? Certainly, Babby. What's it worth? Oh. Monsieur Marius! Monsieur Marius! And who's that? It's me! Surely you ain't forgotten. Eponine. 
Didn't expect to see a gentleman such as yourself in a place like this. How have you been keeping, Eponine? Well, well, as can be expected under the circumstances. The circumstances? Well, they're all in here, ain't they? Mum, Dad, everyone. Oh. Still think about you, though. I've been looking for you, too. I'm flattered, I'm sure. Isn't often Eponine gets treated like a lady, if you know what I mean. I think so. Don't suppose you ever think of me. Well, I... Can't... That girl! The one you've been searching for. The old gentleman's daughter. The one who came to the tenement that night. Seems like I might have found her. Found her? Time freezes. Paris skips a heartbeat. Are you sure? Could she, this street urchin, this child of the Thenardiers, could she have found her? The Lark? You all right, sir? You look fit to faint. Oh, quite all right, thank you. Please continue, Eponine. You ain't pleased to see me, are you? Of course I am. I've got the address. Far side of town it is. It's a quiet district. Will you take me there? Just follow me. Promise me, Eponine. Promise you won't tell your father about this address. What would I want to tell that old bugger for? And no one else either. It'll be our secret. Promise me. Monsieur knows I would promise him anything. You'd better walk behind me when we go. Wouldn't be right for a gentleman such as yourself to be seen in the company of a woman such as me. But before Eponine goes, this mixture of innocence and worldliness, this strange creature of the streets looks Mario straight in the eye. Monsieur hasn't forgotten what he promised me, has he? Of course. Oh, well, I only have a five franc piece. I'm not after your money. Well, what then? Doesn't matter. Just come on, let's go. Eponine is as swift as a breeze through the Paris streets, constantly checking that Marius is within sight. Until, after an hour or so of walking, she stops before a high ivy-clad wall set back from the busy street. Is this the place? It is. Rue Plumet. How can I ever thank you? Be seeing you, Monsieur Marius. Oh, Eponine, wait! But Eponine is gone. Dissolved like a mirage into the ever-shifting fabric of the city. But now, Marius inspects the wall. He runs his delicate fingers against the ivy and wonders at its age. Eventually, under an unruly thicket of tall, unshapely weeds, he discovers a locked iron door, and under a thick wedge of ivy, a rusted iron grill through which he peers into the empty, unruly garden within. Three days. It's important, Cosette. And we're to stay here alone until your return? That is all I ask. What do you think to, sir? If sir feels he must go, then he must go. But three days, why? Don't you trust me, Cosette? I thought I did. If it weren't necessary, if it weren't absolutely necessary, I wouldn't leave. Toussaint will be here with you all the time, won't you, Toussaint? Of course I will, sir. The time will fly by, Miss Cosette. You won't even notice your father's been away. Isn't that right, sir? Three days. No more. Just be careful, father. Always, Cosette. Where are you going, anyway? It's a secret. All over Paris, there's nothing but talk of revolution, and here's you dancing about like a giddy schoolgirl. I thought you'd be pleased to see me happy. I am, of course, but... And now I understand. Who's the lucky girl? I'll see you later, Comfort. Don't get too drunk. Marius? Unbelievable. I'm off to bed. Good night, Miss Cosette. Toussaint. What is it, my dear? Am I... Are you what? Am I... Well, pretty. Why, heavens, yes, Miss Cosette. You're the prettiest girl in Paris. I know that's not true. Is that what's wrong with you? Oh, you've been dreamy ever since you came back from the Luxembourg. I know I'm being silly. Good night, Tucson. Don't forget to blow all the candles out. I won't. What's that? Who's there? Wild and overgrown, the garden shimmers in the soft spring moonlight. If there's someone there, show yourself. All day, the intense young man, who used to sit across from her in the Luxembourg Gardens, has crowded her thoughts. I'm not afraid of you. 
So why are you hiding from me? The beauty of his eyes, so laden with sorrow and joy. The tenderness of his soft, sweet mouth. Be warned, there's a savage dog inside. But what's this she sees under the old iron grill? Letters. They're from him. In the months that I have not seen you, in the spaces between one stolen glance and another, in the might of my love for you, eternity resides. Oh, my love. My love. Over here. <gasps> Will you let me into the garden? I don't know who you are. One who loves you. Stand away from the gate. There. Oh, please, don't be afraid. I mean you no harm. I'll leave if you want me to. I'll leave and you will never see me again, if that is what you wish. You? If you only knew how desperately I've searched for you. How did you come to... I'm here. It's all that matters. I can hardly believe my eyes. Should I leave? Have you thought of me at all? No, no to the first question. And all the time to the last. Will we be seen? This garden is so overgrown. What is your name? Marius. Marius. And yours? My name... My name is Cosette. Tusa, what time is it? About five minutes later than the last time you asked me. Your father's been in bed for half an hour. I'm ready for retiring myself, as you should be. It's such a warm night. Stifling. Fragrant. Oppressive. Wonderful. There are times, Cosette, when I wonder if you're living in the same world as the rest of us, my girl. I think I'll take one last walk in the garden before I go in. Off with you, then. If what you want is to be bitten to death by midges and have earwigs dropping off bushes down your back. <laughs> Summer is at its height in the city. No one sleeps. Marius? Marius, are you there? I'm here. It is the calm before the storm. Paris is like a loaded gun. You've got your head in a bramble bush. I'm hiding. You're an idiot standing there pretending to be a trap. Oh, thank you very much. Stealing into my garden every night. I've torn a hole in my trousers. I bet Romeo never tore his trousers. I bet Romeo never got chased by mad dogs up the Rue Plume in a heat wave. And had to climb through a rusty old gate and get scratched half to death in the process. He takes her hand oh. and presses it to his cheek. For a moment, under the great moon, they are as one. One mind, one heart, one soul. You, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it, sir? <sighs> I don't know. I, I can't sleep in this weather. Oh. The city is full of cholera, sir. And young men looking for a fight. It never stops, does it? This madness. Why can we not agree to live quietly and do each other no harm? No one would ever know we were here, hidden behind the trees like this. I wish we could stay here forever. I don't know if I'd want to live in a flower bed for the rest of my life. No, not even if it meant we could be together. Call me old-fashioned, but I think we should consider a house. <sighs> oh, one day we'll have a house, a small With house. With a garden. And we'll tell our children when we were young. One summer. We met every night in secret. Under the trees of the Rue Plume. And came to love each other. Sure this is a place. Remember a villain, a landlord, a father with no love for his children, a husband with no care for his wife. I tell you, it is. He is back on the streets, no longer in jail. He rises up amongst us yet again like a layer of fat on a pan of soup. Keep the noise down. If you don't want us rumbled, etc., etc. The city is on the verge of rebellion. Sure, ain't got a dog. The revolution of 1830 has never been fully completed. It lies before every young man like a half-eaten meal. Last time we'd done over a gaff with a dog, nearly had me leg off. Uh, it's two women on their own. 
The girl and some old battleaxe who keeps house. What about the old bloke? He goes away. Any hours we could handle him. I've got my crowbar. Evening, father. Whoa! You're give me a heart attack. What's you doing hiding in them bushes? Eponine. I've got thorns in my backside now. What brings you here then, Dad? None of your business, if you ask me. Oh, but I do ask you. I'm naturally having a daughter who spends her time sitting in bushes in the middle of the night. If you must know, we got some uh, business here. I'd forget it if I were you. I don't let her talk to you like that, boss. I haven't got thorns in me bum. It's good pickings in that house. Only a couple of old people and a girl standing between us and them. I told you I won't let you in. Yeah, I should give her a good smack, of boss. He may be my father by name, but he's never been a father to me by nature. So you can forget the loyalty and respect Bit for a start. Hey, mate, I'm in agony here. You shut up about your backside. Well, I was only saying. Look, get out of my way, Eponine. Or I'm telling you, <laughs> you'll be sorry. Never! I'm poor, you know. I have no money, no inheritance, nothing at all from my father except my name. I don't care. We don't have money either. My father gives everything away. Well, it is possible to live on very little, but I would like to give you more. You have already given me everything. <sighs> oh, I've had enough of this. Take one more step and I'll yell me lungs out. And I've got a good pair of lungs for yelling. You'll have every copper in Paris on your back in two minutes. I'll be able to sit down for a week. What has got into you, Eponine? If you don't get out of our way, I'll beat you senseless. Go on, then. Won't be the first time. I mean it, Dad. Let this one go. There's plenty more houses in Paris to rob tonight. You can't let yourself be beaten by a woman, boss. You get that with a crowbar. No, 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 no. Forget it, forget it. This one's like a dog of a bone once she's made her mind up. Like father, like daughter. I told you we shouldn't go out tonight. First there was those sparrows fighting on the wall. That's bad luck, that is. Then I stubbed my toe when I left the house. Now I've got thorns in my backside. Those were bad omens, if you ask me. The one house! We're just trying to help. Look, forget it, forget it! We'll come back. We don't have to do them tonight. We'll come back when she's not here. <laughs> and home through the sizzling streets of Paris, the defeated robbers trudge. Turned back by a girl, in the service of one who will never know her deep devotion. Fresh oh, I tell you, Marius, you can't find a decent tomato in the whole of Paris. Look, Comfair, I haven't time. Potatoes, perhaps. A leek, certainly, if one has the time to invest in the search. But a basic, decent-looking tomato? Never. And ask me why, Marius. Do I have to? All right, why? Because of the death of General Lamarck. The city has gone mad. The schoolrooms are empty, the students are restless, the National Guard is wide-eyed and irritable. Very interesting, but if you've finished, I have more important things on my mind. I see. Now, let me think. What could be more important than food and revolution? Ah, could it possibly be love? I'm sorry, Comfer. I, I know you think this is all very funny. I would never laugh at matters of the heart. Change is in the air, Marius. Even if love also resides in its celestial heights, it's undeniable. Read all about it, of General Lamont. Even the tiniest pebble can create a ripple in the most mighty of seas. The death of a single general is as a clarion call, summoning Paris to rise. But just now, only a few streets away from where the good confer searches for tomatoes, Jean Valjean is seated on the shady side of the slopes of the Champ de Mars, when suddenly a voice like a cheese grater breaks the silence. They say it's a killer, know what I mean? It's like we're all being fried alive in some big old pan. Jean Valjean had met this girl when she was just a child many years ago now, in the public house of Thénardier, but neither remembers the face of the other. You live down Rue Plumet, don't you, sir? Seeing you there many's the time. You and that old woman and your girl. A cold tremor passes over Valjean. He has been observed, taken note of, perhaps even spied upon. Things ain't right in the city just now, you know what I mean? I'll clear out if I had the chance. Ever thought about moving? I would if I was you, sir, with your family. If I was you, I'd clear right out. She wanders off along the street, her bones sticking from the thin shoulders of her dress like the bones of a swan, an undernourished swan who, like all swans, 
has the capacity to love forever as a pair. She has tried to help Marius by protecting his beloved. So though she is poor, it is not a poverty of the soul from which young Eponine suffers. Excuse me, sir. Any chance I could tell you a song? Remember a baby crying alone in a darkened room? A good selection of songs I have. Love songs, revolution songs, history songs. Got some comedy songs soon. Do you mind? I'm trying to buy tomatoes here. Children, like flowers, can grow even in the harshest of conditions. Suit yourself, boss. Down he ambles, little Gavroche. Through the humid Parisian night, past the crumbling old wall of Monsieur Mabeuf's old garden. Anyone home? Hello? Up over the wall he goes in search of food. <clears throat> Who's there? Frightened the life out of me. I'm very sorry, but this is my garden. Poor Monsieur Mabeuf, with his books and his empty larder, and his old friend Baron Pontmercy no longer alive to comfort him. I dropped in for a bit of dinner, if you must know. I'm afraid we have no food left. I'm old, so I don't eat much. You ain't got nothing at all? Not even no crusty bit of old bread? I'm afraid not. Better have a bit of mine, then. Got half a baguette off the old woman who looks like a giraffe down the bakery. Oh, I know the one you mean. Long neck, big ears. Go on, then. Get stuck in. Oh, that's very kind. Just a corner, perhaps. Thank you. Mm. Mm. How come you're educated, but you ain't got no food? Well, um, unfortunately, the one does not always guarantee the other. When we're young, it's very difficult to tell the difference between what is important and what is necessary. Let me tell you something I know. Bread is necessary. Oh, you're wise, I can see that. And the rebellion. We need that too. Oh, I'm not so sure. Insurrection always seems to leave things pretty much the way they were in the first place. Give or take a century or two. Remember a baby crying in a dark room. Never loved, never comforted, never nourished. But the way I see it, you've got to decide what you think and do something. A strong position, I grant you. When I'm dead, I want him to say, remember Gav Rush? He never sat on his bum. <laughs> Admirable. I wish you good luck. I better go. Goodbye. Take care, my child. The city is full tonight full of stars and whistling homeless boys, full of young women who love hopelessly and young men tasting desire for the very first time, full of yearning and hunger and hope. Marius! Marius! What is it? We're leaving! But fate is not predestined. Oh, my friends... We have the ability to change everything about ourselves, if only we knew. And with changed self comes changed life. Father says we have to go away. Why in God's name? He says there's going to be trouble in Paris. He says we have to go. Perhaps to England. But, but England is so far away. When will you go? I can't bear it. When will you come back? He didn't say. Well, you, you can't go. You can't. Don't you understand? We have to stay together. But I have to be with my father. Perhaps you could follow us. I have no money. I'm poor, Cosette. It takes money to go abroad. Oh, I love you too much to go away and leave you. I wouldn't want to go. I wouldn't want to live. No, don't say that. I'll think of something. Listen to me. We love each other. Nothing can ever come between us. Do you believe me? Oh, children... The stars are listening, the angels are smiling, for they love to hear truth spoken. Yes, I believe you. I won't come tomorrow. Why not? You must come. Trust me. I have something I need to do. The day after tomorrow at nine o'clock, I'll be here, and I promise you our problems will be over. Look, I'll put my address here for you, where the ivy's thick. 16 Rue de la Verrerie. Don't go. And trust me. God means us to be together. That's why he's given us our love. I'll be back the day after tomorrow. Say you'll wait for me. I'll wait.
Grandfather. It's me, Marius. Marius? Marius? No, no, don't tell me. No, I'll get it in a minute. You know very well, sir, who I am. Oh, ma'am, take care. Take care. This is your boy come home. And fold him in your arms. Kiss him. We do not have our children very long. So, what do you want of me? Sir, I don't, I don't know what to say. An apology, perhaps? Or would that be too costly for a great man like yourself? I ask you to have pity on me. Give it, man. You will need his love much more than he needs yours. Pity? I'm sick, crippled. I can't remember things. I can't walk. I can't sleep. I can't think. You look at your whole life, laid out in front of you, still waiting to be lived, and you ask me for pity? To pity you? No, I think not. You must want something a little more practical than pity, I think. I want your permission to marry. To marry? And you need my consent because you're underage. Very well. Tell me about your income. How much do well-to-do lawyers earn these days? Nothing. Nothing. So all you must live on is your allowance from me. I see now that I should never have come. No, no, no. sit down. You have my full attention, I assure you. May we therefore assume the girl is rich? No. Well, I have now considered the matter. And I refuse. You'll never have my permission. Never. Uh, Mar Marius, Marius, I'm sure you think that I know nothing of love. Well, you would be wrong. Are you in love? I love her as I have never loved before. I love her with a depth of feeling I do not even recognize in myself. Then you must have her. I've been young once myself. Do you really think I've never been filled with longing for a woman? Mm, of course. So now you must act. What should I do, Grandfather? Well, it's obvious, man. You must make her your mistress. Here, take this money. You can find a room. Enjoy yourself. Life is short. I should know. We must take our pleasures where we find them. Hmm? <laughs> Age is not necessarily wise. And youth is not always a fool. Goodbye, Grandfather. But what on earth's the matter with you? I'm offering you money so you can have your little girl. One day Cosette will be my wife. I shall never come to you for help again. Goodbye. Yeah, Marius, 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 come back! And so it is that old men lose their beloved children with no more difficulty than a woman might mislay a glove. Strong for this pistol, my good man. More than you, go, sonny, I'll be. As Marius leaves his grandfather's house, perhaps for the very last time, let me take you over the gardens of the Rue des Filles du Calvaire to an altogether rougher part of town. It's a bit rusty, don't you think? Poor Saint Gavroche, born into darkness, unmothered, abandoned. It don't matter that it don't shoot. Revolution is mostly a matter of appearances. He's our side. Would you Little Gavroche. His fair soul reaches naturally up to the light, but he too is just a boy, and boys' hearts quicken at the sound of gunfire. What's all the fuss about down in the square? Some old generals drop dead, and they say as the old city's getting ready to rise. I must be there in that case. But how can I explain to my grandchildren that I was looking the other way when Paris arose? ta -ra! Oi, come back here! Here we are again, at a tavern where once young men leaned into each other and talked of liberation over a glass of wine. This is a good position to use as the headquarters when the fighting begins. The Tavern of Corinth, a student place, a rendezvous for friends. Are you sure there's going to be fighting on Jora? It's just that I'm not feeling terribly well. You must be the only man in Paris who doesn't know what's about to happen, Comfer. Mm, it's my diet. I was only saying to young Marius the other day that we are simply not eating balanced diets in this city anymore. Oh, I've got a terrible cold. Don't you want to fight for your country? Naturally, I'd want to consider it, but I'd much rather shake off this infection first. Oh, Comfer, it's... What's that, for heaven's sake? It's a boy waving a pistol in here. Over here now. What do you want to do? Get yourself shot. 
today would be a good day to die. Well, maybe stop and have some bread first. What do you say? All right, then. Oh, the world's gone mad. No tomatoes, children with guns in the street, Marius is in love, and I have the worst case of nasal congestion in the whole of Paris. Is where the revolution's starting, then, or what? Do we look like we're having a revolution just at this moment? Fricassee, some bread and soup for the boy. Quite right, gentlemen. We shouldn't fight on empty stomachs. Do you, sir? What is it now, sir? Only have to do something about the mosquitoes before they're coming through the windows like Napoleon's... Army. <laughs> Toussaint, I told you that we might move again. Well, we used to be on the move, sir. How many times was it last year? I've lost count. This is different. I have a bad feeling about Paris just now, Toussaint. It's time we left the city for good. But where would we go, sir? To England. To England? But, sir, I can't speak English. And I don't understand the food. And how will I do the shopping? How will I buy our clothes? We'll adjust, Toussaint. This is life, change, adventure, renewal. Renewal? Well, if you say so, you've always been good to me, sir. No one better. I'll come with you, though I can't say what it might do to my constitution. All that damp and bad bread. There's a lot to do. Preparations. We'll need to buy in everything. We won't be able to get there. A month or so should do it, maybe two. When were you thinking of us going, sir? Tomorrow morning. Are you mad, sir? We will make our way to the house in Rue de l'Homme tonight. Collect what may be useful to us for our journey, then on to England at the first opportunity. Oh, Cosette. What's wrong? Father? Toussaint? We must leave our home, Cosette. For England. Cosette? Not only is Monsieur uprooting us to some godforsaken foreign place, but we have to go tomorrow. But we can't. I know it seems a little sudden. But I can't go tomorrow. Believe me, Cosette, I know what I'm doing. With things in the city as they are, if we don't leave tomorrow, it could well be too late. Then let's not leave. Why do we have to go? We're all right here. We've always been safe here. No one has any argument with us. What, what harm have we ever done? I know it's difficult for you to understand. I'm not a child anymore. I can understand things perfectly well. It is my responsibility to protect us. We are going tomorrow, in the morning. Let that be an end to it. You never asked me what I want. What is the matter with her? I'd better get us packed, sir. A sail, a sail, a sail, a sail. I guess all the odds we will succeed. Another a bottle of wine, Madame Fricassee. If the revolution begins tonight, you'll be drunk, confess. It's purely medicinal. How can I fight for my country when I can't even breathe through my own nose? This street is perfect for a barricade if you gentlemen are the urge to build one. They're very fashionable these days. Popping up all over the city, they tell me. The boy's right, you know. It's not a bad spot. Put a few men on the roof with guns, and you have the enemy under observation from all angles. Do you mind me asking you exactly where you get all your experience in military manoeuvres from? I'm a bit of a picker-upper, me. Pick up all sorts. Ideas, songs, revolutionary strategies. Marius! Don't tell me you've come to join the revolution. He looks like he needs a drink. Yeah, have some wine, Marius. Wine cannot help me. Wine helps everything. Drink up and tell us the whole story. <sighs> My grandfather has refused me permission to marry. But to marry? Steady on. Oh, the woman I love is going away. I have no money and can't follow her. For a minute I thought you were going to tell me that France had been invaded or you'd suddenly develop gout. A real crisis at the very least. You may laugh at me, Enjolras, but I don't want to live without her. Perhaps that makes me a fool. If it does, so be it. My dear Marius, it simply makes you human, like the rest of us. Madame Fricassee, we have a situation here that demands more wine. What does it take to make an uprising? A pistol pocketed on a street corner, a few labourers given drink and then told to make their way to a particular bridge? The city seems so quiet. No more quiet than usual. Hand me all the other shirts. 
Can't I go out in the garden just one more time? I want you indoors. Just for a minute. I'll be careful. The birds are ignorant of the troubles of the city. It is summer and they have babies to feed. You! Hello! I'll give you five francs if you come over here. On the other side of Rue Plumet, leaning against the wall in the shade, stands a gangly youth, his cap pulled low across his smooth face. Please, five francs if you'll help me. The youth pulls his cap even lower over his eyes and crosses the street. Will you take this letter to Monsieur Marius Pontmercy at 16 Rue de la Verrerie? The youth looks at the girl, taking in her face, her desperate eyes, her hand with the letter thrust through the railings. Here's five francs for you if you'll help me. The youth takes the letter. He is thin as a swan under his rough working clothes, and he looks strangely like Eponine had she been a boy. Your money! Wait! It's just as well the revolution didn't start tonight. I have the most awful headache. I'm not coming in, Comfort. I have an appointment to keep. I don't think a boy of your sensitivity and idealism should be out on the street with all this madness in the air. I have to see her. To tell her I failed. Say goodbye. Be careful, my friend. I'd rather have you a living failure than a dead success. Tomorrow is another day. Who knows what it will bring us. Don't despair, eh? I'll make you tomato soup when you come home. Marius makes his way, heavy-hearted, through the strangely deserted streets. From an open window, he hears the sounds of the city. Mothers sing their babies into sleep. Dogs try their best to guard their houses from danger. The Seine laps against the breast of the city as it does every night, making a soothing song. But Marius is overwhelmed. He squeezes through the rusty gate, as he has done so many times before, and enters the garden. Cosette. Cosette. The house is in darkness, the curtains drawn. Cosette. 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 The house and garden are deserted. Marius is too late. He sits, broken, on the steps of the house. Dear God, wherever she is, keep her safe. He is in that place beyond despair, where there is only a void. Sir, sir, over here. A youth appears by the railings, a thin young man with his cap pulled low across his face. Hidden in his jacket, he carries a letter which he cannot bring himself to deliver. Who are you? He is dressed like a youth. But look closer, man. This boy looks not unlike the poor girl Eponine, who has always loved you, secretly and true. Your mates are down the barricade by the Corinth Tavern, sir. They sent me for you. They say how it's starting, the uprising, and you've got to come. All hope in life extinguished. Marius decides in an instant. If I cannot live with my love, I will not live without her. And what better way to die than for justice? Wait, I'm coming. I'm coming with you to the barricades. La 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 la. Concentrate, Bring more lights over here. This chair just splintered in my hands. Bonjour, I don't see how we can be expected to hold off an army with a few sticks of broken furniture. Never mind trying to do it in the middle of the night. Where's Grantaire? Upstairs in the Corinth getting drunk, which just at this second doesn't sound like a bad idea. And Marius? Chasing petticoats. Listen, I'm not sure this barricade will stand up to a gust of wind, never mind the National Guard. Let me know if Marius comes. We've got to get the barricades up before the guardsmen arrive, so no more time-wasting, Comfer. Yes, sir. Were a bird to soar above Paris, it would see an almost empty city. A sense of dread permeates the heavy summer air. An abyss has appeared at the heart of Paris. The barricades at Les Halles. While at Rue de l'Homme Armé. How many times can we have this conversation, Cosette? I just don't understand why we have to move to England. Because Paris is not safe. Not safe? How? When we're in England, all this reluctance will pass. You'll see. Well, how long are we going to be there? Until it's safe for us to return. Oh, sir. What's the matter, Toussaint? The barricades are going up again. 
People say it'll be a bloodbath. We'll be murdered in our beds. Barricades? It'll be like 1830 all over again. Troops all over the place, people terrified to walk the streets. Madame Lebexon was arrested this morning. Oh, sir. Sir. There, there, Toussaint. All will be well. Who are these rebels? I don't know. Working men. Students, of course. Students? What students? Students from the university. This time they say the king really has had his day. Won't be long before the city's on fire. You mark my words. Cosette? Are you all right, Cosette? I'll go and see to her. She just went white as a sheet, didn't she? If Marius were to die, for Cosette the thought is impossible to bear. Oh, Marius. Marius. Please, God. Oh, dear God. Please save him. The revolution needs you, Grantaire. The revolution? What revolution? We may be heralding a new dawn for the Republic. But we won't win. How do you know? You fight your futile little battle if you must, but for God's sake, leave us alone to get drunk. For more than 20 years, students have met at the Corinth. You wanted wine. Well, I did. And what about you, Andrea? You can't fight a revolution drunk. Well, what other way is there? Revol- you just mind my windows of your revolution. Bonjour. What is it? The National Guard are on their way. The streets are away. Oh, hurrah. Alert the others. But that's not all. Tell them. There's talk of using cannon. Cosette's locked herself away in her room, sir. She won't answer when I knock. I'm afraid there's something terribly wrong. Please wait at her door, Toussaint. Let me know as soon as she comes out. She's terribly upset. Please, Toussaint, just do as I ask. I'll be in the study. Very good, sir. Why can't you see, Cosette, that it's all for you? Everything. Who can imagine the torment of Jean Valjean? It's not as if we shall be staying in England forever. Knowing that nowhere in this world is ever safe, is ever home. It's just until this danger passes. Sensing his nemesis at every turn, in every shadow. But he will never take me back to the galleys, Inspector Javert. I swear it. When unexpectedly, his attention is drawn to the faintest indentation of a pen upon a blotter. What's this? Taking the blotter to the mirror, he now reads the words hastily written in Cosette's elegant hand. My darling, father demands that we leave at once for England. Come quickly, or else all is lost. You can find us at 7 Rue de l'Homme Armé. All my love, Cosette. All my love. Cosette. Oh no. Oh no. No. <gasps> Why is it so silent, Confer? I think our comrades need to hear from you, Enjolras. Very well. <coughs> Brothers. We must liberate ourselves from the shackles of fear. What we do today, we do for the good of the Republic and for the future of the world. The rebels gather to listen to the young Onjora. Our success today will never be forgotten. No! In the coming 20th century, men and women will be free, at liberty to choose their leaders and shape their own destinies. But brothers... We must face facts. Some of us will not see tomorrow's sunrise, but we must not fear death. We must embrace our destiny with the same humility and courage with which we embrace our liberty. Yeah. To liberty! To liberty! There is something divine, something immortal in the young man's words. Lay down your weapons in the name of the king! The guardsmen are at the barricade, Enjolras. We are your brothers and citizens of France. Yes, this is your final warning. Lay down your arms. Never. Who said so? The French Revolution. 
Vive la Republic! Confess. Marius, is that you? You look terrible. I'm with you now. You, Anjora, and all the rebels. For God's sake, man, what's happened? The barricades look very secure. Against bullets, maybe. But not, I fear, against cannon. Cannon? Is it a good day to die, Confer? I don't know about you, Baron, but in my book, it's never a good day to die. She's gone, Confer. Cosette is gone. What do you mean? Disappeared into thin air, and with her, any hope I ever had of life or happiness. Look out, Marion! Confer. You saved my life. Not me, my friend. It was that young beggar. He raised his hand to stop the bullet. Where is he? Which way did he go? Is that Marius? It is, Anjora. Whatever you want me to do, just name it. I'm with you to the end. Go check the barricades at the other side of the Corinth. Right away. I'm glad you're here, my friend. How's this barricade coming? We could do with some more wood to prop it up. I'll send word immediately. Who's that? In a dark corner of the alley lies what appears to be a wounded young man. Eponine! Oh, I took a bullet for you, sir. You were the beggar on the street, weren't you? Oh, how can I ever thank you? Seems to have gone straight through my hand and into my side. Let me help you, Eponine. Oh. Oh, I must find you a doctor immediately. <laughs> Too late for that, I fear. Take this. Letter. I promised I'd give it to you, sir. It's from that lady in the garden on the Rupla, mate. I'm sorry, I've got blood on it. Is that? I wasn't bound to give it to you, but... My darling, father demands that we leave at once for England. Come quickly or else all is lost. You can find us at 7 Rue de la Marne. <laughs> when did she give you this? Yesterday. Did she say why she was going away? Oh my God, you're bleeding terribly. I'll try and staunch the blood. Can you forgive me, sir? For what, Eponine? Truth is, I didn't want to do it with this letter. From that very first time I saw you at the Gulpo tenement, you changed my whole world. Try not to distress yourself, Eponine. It will be all right. You'll see. I shan't let you die. I shan't. You see, Monsieur Maris, I think I, I, I may have loved you. Just the littlest bit. Eponine. Eponine. Seven Rue de la Marme. You know it? Of course. You must deliver this note to the lady who lives there. Give the note to the lady. I think I can handle that, Mon Go quickly, Gavroche. There may not be much time. I shall not run the wind, sir. You're not having any more, Monsieur Quentin. Look what you and your bloody students have brought to my bar. For shame, Fricassay. A generation dies today. Excuse us, Monsieur. This number seven. Who's that? Is that you, Petit Chavez? Petit who? This number seven. Who wants to know? What's it to you? You got business here, boy. None that's yours, old man. What are you doing all huddled up on that doorstep anyway? Are you mad? I'm sitting here. What's it look like? For the last time, is this number seven? I believe it is. You know the young lady here, one Miss Cosette? Maybe. Maybe he's not good enough, sir. Do you know her or not? Only she's got the letter. Give it to me and I'll see she gets it. Now, tell me who sent it. You a relation? You want me to deliver the letter or not? Give it over. Baron Marius Pomercy, a gentleman who loves and adores her. Now, Monsieur, if you'll excuse me, some of us have a king to fight. Loves and adores her? You see that little Miss Cosette gets that letter now, old man? And if there's a reply? 
That letter comes from the barricade on the Rue de la Chanverie. The barricade on the Rue de la Chanverie. When the fight is over, I'll be back to check on you. So you'd better be sure and do it or you'll be answering to Baron Pomercy. Au revoir. Baron Pomercy. My darling, it is too late for me. In death, I will be with you eternally. M. Just how close to death are you, my friend? Who would underestimate the agony of a devoted father betrayed by a trusted daughter? Rest assured, she shall never receive this note of yours, not as long as I have breath. Oh, that this young interloper, this hero of the barricades, might die, and therefore deliver his beloved daughter back to him. But should you die? Should you die? What will become of Cosette? If she loves you as, as she seems to, oh God, why have you cursed me? What destiny is this? To lose everyone I've ever loved? Oh God, God. Valjean feels his heart contract, and the light momentarily parts from the world. His soul cries out, Cosette. But now. As he opens his eyes, as if for the first time, he knows with a terrible clarity exactly what action he now must take. Toussaint, will you please inform Miss Cosette that we will not be leaving for England this morning? He must save Marius. Excuse me, sir. And please lay out my guardsman's uniform. I don't understand, sir. What about the coach? It'll be here at eight. You said earlier there was fighting. Where is it? Over at Lazal. But what do you want with the uniform, sir? Please, Toussaint, just do as I ask. I can't just do that, sir. I'm worried about you. There's no need. I know what I'm doing. With all respect, sir, what are you doing? You and Cosette must stay here. You understand, Toussaint? Do not, under any circumstances, open the door to anyone or anything. The house must be a fortress until I return. But, sir, where are you going? To finish some important business. Remember, Toussaint. A fortress. Lay all the wounded men down over there. Someone bring some bandages. There aren't any more. Then improvise. A full June moon rises over the Rue de la Chanvalie. There's another man over here with a terrible head wound. Someone fetch a doctor. Was all this for nothing? Was all right? No, brother. No. Stay still as both rebels and guardsmen come here injured. We're never going to win, you know that, don't you? We have, haven't even got bandages. Never mind bullets. Will someone bring some bandages and clean water? Still, for all that, it was an honor to serve. Don't die. Please don't. And they're dead. What's all right? What is it, Marius? Come with me. Oi! Where do you think you're going? Rue de la Chanvery. Well, haven't you heard they shut the whole area down? What are you doing, dressed as a guardsman? I'm in the reserves. Well, they don't need no reserves, old man. So just you run along home and leave the fighting to the trained professionals. How many dead? No idea. Let's put it this way. Them troublemakers don't stand a chance. What makes you say that? Because they're outnumbered and outgunned. Come on, let's get going. Of course I understand the situation, Marius, but if Gavroche has only retrieved four guardsmen's uniforms, then one of these five men will have to stay. There's not much I can do about it, is there? But what about this man's family? These five men were selected because they all had families who depended on them for support. I don't know what you want from me, Marius. If I could spirit him away, I would. But as I can't, then we need another uniform. Oh, sure, a lot of the men are counting on these five getting out. They've become a symbol for them. For God's sake, Marius, you can count, can't you? I don't want the men to see us arguing. Surely it's not the revolution's aim to leave mothers and their children destitute on the streets of Paris. There must be a way. For God's sake, man, where's the cannon? Well, sir, Arsenal Commander himself promises a cannon will be with us by morning. I want it here now. This uprising ends tonight. I'll get on to it straight away, sir. 
Oh, sorry, Sergeant. Hard to credit, isn't it? Ramshackle barricade and a few angry men could rattle the chain of the king himself. <coughs> What's that? That's just a cat, I think. That's that cat. You two men, get up the end of the street. I think we have a rebel intruder. Go, go. There's nothing here, sir. I want every alley guarded. Search every shadow if you have to. Are the men in uniform? They are. Then let's prepare to get them out. I'm sorry, man. Well, what do I tell the fifth man? Tell him we'll keep him as far away from the fighting as we can. <sighs> if we have but one more uniform. You do. Hmm? What are you doing here? You know this gentleman, Marion. I, um... I believe we met once in the Luxembourg Gardens. Then you know him. I know him, Monjora. Can he be trusted? What I know of his character leads me to believe him to be a good man. I understand there's no time to lose. Not so fast. Who are you? How did you get in here, sir? With luck. Here, take the boots as well. Perhaps one of the five could lend me his britches. Otherwise, I'll be fighting in my underwear. Marius? Yes, yes, of course. I'll see to it immediately. How can we ever thank you? God himself sent you here. God had no part in it. Are there any weapons? Can you shoot a musket? I can. It's very quiet out there, Comfer. Don't suppose there's anything left in that bottle. You look ill. Ah, uh, nothing a drink won't cure. Oh. How's the revolution doing? It's as rough as bad wine. You're not afraid, are you, Comfer? Afraid? Well, let me see. Of course I'm afraid. Thankfully, I've never suffered the burden of principle. Why didn't you get out now, Comfer? Too late for that. They've ringed us in, I fear. Five men got out dressed as guardsmen, but as for the rest of us... Uh, excuse me. <laughs> think nothing of it, my dear Grantaire. The knowledge that you still have the manners of a dog gives me comfort in a constantly changing world. If only it were strong enough to blast us out of here. What's that? What's what? It came from over there. Behind the curtain. Oh, you're dreaming. Shh. I'm serious. Uh, create a distraction. What? Create a distraction. Um, uh, uh, fricassee! For God's sake, bring us some wine. I'm dying of thirst up here. Got you! Ah! Uh, well, I'll be damned, Comfer. You are absolutely right. Gavroche, I, I told you not to return to the barricade. You thought of telling the birds not to sing while you're at it? You did deliver that letter to Mademoiselle Cosette, didn't you? Of course. It's just that it's very important. Gave it to the old geezer sitting outside. Well, what old geezer? Just sitting there he was, at pulled down over his face like he'd been crying. But did you deliver the letter? I gave it to the old geezer. He said he knew her. Did he tell you his name? No, he was just sitting there. <laughs> so you didn't give it to her? I did give it to her, only not in person. Listen, mon frere, the lads need ammunition, so I said I'd fetch them some. Fetch them some? From where? The street, of course. Oh, that's insane, Gavroche. I'll see you later, Baron. Gavroche! Baron Pomessi. Yes? Enjolras says Comfer caught a spy. He wants us to join him in the basement now. Listen, we should speak. This isn't the time, Baron. Perhaps later. Come on. <laughs> Bring the prisoner over here. Oh, you mind my mum, <sighs> those wines are vintage. You can't just go round wrecking people's livelihoods. Tie him up. I'm not going to stand here and watch you turn this bar into a prison. Don't you care about the destiny of France? Now, the only thing I care about is the destiny of my profits. Bonjour. Over here, Marius. I don't know what you think you will achieve by all this. Just quiet. Where was he, Comfer? Behind the curtain upstairs. Was he armed? This pistol. So, these are the mighty revolutionaries. How very impressive. What's your name? My name is Inspector Javert of the Paris Police. And you, gentlemen, are all going to die today. Does anybody recognize this villain? I do. He's telling the truth. You can torture me all you like. I'll tell you nothing. Who said anything about torture? I'll decide what to do with you in due course. 
Confab, guard the prisoner. Marius, go back upstairs and check the repairs to the barricade. Straight away, Enjolras. Who's that gentleman over there? What's it to you? Would you ask him to step forward? You're in no position to make demands. There's no need to ask, Javert. Do you two know each other? <laughs> you see, 24601, it's just like I said. Nothing changes. Enjolras! The guardsmen have opened fire. Everyone to the barricade. Now. There's a breach in the barricade. What? Somebody bring another mattress. I'll see if we can find some more. We've got to fix this breach immediately. It won't stand another advance. Enjolras, get down. What? <laughs> Sniper on the roof. I'm in your debt, sir. Aren't you going to finish him off before he gets away? It's enough that I've wounded his arm. Tell me. Why did Javert refer to you as a number? We found another mattress, Enjolras. Excellent. But listen, where's Gavroche? Has anybody seen him? He said he was going to fetch ammunition. That's right. And you let him? Marius, we desperately need those cartridges or the battle is lost. But he's only a child. Come on, you metalheads! Do the best you can do! Get back here, Gavroche! The rising sun dapples a wash of colour across the eastern sky. But now, in the chill blue light of dawn... A boy scurries out onto the battlefield of the Rue de la Chanvery. One little bullet here. One little bullet there. Mm. Now the boy skips, whirls and dances his way from corpse to corpse, filling his bag with ammunition, the bullets whistling about him. Look out, Gavroche! Look out for what? We'll find another way to collect bullets. What other way is there? I felt like a dance anyway. Please, come back! A man can't fight without bullets. Look out! And kisses won't destroy a tyrant. What's the matter? Too late to bed, were we? Monkeys you better than that, my friends. So here's to you. The France! Oh, Gavroche! Marius, stay here. No, Gavroche, no! Somebody stop him! Get out of my way! Leave him! Gavroche is too... I won't leave him lying in the gutter like a dog! Marius! Shake your hands off me! Innocence dies in the first beams of the summer sun. Gavroche! Speak to me, Gavroche. If only you'd listened to me and stayed away. If only. Can't you see you're killing your children? For some, this boy's death is the death of liberty. The death of Paris. The uprising's tragic end. Put the body over there, Marius. Let him go. I can't. I can't. I can't. We're in the middle of a battle. This isn't the time to mourn. What are we going to do, Angelra? Those guardsmen won't stop till we're all wiped out. Brothers, Gavroche is lost. He died for us. It's over, Angelra. The king sent an army for our heads. He means to have them. The king is a coward with only might on his side. Brothers, we have God and justice with us. If we don't stand up to oppression with all the fortitude of brave Gavroche, then who will? We will raise Gavroche's coat as our standard, a signal to all the forgotten, miserable and wretched of this world, a signal that a few of us are prepared to fight for you. Death or glory, my friends, death or glory. I'm with you, Enjolras. So am I. And me! And me! Long live the revolution! Long live France! Brothers, hold that standard high! For Gavroche! Gavroche! You know you stand no chance today. A fascinating observation, Inspector. Thank you. The law will always prevail. Sometimes the law is wrong. Never. Well... Today, the law butchers the innocent. Oh, and what will the innocent achieve by this butchery? Nothing. At least we will have questions. Questions? It's always questions with you people. Don't you see? The law provides an answer. Invariably the wrong one. How does it feel to have a man's life in your hands? Not afraid to die, are we, Inspector? Quite the opposite. 
It has never been so welcome. My only regret is that I will not see all of your insurgent heads on a spike. You know, Inspector, ordinarily I'm not a violent man, but should the order come through to kill you, I will gladly oblige. <laughs> then you will be no better than me. Ozora! What is it? The spy, Javert. What about him? When the time comes, I want to dispose of him. You? Have I not distinguished myself? Twenty times over, but I don't understand. You asked me why he called me by a number. You're not settling a score, are you? Does it matter? Oh. Uh, 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 uh. Yes, monsieur. We are not murderers. Let me deal with Javert. It is all I ask. Are we agreed? Agreed. Hold up there, brothers! For France! For France! When are you going to kill me? Inspector Javert lies tethered to a table in the tavern of Corinth, awaiting his fate. We can't afford to waste precious ammunition on you yet. The new day is being born. The hungry, shivering rebels look down from their barricade at the deserted street. Somewhere, out of sight, the combined might of the French state lies in wait, ready to pounce. Where are they? They'll make themselves known soon enough. Have we nothing for the men to eat? Courage will have to be their breakfast. Personally, I prefer a plate of meat and eggs and a decent glass of wine. No tomatoes for breakfast this morning, then, Confer. <laughs> I keep telling you, this city is a disaster as far as the discerning housewife is concerned. What was that? A shadow on the other side of the street. Keep your heads low, men. We're being watched. Hold your fire, you damn fool! Not another shot until we see the enemy! <coughs> you know, gentlemen, if anyone had told me that revolution would be such a dirty process, I wouldn't have left the house yesterday without a change of clothes. Remind me to mention that when I write the history of this illustrious rising. Never depart for a proposed rebellion without packing spare socks and a toothbrush. When revolution comes, men take up their position on the barricades like spectators at a play. You there! You can get a good shot from here! Left-handed men are invaluable. They can fill up places unsuited to the rest. Here, here's water for you. Drink it while you can. It'll fill your stomach. Oh, thank you, citizen. Some men make seats for themselves on the barricade. Remember, not one of you show himself before time. We can't afford to lose a single man. All eyes are trained on the end of the street, on what would have been in other circumstances a sunbathed, beautiful day. <coughs> Here they come. What is it? What's that sound? They're rolling the cannon into position. Wait. Wait. Take your time. Not yet. Fire! Well done, men! You know what I'd say, gentlemen? Do tell us, Convert. I'd say we have about two minutes before that monster of a cannon decides to level itself at the centre of our little barricade and blow a path straight through us. You're not scared of a little cannon, are you, Confer? <laughs> For myself, no. But I have to tell you that we who are well versed in warfare know all too well that cannon are extremely sooty weapons which can leave a decent suit ruined for life. Reload, but hold your fire! So, you're not concerned about dying so much as the damage the exchange might do to your clothes? Men are ten a penny, my good Marius, but a decent suit is a real treasure. <laughs> Regroup! <coughs> Come down! On the other side of Paris, the first assault from the great cannon upon the rebels wakes Cosette from a fitful sleep. Tussa! Tussa! What is it, child? Where's father? Isn't he back? Oh, there's fighting in the city. Oh, 
as if people didn't have better things to do with their time. Young men hungry to wave their guns and flags about, breaking things and causing a mess. Do you think he's there? Marius? Oh, how wonderful to have a secret admirer. Never happened to me. I was always too busy. Do you think he's still alive? Of course he's alive. Young men with high ideals. They come bouncing right back from the kind of experiences that would flatten the rest of us. My God, what will happen to us now? What a terrible thing war is, my dear Maria. Let us hope that when we have no more kings, we will have no more war. <laughs> You see that young army officer in charge of the cannon? We have to pick him up. That should buy us a few minutes to regroup. He can't be more than 25 years old. Let me climb past oh. come fair to get a better shot. I expect he has a mother, perhaps even a child. When you kill an officer, it always buys you time. He could be your brother, couldn't he? Standing as he is in the first sunlight of the day, his whole life ahead of him. He is my brother. Then, my dear friend, we mustn't shoot him. Must. In the tavern, two old enemies come face to face for what indeed may be the last time. Inspector Javert, Jean Valjean, convict, bogus mayor, absconder. So, here we are at last. Yes, here we are. I am your prisoner, and I don't have long to live. None of us know how long we have to live. Have you come to kill me? I await my orders. What restraint? Is that a rue du Gossip runs like birdsong through the barricade, and every man is hungering for news. The boys killed a squadron commander at Port Saint-Martin. There are women firing at the soldiers in the windows of the Rue Saint-Denis. What did I tell you, man? All of Paris will rise like a child out of its sleep. We are not alone. There have been fires reported all over the city. Right. Before long, however, it is clear that any other outbursts of unrest have been brought under control. And soon our rebels are entirely alone. The valiant Comfort decides this must be the time to put on the performance of a lifetime. Call yourself a cannon! You're not even the second cousin to a sick old musket! <laughs> You don't even make enough racket with your pathetic assault to wake me up when I'm having a sleep. Why, an alarm clock is noisier than you are. I thought the French army had cannon, but now I know they only have a few pea shooters on top of some rickety old wheel. Oh, God, protect us. Not content with one, they think two cannon will scare us. They scare me. A boy with a catapult would scare you, Marius. The men say they've seen soldiers loading grape shot. They'll breach your defences for sure this time. You are such a moody old thing, Marius. Why, anything could happen before our defences are breached. Earthquake, typhoon, reinforcements. <laughs> I can't see a damn thing through the smoke! We've driven them back, I shouldn't wonder. Another 15 minutes of this and we'll have no ammunition left. Well, perhaps we should say a prayer with the men. Perhaps the men don't want to pray. Well, then they can listen. Reload! Hail Mary, full of grace. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. It must be wonderful to believe in a God. I feel certain he believes in you, Comfer, even if you're not so sure about him. Then he sounds like a very sensible fellow, because it is indisputable that I exist. The smoke moves like low cloud through the ranks of white-faced young men. Confer, stop play-acting. We've got work to do here. Confer, wake up. You've got no time to sleep. We have a revolution to win. Confer. Over the roofs of the city, a soul is set free. Not yet a man and yet more than many men grow to be. A brave heart and a good friend. Comfer lies dead, 
and the world is poorer for his passing. Toussaint, what's happening in the street? It's quiet now, child. They say the trouble is all but over. Only a few hotheads left. I'm going out there, Toussaint. I must find Father and Marius. No, child. You must stay here, at home, and allow them to find you. But Marius is out there. Something's wrong. I can feel it. I can feel him as sure as he was standing here beside me, and there's something terribly wrong. Marius! I'll hold the barricade. Let me command it, Ozora. The men need you with them in the tavern at the end. Marius, I can't allow I'll you I'll be to... all right. Go, for God's sake. God bless you. God bless us all, Ozora. You there! You know what you have to do? Jean Valjean steps forward, out of the smoke and the midday heat. Take this pistol and blow out the police inspector's brains. So this is to be the end of Inspector Javert, executed at the hands of his old enemy, Jean Valjean. You, come with me. We'll meet your end in the alley behind the barricade. Best be quick, man. They're nearly upon us. Come on. I don't want to get shot myself sending you to hell. At the back of the tavern, out of sight of the rebels, Jean Valjean holds the bound Inspector Javert by the throat as he pulls a knife from his belt. What do you want to do, Valjean? Cut my throat instead of offering me the dignity of a soldier's death. Valjean stares through his sweat and blood into the depths of his enemy's eyes. Here is the man who has pursued him all his life. Here is the man who has frequented his nightmares for the last twenty years. I don't suppose I will end this day alive. And with that, he uses the knife to cut the ropes that bind the inspector's hands. But should we both live to see another dawn, I live at seven rue de l'Homme Why don't you kill me? I've told you where I live. Now go. Go! Javert staggers away through the rubble and smoke. His inner world is devastated as the Parisian streets through which he stumbles. A bad man has set him free. Has shown beyond doubt that men are neither good nor bad, but full of contradictions and capable of humanity. The very temple of Javert's soul is in ruins. Nothing he has hitherto built his life upon still stands. And then... Marius falls. With one last push, the army breaches the barricade. Jean Valjean picks up the unconscious Marius and, unable now to retreat, drags the boy into the same alley behind the tavern where a moment ago he set Inspector Javert free. Only Enjolras is left alive in the upper room of the tavern of Corinth. Stand still! You, man, lay down your arms! Shoot me, then! I die for France. He's a leader. Reload! Then, in a corner, having slept through the whole rebellion in a drunken stupor, Grantaire awakes. Enjolra, what in the world has happened? Take aim! My dear Grantaire, we fought for a new France and almost won. Oh, why, that's wonderful. Let me join you. You see, gentlemen, I'm one of them. I just didn't realise it until now. Grantaire rises, crosses the room, offering his hand to Enjolras, who clasps it warmly. Long live the Republic. Hey, Enjolras? Yes, my friend. Fire! Jean Valjean, trapped in the alley at the back of the tavern of Corinth, stands with Marius in his arms, awaiting their inevitable death. Well, my young man, it looks like we're destined to die together. There is no possible escape at either end of the street, and the soldiers are closing in. We may have fought like men, young Marius, but now we must escape like rats. If what we want to do is live... Jean Valjean struggles to prise open the manhole under his feet, which leads to the sewers of the city. They stand. Shrouded in darkness, stifled by the stench, terrified, exhausted, but alive. Damn the dark. 
We need to be moles to find our way down here. Uh, away with you! Damn you! Go! We're not dead yet. Paris is tearing itself apart above our very heads, boy. Do you listen to me? Do you live? Stay alive. Breathe in this air, however foul it may be. We must go to the left, I think. I hope. Follow the slope. If this is the sewer of Les Au, sooner or later there has to be an outlet into the Seine. What will Cosette say to me if I let you die, eh? Come on. We're not dying here in a sewer. Not before we see the sun just one more time. Come away from that window, Cosette. Every few minutes, another cart comes by, loaded with the bodies of young men. I told you you shouldn't be watching. Some of them look like children. Some of them are children, my girl. War doesn't pick and choose who it slaughters. Do you think he's there? On one of those carts? Marius, with no one to care for him, in a pile of bodies. Alone. Oh. Wherever he is, he isn't alone, child. God will be watching over him. He was a good boy, so he will always have God nearby. I'm sure of it. I want every alleyway, street, storehouse and sewer search for those escaping rebels. I want every one of them behind bars tonight. When the criminal Jean Valjean allowed Javert to escape, an action which he could not comprehend, it caused the inspector to do something which he hadn't done in years. It had made him think. Excuse me, sir. You all right? Yes. Yes, yes, I'm fine. Why shouldn't I be? Leave me alone. Yes, sir. The principles by which Javert had always lived were gone from the moment a convicted felon showed him mercy, thereby saving his life. And into the police inspector's narrow world flooded an entirely alien landscape, one fashioned by compassion, renewal, humanity, gratitude and justice. It was more than he could comprehend. Uh, uh, we should have found a way out by now. In this hell underneath our city, an old man tears his shirt into bandages and tends a wounded youth. Humanity is still shining in this dark and putrid place. Are you breathing, boy? What's this? My name is Marius Pontmercy. My body is to be taken to my grandfather's house, Monsieur Gilles Normand, 6 Rue des Filles du Calvaire. You're not dead yet, boy. Come on. Cassette, what have I told you? You shouldn't be outside like this with all the trouble in the city. He used to meet me in the garden of the Rue Plumet every night, secretly. It wasn't much of a secret. You knew? Of course I knew. Why didn't you stop us? Why didn't you tell Father? How many opportunities come in a lifetime to have secret meetings in a garden when you are in love? Toussaint, you can tell me, do you think father is dead? He's not come back. He would have come home, wouldn't he, to be with us if something hadn't happened to him? I'm sure there's some perfectly good reason. Please, tell me. I think he would have come home to us. 
if he could. Ah. Ah. You God have mercy on us. This foul water cannot get any deeper. Dear God in heaven, don't let us drown in this dismal place. Ah. The sewers of Paris from time to time run into sandy pits where the floor has given way and the water has risen to the height of a man's chest or neck or head. Come on. Come on. I'll not die here. I tell you. Wake up, boy. Stay awake. Live, man. Do you want to meet your end in the slime and darkness of a city sewer? Valjean's face floats like a mask upon the oily surface of the water. Not another fragment of his body visible, fighting for air and life. Cosette. My girl. Cosette. I'm alive. I'm still here. And I'm alive. I've lived through worse than this. I did not succumb to the galleys. I did not give way to despair when I lost your sweet mother, Fontaine. And I will not, dear God, I will not lose hope here. <sighs> the sunshine cannot tell the difference between a day when young men fall in love and one which sees them safely to their graves. But for Inspector Javert, Nothing can ever be the same again. Where do you want us to begin, sir? I'm sorry. The search of the sewers. Where do you want us to start? His mind is a world fractured by contradictions of law and order, good and bad, right and wrong. I've got a complete map of all the gates and sluices here, sir, and a party of 20 men... Should a new universe, unrecognisable gates open before him. A place where even the criminals are capable of compassion. A universe where God and light and redemption is the property of all men. Sir? Sir? I... I'll follow you. While Inspector Javert executes his duties with the air of a ghost, suspended between life and death, somewhere, underneath his feet, Jean Valjean, who was almost but not quite drowned, some way back in the endless tunnels of the sewer, suddenly catches sight of something which raises his heart and hopes. Yes, light, light. Oh, thank God, thank God. If there's light, there must be some way out. Jean Valjean lowers his charge carefully down beside the little grill that covers the exit from the sewer. Damn you. You can't be locked. No. No, we can't go back. We have to get out of here. He tries in vain to force the grill, but it is clearly hopeless. Jean Valjean presses his face to the rusty iron bars. Damn you. Nearby, all of Paris is at liberty. To the right... The Pont d'Iena, to the left the Pont des Invalides. Flies come and go happily through the grating, but Jean Valjean and his wounded boy are trapped. What's it worth to you to get out through that little old grating? Jean Valjean turns to find a shadowy figure standing knee-deep in water, barely visible in the gloom of the tunnel. Oh, you. It don't make no difference who I am. Seems to me the issue here is... Who are you? I can't see you in this darkness. Let me put it to you like this, mate. Here you is, down a sewer, trapped with what looks to me like a dead bloke at your feet. Now, I says to myself, what's a nice gentleman doing down a sewer with a corpse at this time of day? You know what? I comes up with the answer. You ain't no funeral director. What's falling down a manhole with one of your customers under your arm? <laughs> Can you get us out of here? Hold your horses. <laughs> no, I ain't finished telling me story. <laughs> oh, it's 
stamp house murdering me. <laughs> London. That's <laughs> a good one, ain't it? Murdering. <laughs> <laughs> So I says to myself, maybe as I had a gentleman here that's done a fragment of uh, foul play with a said dead body and is trying to uh, get rid of it. How does that sound to you, by way of an explanation? What do you want? Well, it seems to me I could be of some service to you. Being as how I have a key here to that grill, as would let you out into all that lovely fresh evening air. And I would also be prepared to throw in this high quality bit of rope for a reasonable price. Why would I need rope? Oh dear, dearie, dearie me. You ain't the number one killer in Paris, no mistake. You would need the, ro <coughs> the rope to tie around the body, tying the other end to a stone. If you was about to chuck the stiff in the river, <laughs> if you get my drift. <laughs> How much? How much you got? Valjean searches his sodden pockets, but he has left the house in such haste the day before, he has almost nothing on him. Forty francs. You didn't kill him for much, did you, mate? All right, let's search the corpse. Hold that. The villain goes through Marius's pockets, but what he really wants is a fragment of the young man's coat to use for blackmailing purposes in the future. He gets it too, unnoticed. He's clean. You best be on your way. Yeah. They say as how the cops are searching every drain near here. The grating is unlocked, and Jean Valjean is suddenly outside with Marius, laying upon a grassy verge. And when he looks back, the grill is locked behind him and his accomplice gone, vanished entirely back into the dark. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Perhaps we're watched over when our end is near. Jean Valjean thinks on this as he lies face down on the verdant grass. Grass never smelt so sweet, so alive. Perhaps Bishop Meriel, Valjean's first true friend, had looked down from heaven and taken pity on him. Or Marius' father, Baron Pontmercy, watching from the other side of the grave, saw his boy dying in darkness and sent him down a robber to let him out, into the light. You there, don't move. Stay right where you are, face down in the grass. He's got a body with him, sir. Check the body for identification. He's alive, only barely, but breathing sure enough. You, stand up, your hands on your head, and turn around and face the inspector. Jean Valjean turns, the last rays of sunlight bathing his exhausted face. This is our senior officer, Inspector Javert. We know each other from a long time ago. What should we do with the prisoners, Inspector Chevet? Put them in the carriage over there and then double check the sewers for anyone else. I should escort the prisoners. Yes, sir. The boy may die, Inspector Javert. He should have thought of that before he joined the rebels. Right, you. In the carriage. Now. Drive on. Where to, Inspector? Madelonette Prison. Do it up there. At least let him die with his own family. I have the address here. Rue des Filles du Calvaire. Are you questioning my duty, Valjean? It's me you want, Inspector. Prisoner 24601, not the boy. Must I repeat myself to you? I swear that I will give myself up to your jurisdiction without resistance if you will let me take the boy home. And why should I believe you, 24601? You, a known convict and fugitive, why should I value your word above the word of law after all these years of lies and deception? Because, Inspector Javert, last night I saved your life. seen, Father. The barricades have been completely crushed. Yeah, and a good thing, too. Not all of Paris mourns the passing of the rebels. If I had my way, they'd be strung up outside the Bastille as a lesson to all the other would-be revolutionaries. 
As Paris wipes the ashes of the barricades from its eyes, and the sun sets over the still empty streets, an unearthly calm settles upon the city. Was that Marius I saw here the other day? Mm, that ungrateful varlet? I never want to hear his name mentioned ever again. Of course, father. Should that miscreant ever hammer on this door again, send for an exorcist, and then the police. Aren't you being a little harsh on the boy, father? He mm. is family. I tell you, he's no grandson of mine. Imagine wanting to marry some wicked little wench. <laughs> She's sounding no better than a serving girl. Uh, what the devil is that it? Be? Oh, some agitator, I shouldn't wonder. Were I fifty, no, sixty years younger, why, I'd soon show those troublesome apes a thing or two. Oh. Begging your pardon, sir, but I really think you should come with me now. Have you taken leave of your senses, Basque? Barging in here without it's a... an emergency, sir. <laughs> In all his ninety years, Monsieur Gillenormand has never seen a sight the like of which awaits him on his doorstep. Oh, my the young God. man needs immediate attention. Marius, my God, what's happened? Basque, send for a doctor. Poor Master Marius. Now, Basque. Oh, of course, sir. Right away, sir. Bring him through here, Monsieur. He's not dead, is he? Very near. My boy, my poor boy. Oh, boy. But, Father, it's Marius. Not a moment ago, you were saying... Go and fetch some blankets, woman. Can't you see the child is sick? Of course, Father. For an hour, the doctor tends to Marius's wounds. And for an hour, the boy dawdles on the threshold of life and death. Well, Doctor? Uh, with a lot of time and patience, there is a possibility the young gentleman may recover. Heavens be praised. But it will not be easy. The young gentleman's wounds are very deep. Uh, where's the man that brought him? He was sitting over here. Well, where is he, Basque? He was sitting just there. I, I know he was. Well, find him, Basque. Find him. Well, a doctor attends to him. Driver, proceed. Does it satisfy you that we're now equals? Showing compassion is not a crime, Inspector. But defying the law is. By rights, that man should be behind bars, and yet I have released him. What difference if the man dies in prison or with his family? Because only the innocent and pure of heart should die peacefully in their beds. The rest of us must perish in ignominy. You did the right thing, Inspector. I'm sure the young man would thank you if he could. Last night he would have seen me gutted like a fish. Tell me, Valjean, why did you release me? I did what I knew was right, Inspector, oh, nothing more. What do you know of right? For 15 years, not one day passed that I did not seek to have you arrested. I don't know what to say, Inspector. The law demands justice. You broke your parole. The very day you took that silver from the Bishop of Dean, you must have known that the law would never rest, that the law would do everything in its power to make you account for your crimes. Yes, Inspector, I knew. You see? A criminal like you can never change. You are what you are. You existing on one side of the law and me existing on the other. We both have our roles. But last night you held my life in your hands and yet you released me. The truth is that from the moment I saw you a hostage in the barricades, my instinct was to release you. I'm sorry if that's not the answer you want, Inspector, but it's the truth. Such lies, Valjean. I'm not lying. Then I am in your debt, and you have your victory. What victory? You have me in chains, Inspector. You have corrupted me, Valjean. I have defied the law. And now I must bear the consequences of my crime. This is madness. You mock me, just as you have always done. I remember you in the galleys. A long time ago. I opposed your parole, Valjean, from the very day it was first mentioned. Why? Because of the inescapable logic of your criminality. And now you think yourself above the law, don't you? No, Inspector, never. When you turned up... As mayor in Montreuil saint mer dispensing good works and charity, what did you think? Did you think that you could fool me? 
I smelt your criminality like a stench in the air. And then, when you paraded yourself with that whore, Fantine, even taking it into your home as your own, hardly better than a pimp. You will speak of Fantine with respect. Ah, now, now we have it. Go on, Virgil, go on, strike me. To you, I am and always will be whatever you decide I am. <laughs> What's the point you never understand? Never understand what? That with God's help, a person may change. You dare speak his name! I do. I ask you again, Valjean. Why didn't you kill me? Because it is wrong. <sighs> Last night at the barricades, order defeated anarchy. Crushed it like an insect under its boot. I was ready to sacrifice myself for justice. And yet here I am alive with the criminal who spared me. And now... Now in this carriage... Anarchy defeats order, and I must seek justice in the gutter. You haven't touched the soup. I made it specially. What? Life must go on, Cosette. There is no life without them. I won't have you speak like that, my girl. Why? Because it's no good. Stop here, driver. What are you doing? Overpower me and run away. No. I'm giving you an opportunity to escape. So that you can continue to hunt me and we might re-establish this so-called logic of yours. <coughs> I don't think so, Inspector Javier. Then what do you want? All I ask is that I may go back to my lodgings and make some provision for my dependents. And then? Then you may do with me as you will. Don't you care that they may both be dead too, sir? Of course I do. But I also know that wanting to die yourself is no way to deal with it. But... Nothing is for certain. We must wait and see, no matter how terrible the outcome may be. You don't understand, too, sir. I understand very well. If you think that you are the only one who will mourn his death, then you should think again, my girl. But what are we to do if he's gone? When terrible things occur, we must do what people have always done, Cosette. We must carry on. Cosette. Father! Sir! Heavens be praised! Are you all right? Did they hurt you? I'm all right, Cosette. But your clothes! Toussaint, prepare a bath. Cosette. This soup but... isn't there, Toussaint. Fresh on the stove, but I think you need a bath first, sir. Listen, both of you. I can't stay long. There's a carriage outside which is waiting to take me to prison. Prison? What have you done? I fought at the barricades, which is an offence against the king. Then we must help you escape. No, no more running, no more hiding. Toussaint, I were at the barricades looking for you. That was dangerous, Cosette. They said there were no survivors. Were all the rebels dead? Every one. And now, just when we have you back... You say you're to be arrested. Try and understand, Cosette. No, father. As usual, I don't understand anything about you. And as usual, you will do what you please, even if it means allowing them to execute you. There isn't time for this, I Cosette. thought you were dead, father. And now you come back only to tell me that you may as well be. What? <laughs> Yes, don't just stand there, Basque. But I don't know what Monsieur wants. Can't you see? He's coughing. Yes, but I still don't know. You don't care if he lives or dies, do you? The master is I dying. know you think I drove Marius away. Well, I didn't. He left. And why? Politics. Detestable politics. From now on, politics is not to be discussed in this house. Is that understood? Yes, sir. <laughs> what can I get you, my boy? My darling boy. Oh, listen to him groan, Basque. I can't bear it. I can't. In this box, you'll find money. Use it to leave Paris and start a new life abroad. Without you? Without me. Never. This makes no sense. Just a moment ago, you said there was to be no more hiding. You may not be safe here, that's all. But, Father, it's not us who are in danger, it's you. All I want is your security. And we shall have it. 
The three of us together. Please don't go, Father. I'm begging you. Oh. I have given my word. Then we shall stay here, counting the days until your return, won't we too, sir? We will, sir. And now, for the second time in less than 24 hours, Jean Valjean delivers himself up to God's mercy. Will Javert see him hang this time? Without a doubt. Valjean knows this as surely as the river knows the sea. Where did you say that carriage was, sir? Right here. Right outside the door. Well, there's no sign of it now. There must be. The street is completely deserted. On to change, Inspector. Good. You may go now. The police station will settle the account. The lights of Paris twinkle on the surface of the river's dark, swirling water. Very good, sir. Are you all right, sir? Just go. But Gervais' universe of an unimpeachable law and all its certainties has disappeared as surely as if the moon and stars have slipped from the sky. Oh, my hat! What does it matter if you lose a hat when God himself laughs at you? And here now, alone on this desolate bridge, Javert extends his arms as if Paris herself was slipping from his grasp. I only sought to do my duty. Only that. So how did I fail? How did I fail? Stronger, perhaps. Oh, bad dreams. Oh, such bad dreams. They will pass, Marius. They will pass. Shall I open the shutters? The garden's magnificent oh. this afternoon. Just magnificent. Oh, I'd like that. Voila! <laughs> and Marius is bathed in the soft orange glow of an August afternoon. The apple trees sway in the gossamer breeze, heavy with precious fruit. Butterflies and bees scurry from flower to flower. I keep going over and over that night on the barricades. You must rest, Marius. Rest. Monsieur Gillenormand has forbidden any mention of politics in his house. Enjolras, Grantaire, and Confer, I dreamt that all of them were dead. Try not to distress yourself. I must go to them. You can't go to them, my child. Uh, why not? Because, Marius, your friends are dead. Dead? They were all killed that night. But what about the revolution? What, what happened to the revolution? There was no revolution. Now get back to bed. But all, all those brave men... Those brave, brave men. We'll talk about them later, Marius. Later, I promise. Won't you take a little champagne for me? Did you know Inspector Javert? I met him a couple of times. Who would have thought? He was a dedicated policeman, wasn't he? None more so. But the Seine's dark, swirling water keeps its secrets. Did he jump from here? That's what the report said. Comes here in this carriage the night after the revolt in Lazal and jumps. Secured away for all eternity. You've been very kind, officer. I'll leave you to it then, sir. Good day. Thank you, officer. Who's there? But only the deep cold water answers. Am I free of you at last, Chavert? Will I ever be free of you? Or will you hound me forever? As it races out of Paris, toward the sea so far, far away. Goodbye, Javert. Occasionally memory is like water, as it rushes to fill every available crevice and space. Look out, Angelra. Look out, Angelra. But in the comfort and safety of his grandfather's house, 
Marius drowns each night beneath a tidal wave of nightmare and memory. Gavroche, come back! Gavroche! As in his dreams he sees his comrades and friends fall before the onslaught of the guardsman's cannon over and over again. And they're all dead, Cosette. All of them. They're all dead. Oh, dear God, what's happening to me? I just don't know who I am anymore. I, I just don't know. Marius. Where are you, Marius? It hardly seems possible. But the garden of the Rue Plumet is now even more overgrown than it was a few months ago. If only you knew how I long for you. How I wish that you were here. Who's there? Remember a dark wood on a cold Christmas Eve many years before. I said, who's that? Is that you, Cosette? Father? What are you doing here? I've been looking for you. I wanted to see the old house again. And the garden, perhaps? The garden, too. Master Marius <clears throat> should try not to distress himself so. I just want to read a book. Your grandfather has expressly forbidden it. He says you are not to be overstimulated. I'm bored. Is there something I can arrange for you, sir? Your uh, your pillows, perhaps? Has there been any news about... Um, has anyone come looking for me? Looking for you, sir? No one has inquired after me. Is Master Marius referring to anyone in particular? Well, I... Uh... A uh, young lady, perhaps? Well, what do you know of her? Nothing, sir. Only uh, I've heard you call out a name in your sleep. Uh, Colette, is it? Cosette! Has there been any news of her? Unfortunately, no. Oh. She wouldn't be welcome here anyway. Oh, no, sir. I'm uh, I'm sure she would. I wanted to marry her. Oh, how romantic, Master Marius. But my esteemed grandfather suggested I take her as my mistress. Occasionally the master says things that he doesn't really mean. We both know that. Oh, she probably thinks I'm dead. Killed with all the others. Now, Master Marius isn't to fill his head with such things. Dark thoughts are forbidden. Those are your grandfather's orders. I don't know what you want me to say, Father. Toussaint says you used to spend a lot of time out here in the evenings. What else has Toussaint said? Nothing. Really? Really. She's told you something, hasn't she? Nothing. I only asked her why you seemed so sad. And what did she say? She said I should ask you. Is there something you want to tell me, Cosette? Very well. I never wanted to deceive you, Father. Deceive me? What are you talking about, Cosette? I suppose it doesn't matter now. I don't understand. A young man used to visit me here. When? It feels like a thousand years ago. You must believe I wanted to tell you. I don't understand. Do you remember when we used to take an afternoon walk in the Luxembourg Gardens? Very well. And every day we used to sit on a bench beside the fountain? Yes. Well... There was a young man. He used to sit opposite us. I vaguely remember someone. Go on. One afternoon, he didn't come back to the bench. For years, I didn't see him. I thought he must have forgotten me until one night. One joyous night. He found me once again. This is distressing you, isn't it, Father? No, no. Continue, please. We used to meet here in secret, in this marvellous garden. His name was Marius Pontmercy. You must believe me when I say I wanted to tell you all the time, but I... I thought you would be angry. Oh, not that it matters now. He's dead. Dead? He fought at the barricades. None of the students survived. Oh, Cosette. If I hadn't left this place, then... You have nothing to reproach yourself for. Don't I? Of course not. That Valjean could only bring himself to comfort her. But wildly, he hopes to his shame that Cosette might have forgotten about Baron Marius Pontmercy. Three months ago, I thought I had lost you both. And now it's... It's as if I have lost myself. Was this young man serious in his intentions? And now he hears it from her own lips. He asked me to be his wife. And did you accept his proposal? With all my heart. And now he's dead. 
head. <laughs> Do you trust me, Cosette? Oh, of course. Then dry your tears and come with me. I don't understand. Come with me. And you believe this will work, do you, Basque? I would not be so bold, sir, but I do think that we should at least try and find the girl. That would be all very well if we had the slightest inkling as to what she looked like. Marius has described her to me. Go on. Golden ringlets, mm? a French face, but with a touch of Italian in the complexion. Yes. Dark eyes, yeah. bewitching eyes, mm. petite, but not thin, and mm. well-dressed, very well-dressed. Mm. So we're looking for a pretty, petite, well-dressed Parisian girl, are we? Exactly. And how many young girls fitting exactly that description do you imagine are walking around Paris this very instant? Well, I... I am surrounded by dunderheads and blockheads. What about the man who brought Marius home that night? What news of him? Well, sir, it seems that nobody has ever heard of him. Every day, poor Basque is dispatched to search the streets of Paris for a sighting or an inkling as to the identity of the mysterious visitor who saved Marius's life. What are you saying, Basque? It seems he just vanished. Vanished into thin air, like a ghost. Like a ghost? I never heard such nonsense. There must be someone who knows him. There's no one, sir, I swear. But every day it is the same. Nothing. Only whispers and rumours that in the aftermath of that terrible night, a police inspector inexplicably threw himself from the Pont au Change. Put on your coat and go and look for him. Now. Now, sir. But what about Master Marius? I shall attend personally to Master Marius. Go! What are you doing, Father? Leaving a note for Toussaint. I don't want her worrying. Are you ready? But where are we going? Come along. I don't want any chicken. But you haven't eaten properly in days. I should be dead. No, no Marius. Along with all my comrades. Don't you see that when you speak this way, you break my heart, my boy? You sent me away. No. You denied everything I was, and you turned me away when I asked for your help. I only wanted to do the best. You never even told me the truth about my father, about Baron Pontmercy. A title I am still proud to claim as my own. I will not speak of that swashbuckler. He was a hero. Honoured by Napoleon himself. I won't have him spoken of with disrespect. Ungrateful boy. Who fed and clothed you? Who nurtured you as if you were his own? I did. As long as I never questioned you. As long as I played my part of the sombre royalist in every particular. I will not discuss politics. It was politics which drove us apart in the first place. Brave men died for freedom on that barricade. Brave men that you and I are not worthy to clean the boots of. Why are you provoking me, Marius? My name is Baron Pontmercy, and while I am grateful to you for my recovery, I would appreciate it if you could instruct Basque to gather my things. You don't know what you're saying, Marius. I shall leave this evening. But where will you go? You're still not well. That is no concern of yours, monsieur. At least let us discuss this sensibly. Oh, oh Basque! As far as I'm concerned, there is nothing to discuss. Oh. Basque! Must a gentleman answer his own front door? Where are the servants? The endless strife of young and old. I'm coming! I'm coming! Always blind to one another's needs. Wipe away those tears, you fool! <coughs> Yes, may I help you? The tradesman's entrance is at the side. Go away! Who can underestimate the furious obstinacy of youth? Who is it? Marius, please. I do not wish to speak with you. I told you I'm leaving, and this time for good. Please, Marius, let me come in. No! It will only take a moment, please, my boy. Well, you're right, of course. What? Well, leave, if you must. I will not stop you. As soon as Basque returns, I will have him pack what bags you need. I beg your pardon? I will not stand in your way, my boy. 
I am, of course, grateful for the kindness which you have shown me. I trust you will consider visiting your grandfather and aunt every so often. If I have an opportunity. I would be very grateful. <sighs> well, then. There's just one thing more. Uh, what is it? As a favour to an old man. Yes. Would you please open the door? Why? Please, as a favour to me. If this is some ruse to make me stay... I assure you, it is not. Am I dreaming? Oh, my love, you're alive. A cassette. Marius, you're alive. You're alive. Is this the Gilles Normand household? It is. Would you be so kind as to inform the master of the house that Lafayette is here? Madame Lafayette, it will be an honour. In the weeks since their reunion, neither Marius and Cosette nor the Gilles Normand house have known such happiness. There's nothing to be nervous about, my love. But what if I don't like it? My grandfather says that Madame Lafayette is the finest seamstress in Paris. I just want the dress to be perfect. And it will be. You'll see. <clears throat> Begging Master Barris his pardon. What is it, Basque? Madame Lafayette is here. Is the fitting room prepared? It is, sir. Inform Madame Lafayette that Cosette will be with her in a moment. The ancient furniture and fittings, so long a neglected mausoleum to a more graceful age, are now awakened as if from a long and laborious sleep. Even the horror of the barricades is faded away like smoke from a distant fire, to be replaced by a tenderness not known in the Gilles Norma house for over 70 years. And breathe in... And breathe out. <laughs> silk for you, young lady. Definitely silk. And lace? Lace? Of course. Goes without saying. You wanted to see me, monsieur? Yes, Baron, I did. Well? It concerns Cosette's dowry and fortune. What about it? I think it best you sit down. If a traveller is ever in the woods outside the town of Montfermeil, he may notice a wizened tree. Cosette knows that I do not expect Please her... Please listen. It is under this tree, where the roots are at their thickest, that Jean Valjean hid the fortune he acquired as the proprietor of the factories at Montreuil-sur-Mer so many years before. Please, open this parcel. Oh, this is very irregular, Monsieur Fauchelevent. What is there? 584,000 francs. 584? It is Cosette's. Cosette has never mentioned Cosette it. Cosette does not know. The money was held in trust by me until such a time as she was to be married. I don't know what to say. And it is to that tree that Jean Valjean returns every few weeks and retrieves such money as he needs, just as he has done for the last ten years. This is a very great fortune, monsieur. I know. And Cosette knows nothing? Not a thing. But how did this come to be? I assure you it is all entirely above board. I don't know what to say. Please, say nothing. Only permit me to wish long life and happiness to you both. I must tell Cosette. My goodness, monsieur Fauchelevent, I don't know what to say. Yes, I... Uh, perhaps I might speak with your grandfather. Of course, of course. And soon, the entire household is talking about Cosette's unexpected mm. fortune. And not only is Cosette the most beautiful and enchanting girl an old man could hope to meet, but by Jupiter, she's also a millionaires, <laughs> as good as. Mm. Well, what do we really know about this man and his so-called daughter? What we know is that she and Marius are hopelessly in love. Well, I don't mind telling you that I don't like it. And I don't mind telling you that Marius is getting married in two weeks' time, and I don't want any of your sour grapes spoiling the day. Sour 
your grapes. I have kept this house for you, father, for 40 years. I have slaved night and day to make it comfortable, to make it a place where you could enjoy the twilight of your life in peace. Please, doctor, have a glass of champagne and let's celebrate our family's happiness and good fortune. Please, for your poor old father... Well, where are the lovebirds to live? Here, of course. Here? I have the decorators coming in tomorrow. The decorators? It will be perfect, just perfect. All the family under one roof. Tell me about the fitting, Cosette. Madame Lafayette says she has made me a dress a queen would be proud of. A queen, eh? Queen Cosette of Paris. <laughs> Actually, she's pretty formidable. But seriously, Father, tell me. How did I come into such a fortune? It can't have come from old Monsieur Fauchelevent, the convent. A little patience, that's all I ask. It's just so hard to believe. 584,000 francs. How? All in good time, Cosette, all in good time. But shouldn't you be in bed? I'm sure Baron Pommercy won't appreciate it if his exhausted bride starts snoring at the altar. <laughs> oh, Basque. Good sir, hold his head still. We wouldn't want the ribbon to stray, would where, we? Where are the carriages? I'm sure they're on their way. They should have been here an hour ago. I know, sir, but it's Mardi Gras. The streets are packed. Now, if you'll just stay absolutely still as I thread this through here... Do I have to remind you that the Baron and his bride are to be married today? Yes, but the revellers in the streets don't know that. What insolence! Get that carriage here this instant! But, and where are the flowers? It's all in hand, sir. Are they decorating the dining room without me? <gasps> I want to oversee the arrangements. Everything must be perfect. <laughs> yes, madame! Get in here immediately and sort out the cutlery. The footman's made an awful hash of it. Can't you see? He's doing my hair. It's very inconvenient. A mirror. Hand me a mirror. If my ribbon isn't straight, you'll rue the day, Basque. As Sir will observe, the ribbon is sitting perfectly, just as always. What a day, Basque. The young master to be married, his bride as lovely as... Uh, as uh, well, uh, uh, lovely... <laughs> Could it be better, Bass? The household is in ecstasy, sir. It is, isn't it? I don't think I can remember a happier day. But where are those carriages? What have you done to your hand, Father? It's nothing. You look wonderful, Cosette. But it's wrapped up in a sling. The dress is enchanting. How did it happen? It's just a sprain. But, unfortunately, it means that I shall have to ask Monsieur Gillenormand to escort you up the aisle. Monsieur Gillenormand? Why won't you be doing it? With my arm like this? I'm sorry, Cosette. Oh, Trust me, it's better this way. And now a ghastly chill spreads its way through Jean Valjean's heart as he imagines the bitter laughter of Inspector Javert. Are you in any pain? No, no. A little stiffness, that's all. But Valjean knows, as certainly as winter brings snow, that convict 24601 will never be worthy to give away the bride that he has nurtured and protected all these years. Oh, Father, listen. The wedding bells. Will never be worthy. Come along, Cosette. We don't want to be late, do we? Not if he were to live for a thousand years. But what if the carriage doesn't turn up? Of course it will turn up. You're right. I know you're right. It's been a very long time since you said that, my boy. You said what, Grandfather? That I was right in any matter. Oh, you know how grateful both Cosette and I are, especially now that you've allowed us to live here. Grateful? A fiddlesticks. It's I that should be grateful that the merciful fate saw fit to deliver you back to my door alive. Oh, bother, bother. I, I mustn't have tears, or the rouge will spoil. And you're not angry that I shall be keeping my father's title? The carriages are here. Oh, wish me luck. Uh, you don't need any luck, my boy, shall we? Ah, Mardi Gras. 
all over Paris, cheers are given to a very different rebellion which now dances down these teeming streets. A rebellion of colour. Zelma! What is it, Dad? Did you manage to pick them pockets? The rogue Tenardier is even thinner and more venomous than before. There's talk of a fancy wedding party passing this way on their way to Notre Dame. Observe him now, as he and his only surviving daughter, Azelma, now even brawnier than before, trawl through the unsuspecting crowd. Well, what are we waiting for, my elf? <laughs> Pass us that mask yeah. and uh, <laughs> let's join in the fun. There it is. It's them carriages over there. Ah, well, they might as well be made of solid gold. <laughs> We got a real princess here. I always wanted to get married like that, in style. Shut up, Azelma. We've got work to do. Oh, father. What if he decides he doesn't want to marry me right at the last minute? Baron Pomessi loves you completely. He does, doesn't he? Yes, Gazette, he does. And you are happy for us, aren't you, father? With all my heart. <laughs> And who have we here? <laughs> what can we do for you, Monsieur Harlequin? Harlequin? Uh, I've never been so insulted. <laughs> I am the Count of Saint-Germain. <laughs> come to wish a beautiful bride condolences on her wedding day. <laughs> Did you hear that, Father? He wished us his condolences. What can we do for you, Count? Well, perhaps, sir. Uh, Mamsel has a penny for a poor robe, for as the noble saying goes, a penny from a bride is a very lucky penny indeed, etc., etc. Father? Here you are. Ah. Is something wrong, Count? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, is something wrong? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I, I thought for a moment I'd... Well, never mind. Then take your penny. Ah. Ten francs. Oh, monsieur! <laughs> He's too kind! <laughs> too kind! What are you doing, Basque? I'm waving, sir. Well, stop it at once. We are not commoners. Sir. Every inch of the church is garlanded with flowers, and every face is beaming with joy. Uh, this is a most irregular request, Monsieur Fauchelevent. As you see, I cannot use my left arm. But the bride must be given away by her father. It is tradition. I honestly think it's for the best. Well, if you insist, but this is very irregular. You're doing me a great honor, sir. It is I that am honored. If you are sure, father. Let's not keep the groom waiting any longer, Cosette. Isn't the church... Beautiful. Monsieur Gilmormont, if you will be so kind. Uh, certainly. Are you ready, my dear? Goodbye, Father. I shall see you after the Mass. We should proceed. Goodbye, Cosette. Oi, Zelma! Dad, did the bride give you something? Well, a couple of francs. Oh, typical. Now, come on. I want to get a better look at that wedding party. Why? Just come no. on. And now I pronounce you man and wife. Baron Pontmercy, you may kiss the bride. As Marius and Cosette kiss for the first time as man and wife. I love you, Cosette. A brighter and more hopeful future dawns in the hearts of all present. And I love you, Marius. There they are, Father, coming out of the church. I thought so. Thought what, Dad? You see that big man behind the bride? No. With his arm in a sling. What about him? I recognise him. That night I was down the sewers, the night of the trouble at the barricades. Oh, you must be mistaken. No, Azelma, I'm not mistaken. Only that night he had a corpse over his shoulder. And by the look of that wedding... Looks like he's got himself in with a crowd that'll pay handsomely to keep the lid on such a... <laughs> what should we say? Uh, sensitive information. <laughs> Is Monsieur all right? Quite all right, thank you, Basque. 
In a room off the sumptuous banqueting hall, Jean Valjean sits alone. A glass of something, perhaps. Nothing, thank you. His mind fills with memories of Cosette as a child. I think we're almost ready for the speeches. Of all the things he yearns to tell her, but cannot. I'll come through in a moment. Perhaps Sir's arm is causing him some discomfort. My arm? In the sling, sir. Oh, my arm. No, no. It's nothing. Of how she must always be protected from the truth. You carry on. I'll follow you in a moment. Change a felon like you, not a hope. Inspector Chabert, am I truly cursed forever? Cursed forever. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention? I, I, uh, let me begin with a question. Can there be too much love in the world? If one says there is, one may as well condemn a butterfly in its flight or a flower in its bed. Let us look around us, ladies and gentlemen, and consider these two glorious young people oh. whose nuptials <laughs> we celebrate today. Stand up, Marius, oh, and yeah. Cosette. Stand up, stand up. <laughs> Grandfather, really. To, to separate one from the other, one may as well separate the sunlight from the daytime or deny the ocean its river. Oh. Isn't that right, <laughs> Monsieur Fauchelevent? Dear, where is Monsieur Fauchelevent? Over here. And yes, you are quite right. Marius and Cosette, I thank you. I thank you for coming home to us. I thank you for finding each other. And I thank you for making an old man joyous in his dotage. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, raise your glasses to the happy couple, Marius and Cosette. Marius, Marius and Cosette. And Cosette. Speech. Speech. Uh, Speech. Uh, Speech. Uh, uh, might I add <laughs> that on behalf of my wife and I, I would like to thank my grandfather for preparing this exquisite feast for us today. Bravo. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes. And to thank the mystical fates which led us to each other, to my darling Cosette, my thanks and love. Bravo. 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 And finally, to thank the mysterious stranger who saved my life nine months ago. Yes. Yes. If it had not been for this unknown man's bravery and kindness, mm. we would not be sitting here today. <laughs> oh. Not even a flicker passes across Jean Valjean's face as he quietly slips from the room. So, I ask you to raise your glasses yeah. to absent friends. Absent, to absent, to absent, absent friends. friends. <laughs> Father! Oh, what are you doing here, Cosette? I came to see if you're all right. Don't you like the party? Oh, there are too many people for this old man to deal with. You're not old, Father. You're not as old as Monsieur Gillenormand. He's nearly 90 and he's dancing a jig in there. Oh, to each his own. Marius tells me you've decided not to live here with us. That is correct. But why? We have a room for you It's and... not right. Why isn't it right? Because it isn't. You're not making sense again. Cosette! Won't you come back inside? You go on. I can't bear the thought of you sitting out here in the dark on your own. I'm not on my own. Cosette! Where are you, Cosette? Your husband's calling you. Whatever would I do without you, Father? Cosette! Quickly. The Baron will worry. We'll talk more about this later. Coming, my love! Coming! Basque. Yes, sir. Uh, fetch more champagne. Immediately, uh, sir. If I may say so, sir, they make a charming couple. They do, don't they? Perfect. I think this is one of the happiest days of my life, sir. You're not going to blub, are you, Basque? Uh, no, sir. Because I, w I won't have blubbing. No, sir. No. Or would <laughs> sir like his handkerchief? Yes, sir. And, and my, my rouge. <laughs> no. Well, he's not next door. Father! Where is he? 
The guests are leaving. I'll have Basque try and hunt him down, but now we really should be making our goodbyes. Thank you so much. Thank you so Unlike the English, who conspire to have the bride and groom whisked away from their own party as soon as possible, Cosette and Marius continue dancing until their very last guest departs. Sleep well, my dears. Sleep well. Shall I put some more coal on the fire? I'm quite warm enough. Unless you're cold. No. No, I'm not cold. I don't love. <laughs> I love you, Cosette. And I love you, Marius. In what seems a blink of an eye, their first weeks of marriage fly by. Marius, do you think this material is suitable for the curtains in the morning room? Mm. It's very soft and smooth, isn't it? <laughs> it is. <laughs> Oh, Marius, <laughs> not here. On the 1st of March, as buds appear on the apple trees and the returning birds build nests in the chimney pots, a coach pulls up outside, Seven Rue des Filles du Calvaire. Monsieur Fauchelevent. I hope I haven't called at an inconvenient time. Not at all. I'm delighted to see you. I'll call Cosette. Uh, no, it's you I came to see, Baron Pommessy. Marius, please. Another surprise, perhaps. I think it better if you sit down. Well, now I'm sitting, Monsieur Fauchelevent. My name is not Fauchelevent. Not Fauchelevent? What is it, then? My name is Jean Valjean. But surely this is all some fantastic story. I swear it is all true. But I don't understand. First you were a criminal, then you were mayor of Montreux... Montreux-sur-Mer. Does Cosette know anything of this? Nothing. I find it hard to believe that she knows nothing of your background. She knows only that I saved her from the Thenardiers. She knows nothing of my fortune or my pursuit by Inspector Javert and the law. Nor does she know that I've lived as a fugitive for the last 15 years. I'm sorry, but I simply don't understand. You, a criminal. A long time ago. I only came here to tell you the truth as I have never told it to anyone. Then your whole life is a lie. In one way, yes. Well, what other way is there? Either it is or it isn't. I have always been honest in all my dealings with the world. Only my identity has been secret. But surely you are no longer a fugitive. Javert is dead. Nobody hunts you now. You are free. A convict is never free. For as long as I live, I will always have the errors of my past at my shoulder, constantly reminding me of the criminal that I was. Well, then why are you telling me this? Because Cosette is your wife now, and no longer my daughter. I cannot describe how I've tried to tear all fatherly feeling from my breast, to just let her go, to move away quietly and leave you both to the rest of your lives, but I couldn't. I couldn't. But nobody has asked you to. You don't understand, Baron. I can no longer live pretending that the stigma of my past will simply fade away. I can only hope that when you know the truth of what I am, you will decide on the best course to take. We offered you a home here. We invited you to join our family. And now you come here and calmly throw it all back in our face. Family? I don't know the meaning of that word. Cosette was all I had. And what about Cosette's inheritance? The money is hers, honestly acquired. Am I to take your word on that after everything you've just said? I know that may be difficult. Difficult? Do you have any idea of the situation you now put me in? I have only your word, the word of a felon, that this money was honestly acquired. Am I to expect the police to come banging on the door at any instant? You must trust me in this. Trust you? Shouting, oh, Father, Cosette. you didn't tell us you were coming. Would you excuse us, my love? Excuse you? Why? What's wrong? Why the long faces? Your father and I are discussing matters of some sensitivity, Cosette. Private matters. You're not going away again? No, Cosette. Then what's going oh, on? We'll talk about it later. Why can't we talk about it now? Please, Cosette. All right. But you must promise to tell me later, Marius. I will. We'll speak soon, won't we, Father? We will, Cosette. Goodbye. Goodbye. Perhaps I can talk to my grandfather. He still has some influential friends. Arrange some sort of reprieve. It is too late for that. 
Then you leave me no choice, Monsieur Valjean. I think it best that you no longer see Cosette. She is my wife now and shares my title. Forgive me, Baron. But if I were never to see her, then my life... Well, then my life would be over. Perhaps I might visit occasionally, in the evenings, under cover of the night. Very well. You may visit Cosette in the evenings, but only at a prearranged time. I never wish to see you or have any dealings with you ever again. Is that understood? It is, sir. Very well, then. Good day. What have you found out, Azilma? Only that the wedding couple now live on the Rue de Fille de Calvaire, Baron and Baroness Pontmercy. Nobody seems to know the old bloke in the carriage. Ah, that's because we're asking all the right questions to all the wrong people. Well, who should we be asking, then? That bloke's a villain. Somehow, he's got himself mixed up in high society. Maybe he's got something on him. Spanish Henri. Of course. What, Dad? <laughs> Never you mind, Azelma. Come on. Not call you father. Why ever not? Because now that you are married, it is no longer appropriate. I don't understand. I've never understood. You've always kept things from me. And now you want to exile yourself from my affections. No, Cosette, it's not like that. Then what is it like? How could I possibly forget you? How Valjean longs to comfort her. Are you leaving? I think it best. I shall come back tomorrow. Uh, we have him, Selma. <laughs> we have him. Well, what did Spanish Henri say, Dad? He told me a story, didn't he? About an old lag who broke his parole and somehow became mayor of a town up north. Well, what about it? What about it? The man, as was down the sewers, is the same man in the wedding coach. But we know that already. <laughs> Panama City, here we come. What are you talking about, Dad? Uh, come on, Azelma. I need to find me a tailor if I'm to pay a visit on the noble Baron Pomercy. <laughs> Marius. What is it, Cosette? Father hasn't come. Well, perhaps he's been delayed. And why isn't the fire lit in the cellar? I thought it best to economise. Economise? You know that Father and I speak in there every night. It will be relit. Has he said anything to you? Nothing. Don't upset yourself, my love. Why doesn't he want me to call him Father anymore? He said you knew. Cosette, there's no need Well, to... do you? Why doesn't anyone tell me anything? But please, Cosette. I'm sure he'll be here very soon. I'm sure he will. Sir, I wish you'd go and see a doctor. Stop fussing. Tis uh, I'm quite all right. Of course you are, sir. Mere skin and bone can be described as rude health. Where's my hat? Where are you going? Out. I need some air. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Azelma, how do I look? Oh, proper gentleman, I'm sure. It won't be long before the money's in our pockets and we're on a ship for Panama City. Oh, but what if they don't pay up? <laughs> After Baron Paul Mercy, sir, but I have to tell him they'll be begging us to take the money. All morning, Thénardier has attempted to disguise his cunning under a faded yellow suit and a pair of green-tinted glasses. The plan is foolproof, Azelma. If there's one thing the rich fear, it is scandal. You mark my words. Oh. <laughs> Are you listening to me, Marius? Of course I am. I just want to finish this letter to my bank. I'm really worried about Father. He doesn't answer my letters, and when I sent Basque round to the house, Toussaint said that he'd gone away. It just doesn't make any sense. Could he be worried about money? That's not like him. Father never worried about money. 
Especially now we have the inheritance. Ever since learning of Jean Valjean's criminal past, Marius has been very cautious of Cosette's dowry and fortune. The thought that it might be a criminal's ill-gotten spoils. An anathema. We'll talk about this later, I promise. Now, I really must finish this letter. Why won't you tell me what's going on? Oh, come. Oh, what is it, Basque? There's a gentleman at the door who asks to see you urgently. Who is he? He didn't give his name. What the devil? I I'm sorry, Cosette. We'll finish this later, Marius. Oh, very well, Basque. Show the gentleman into the study. Monsieur Fauchelevent! Oh, oh, oh. too, sir. Yeah. What on earth happened to you, sir? Did you fall? Well, some children were teasing me. One of them knocked me over. Vicious little uh, devils. Can we go inside? Oh, oh. oh. oh sir. Oh. I can't bear to see you in pain. I'll be fine. You'll, you'll see. Take my arm. Thank you. Ever since the wrong wedding, you've been a different man, uh, sir. Uh, the street is not the place to have this conversation, too, sir. Well, if you ate your dinner when I gave it to you, none of this would happen. Oh, honestly, sir, you're not well. You've aged these last few weeks. Sometimes I barely recognise you. <laughs> At least let me send word to Cosette. No, to Sarah. I don't want her alarmed. But, sir... Enough. This is incredible, monsieur. Please, go on. This so-called gentleman who attended your wedding was none other than a wanted thief and murderer. I see. Although Marius affects disinterest, excitement rises within his breast. Could this curious gentleman in green-tinted spectacles be about to disclose the identity of the man who saved his life? I know this because he had one of his victims over his shoulder at the time I saw him. And you are sure this victim was dead? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> dead as dead can be. Fish-eyed. Oh, terrible. And this man was at my wedding, you say? He was, sir. His name? Uh, are you sure there's no one here to uh, overhear us? We are quite alone. <clears throat> it's a wanted criminal by the name of Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean? Yes, sir. The name sweeps through Marius's soul like fire. You're absolutely sure his name was Jean Valjean? Oh, I'd swear it on my late wife's grave. How could he have been so blind and callous? How could he have treated him with such blind suspicion and cruelty? And what is your purpose in bringing me this information today? Oh, I see, sir, would prefer to talk... Uh... Directly. <laughs> man to man, as it were. I would. Well then, to keep this information from falling into the wrong hands, I am prepared to dispose of it in such a way as that it never existed. Dispose of it? How? Speak frankly, sir. Well, it's long been a cherished dream to restart my life in Panama City. The Americas, it seems, were designed for a gentleman like me. Go on. <laughs> 10,000 francs makes that dream a reality. It's a small price to pay for peace of mind. I'm sure you'll agree. The day is overcast and damp. Grey clouds press upon Paris, and the light in Marius's study is weak and murky. But still there is something very familiar about this rattlesnake who passes for a man. Don't I know you, sir? Oh, I don't think so, sir. Look closely at my face. <coughs> well, I'm sure, sir, it doesn't suffer the misfortune to mix in my less than salubrious circles, etc., etc. Would it interest you to know that my father was Baron Pomercy and that he fought at the Battle of Waterloo? Oh, well, that's very commendable, I'm sure. Don't you recognise the name? No, I can't say as I do. I knew a Pomerie. I pulled him from a pile of bodies. <laughs> Were you stealing from him at the time? What? What a suggestion! Your name is not Tenard, is it? What? It's Tenardier, and you also go by a number of aliases. I think there must be some mistake. I think not. You once ran an inn in Montfermeil, and you later lived as Jondrette in a hovel in the Gorbeau tenement. 
Who am I talking to? You know who I am. I'm not saying nothing that might incriminate myself. It's not me that's a thief and a murderer. Now, what proof do you have that this Jean Valjean did these things? Well, perhaps, sir, would like to take a look at this piece of cloth. Huh? I ripped that from the victim's jacket. See the blood on it? Now Marius has him. Wait here. I'm at your service. I shall only be a moment. Take your time, sir. Take your time. Patience, Tenardier. Patience. Oh, 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 Baron. Now, may I see that material? You may. Just as I thought. Do you deny that this is a perfect match? Where did you get that coat? The victim you saw over this so-called murderer's shoulder was none other than the person you see before you now. If it were possible for any more colour to drain from Tanadier's cheeks, then they would pale at this. I shall arrange to pay you a thousand francs for the service you did for my father all those years ago. The money should get you to Panama City and as far away from Paris as it is possible to be. But what about that criminal Jean Valjean? You may either leave by the door or I shall arrange to have you thrown out. That afternoon, the all-pervading murkiness gives way to a few spots of sunshine. Did you get the money, Dad? Shut up, Aselma, and come with me. Where are we going? To book a passage to Panama City. You got it then, please! <laughs> Not exactly, but don't let that worry you. <laughs> We're on our way to America, where they know how to reward honest, hard-working businessmen. Someone's happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I say so myself. I am a Zelma. <laughs> I couldn't be happy if I tried. <laughs> Etc. <cetera. laughs> Etc. <cetera. laughs> Cosette. Cosette. What is it, my love? Get your hat and coat and meet me outside. The coach is waiting. Where are we going? Oh, I've been such a fool. Such a fool. There now. Isn't it better to have a little food inside you, sir? You've been very good to me too, sir. And I don't know that I've ever properly thanked you in all these years. Thank me, sir? There's nothing to thank me for. Take good care of the silver candlesticks when I'm gone. Where are you off to now? I feel very close to God too, sir. You took a nasty fall, uh, sir. That's all. There's no need to get gloomy. I'm not in the least gloomy, my dear Toussaint. <laughs> Those candlesticks were given to me by a very holy man, the Bishop of Dean. All day I've sensed his presence near me. Sensed his presence, sir? Toussaint! Toussaint! Cassette! Tell her to go away. I don't want her to see me like this. I'll go upstairs. You stay where you are. <laughs> Cassette! Oh, dear sir, I can't tell you how I missed you. Come in, come in. Let me look at my lovely girl. Marius and I would like you to come and live with us. What's going on? Cassette and I, we must speak with you, sir. First of all, may I offer you my most sincere apologies and thanks? I don't understand. I know who it was that saved me from the barricades and dragged me through the sewers to safety. I did what I had to. There's nothing to thank me for. Oh, but there is, sir. There is so much to thank you for. Marius has told me everything. Father, you are a better man than you could possibly know. But you are sick. Is this why you haven't been to see me? Uh, only you knew how I've longed for you to call me father again. My darling Cosette. I shall always call you father. <coughs> <coughs> we must get a doctor. Marius. At once, my love. Let me help you, sir. It, it's too late for that, I fear. Will you do me a service, Baron? Oh, anything. You make good use of your wife's money. It was honestly earned and should be honestly spent. I know, sir. I am ashamed of myself for ever doubting you. Were you really a mayor of a town, father? I was. The town of Montreuil-sur-Mer. And is that where you met my mother? Your mother's name was Fontaine. 
And she loved you with all her heart, Cosette. If she loved me, why did she give me away? She trusted the Thenardiers to take care of you. <coughs> Believe me, Cosette, no mother loved her child as Fantine loved you. It was only mortal illness which kept you from her. <coughs> the lamp burns brightly. But nothing seems to outshine the look of radiance beaming from Jean Valjean's face. Remember, I loved you, Cosette. Let us help you, please. My time is done. As the day gives way to night, and the first lights flicker in the houses of Paris, Jean Valjean shuts his eyes, and, as a tiny bird in springtime soars above the roofs and houses, so Jean Valjean soars above all the sorrows and joys of his extraordinary life. I have only one more thing to say. A profound and penetrating stillness suffuses the room. Jean Valjean appears transformed, transfigured. What is it, sir? <laughs> what is it, father? What were you going to say? And as the old man's breath becomes lighter and lighter, he gently whispers, Always remember, my children, that to love, that to love is to act. <laughs> In Les Miserables by Victor Hugo, dramatised by Sebastian Bonchkiewicz and Lynn Coglan, Joss Ackland was the voice of Victor Hugo, Roger Allam, Jean Valjean, Jonathan Forbes, Marius, Lucy Wybrow, Cosette, David Schofield, Inspector Javert, Leslie Phillips, Gilles Normand, and Patsy Palmer, Eponine. Thenardier was played by Henry Goodman, Gavroche by Lee Cornwall, and Fricasset by Sarah Paul. Comb Fair by Carl Prekop and Toussaint by Annette Badland. Other parts were played by Peter Darney, Christopher Godwin, Ewan Bailey and Sean Baker. The producer was Sally Evans. <laughs>